My stormtroopers will neutralize the major pockets of resistance. Then your people can come down and finish things up. Convarian's condescension could have been cut with a vibroblade, but Arisi chose to ignore it. As you will, Captain Convarian. Those of us from Typhira much appreciate your diligence in helping us prosecute those who would victimize us. The scream of an interceptor diving into the chasm overrode Convarian's reply. As it passed the bridge, a pair of red laser bolts pierced the ion engine exhaust vector system, spraying half-melted louvers out in its backwash. The interceptor began a roll that ended in a brilliant explosion as it hammered one of the lower walkways. The ferrocrete decking undulated out away from the impact point, crumbling with the wave front. It held for a moment or two, then, piece by piece, began to rain stone into the depths. As terrifying as that was, it was nothing compared to the sight of the X-Wing swooping through the chasm. Painted like a brutal, fearsome creature, it appeared more like a predator seeking prey than a war machine piloted by the enemy. Without being able to identify the pilot as he flashed past, Arisi knew it was one of her old squadron mates. And she knew the only way she would survive was to get back to her interceptor and shoot him down. Gavin flew past the collapsing walkway and saw a hail of laser bolts streaking past him from all angles. Small arms fire. No real threat. He smiled grimly, pulled back on his throttle to reverse his thrust, and cut in his repulsor lift coils. He flipped the X-Wing's lasers over to single fire, then applied enough rudder to bring the fighter's nose around toward his tormentors. He leveled the fighter out, killed his thrust, then let the repulsor lift coils propel him up through the chasm. Using his rudder pedals, he turned the ship left and right. He dropped his crosshairs on the stormtroopers shooting at him and returned their fire. Whereas their laser bolts skipped harmlessly off the X-Wing's shields, his shots proved to be anything but harmless. It wasn't that they were sufficiently powerful to pierce a stormtrooper's armored chestplate as much as they evaporated it and most of the person beneath it. Part of Gavin rebelled at the slaughter. The stormtroopers had no chance of survival facing him, but they did not break and run. They stood their ground, giving their lives for the dead creation of a dead emperor. They gain nothing from this. Why? Given enough time, I will kill them all. Gavin slowly nodded. Right, they're buying time. The Corrupter is scrambling more ties. If I stick around, I'm not leaving. He kicked his throttle in and sped up his ascent. He still sprayed knots of stormtroopers and concentrated a lot of fire on the uppermost region, trying to get the one black imperial uniform lurking amid a squad of stormtroopers. Most of them went down, but he couldn't tell if he got the officer or not. Analysis of the sensor data may answer that question. I hope so. Realizing he had done all he could for the people of Halinit, Gavin accelerated the X-Wing and launched it through the hole in the transparasteel shield. They'll pay, Court. They'll pay dearly for this. Rolling out to port, he pointed his fighter west and began his run home. Erisi pulled the interceptor's hatch shut and dropped into the pilot's seat as the X-Wing jetted up and out through the shield hole. She pulled on her helmet and strapped in, then went for an engine start. Both refused. Diagnostics scrolled over her primary monitor. Reactor chambers are too cold for a start. She punched up a directory of system software then worked her way down through a hierarchy of choices until she got to a list of emergency overrides. She glanced at her weapons display, then picked a program that drained the energy from her lasers into the reactor cores to warm them enough for a restart. She waited until the temperature had climbed sufficiently, then restarted the engines. The twin ion engines roared to life and sent a gentle thrum through the cockpit. 
Arisi shunted energy back into recharging the lasers, then cut the repulsor lift generators in, retracted the landing gear, and throttled up to head after the X-Wing. Coming up and around, she dropped her interceptor on his tail, but saw he already had ten kilometers worth of lead over her. Even with the interceptor's greater speed, I won't catch him before he escapes the atmosphere and goes to light speed. Arisi reached over and punched up a broadband frequency selection from her comm unit. Fleeing X-Wing, this is Commander Arisi Delaret of the Typhiran Home Defense Corps. Land at once or be destroyed. Arisi? She recognized the voice immediately. Gavin? Listen to me. You have to stop. If you don't, they'll get you. Don't you mean you'll get me? Arisi smiled. No, the imps will get you. Surrender to me, and I can protect you from them. How should I do that? Give you my override code so I end up like Corrin? Gavin's laughter stung her ears. You want me? Come get me. I would if you weren't so intent on running. By shunting more energy to her engines, she could increase her speed, but her lasers would have no power to shoot Gavin when she caught him. If I had proton torpedoes, on the other hand, Iceheart is a fool. I never would have thought you a coward, Gavin. Gavin laughed again. A year ago, maybe even three months ago, you could have gotten me to turn back with that taunt, but not now. I'm not nearly as stupid as you'd need for me to engage you while Corruptor comes around and cuts me off. Rationalize your cowardice any way you want, Gavin. She knew she couldn't get him to turn around, so she tried to hurt him as their ships left Hal in its atmosphere. Run away so you can come back later. Know you've doomed the people of Halinit, and know I'll kill you when next we meet. You'll pay for what you've done here, Arisi. Emotion filled Gavin's words, pinching their tone. For you, getting out of this alive will be impossible. Impossible is what rogues do best. Yeah, but you were never really a rogue, were you? Kilometers began to scroll up impossibly quickly on Arisi's rangefinder as the X-Wing ran up to light speed and entered hyperspace. Arisi watched it vanish, then pulled back on the interceptor's yoke and looped the fighter back toward Halinit. No, I was never a rogue, Gavin. I never relinquished my grip on reality. She smiled as the corruptor came into view around the curve of the moon. I know where the true power in the galaxy is, and I know that if you keep trying to defy the impossible, eventually you fail. This is your time to fail. 20. The feeling in Corrin's gut was as cold as Wedge's narration of the holographic imaging from Gavin's X-Wing. At various points in the presentation, Winter hit keys on the data pad connected to the holo projector. The image froze, then the computer enlarged and enhanced an image from the background. They're all of dead bodies. Dead civilian bodies. Corin shivered and felt Mirax gently rub her hand along his spine. I was there not a week before this happened. I probably talked to some of those people, ate with them, joked with them. Corin realized that, as he had with his comrades in Corsec, he had mentally prepared himself for losing friends who were in the squadron. All of them accepted the risks of warfare, and all of them had the same things at stake. Riv Shiel's death had surprised him, but he was able to tell himself that Shiel had died well in combat just as he would have wanted to go. The people of Helenid, however. He shook his head. They were never meant to find themselves in that situation. Mirax leaned heavily against him. I know, but Isard put them there. You didn't. 
The glow panels in the small briefing room came up, in no way easing the severe expression on Wedge's face. First, I want to state publicly that, in my opinion, Gavin could have done nothing more than he did at Hallinit. While he has felt he somehow led the corrupter to Hallinit, we know that isn't true. Hallinit stopped asking anyone but us for Bacta after our first run, and the tanker pilots knew where they had dropped off a supply. It was easy for Iceheart to tag them as a target. I'm fairly certain she would have found out who we had supplied, no matter how we got the Bacta to the worlds. But we could have made it tougher for her. The fact is that Iceheart has publicized what happened at Hallinit to frighten others into paying Typhira for the gift of Bacta we made to them. Wedge's brown eyes narrowed. Since Gavin's departure, there has been no direct communication from Hallinit. According to the messages Iceheart has sent out, the Corrupter initiated a planetary barrage that expanded upon the damage the bombers and stormtroopers had inflicted. It is my assumption that no one was left living in the colony. I'm fairly certain that after all was said and done, the place was sown with mines and other booby traps to kill survivors or rescuers. It is my assumption that after all was said and done, the place was sown with mines and other booby traps to kill survivors or rescuers. Noara Venn's brain tails twitched. So you're saying we're not going to try to save any of the people there? Wedge shook his head, his reluctance to forego such a mission thick in his voice. We do not have the ships we need to help them. If even one-tenth of the individuals there survived, that would dwarf our transport capabilities. I do know the New Republic is sending some ships to Hallinit, but they don't expect to find survivors either. He opened his hands. I know that's not easy for any of you to hear. Innocent individuals have suffered because of something we did, but what we did meant they lived just that much longer. Had we not acted, that colony would have been dead weeks ago. We kept it going that much longer. We were able to lift a blanket of oppression and misery from them, and this disaster cannot devalue what we did. Iceheart made choices that raised our conflict to another level. She has to pay. Gavin hammered a fist down onto the arm of his chair. Iceheart and Arisi and all of them have to pay. And pay they will. The edge sliding into Wedge's voice brought Corin's head up. Isan Isard has forgotten the lesson she taught the rebellion by giving us a sick Coruscant. She's forgotten that our strength is our freedom, and her weakness is her link to the sources of production for Bacta. We can go anywhere and be anywhere but she's limited. She's limited in how much she can cover, so we can hit her where she's open and run when she has our targets protected. Yaniri Forge raised a hand. But we ran this time, and she hit an innocent world. How do we prevent that from happening again? Two ways. First, with Booster's help, we'll deal the Bacta we capture to traders and let them sell it. The price is high enough for them to accept the risks. We can have them undercut Isarge prices, or we cut them off from future shipments. In return, we can get the arms, munitions, and spare parts we need to continue doing what we're doing. We'll insulate places by allowing them to deny knowing where the Bacta came from, and we'll make traders very happy with us. The traders become a cutout for us and Isard can't complain too loudly about them, because if she does, she loses access to the supplies she needs to maintain her forces. Second, and more important, we have a score to settle with her. Typhira has dozens of small Bacta-producing colonies out there. We're going to pick one and destroy it. The mission will be dirty and dangerous. What Bacta we can't haul away, we'll destroy and we'll let her know that we'll continue to hit her colonies every time she takes her war to an innocent party. 
he brought his hands together. There are analogies that can be drawn between Hallinit and Alderaan, and I wish neither incident had happened. What's important to remember is that both worlds died because evil has been allowed to run unchecked. In our pleasure at defeating the Empire, it's all too easy to ignore the nasty bits and pieces of its evil that survived. The New Republic is out hunting down Warlord Zinj. I'm sure out there somewhere there are still people who will yet come forward to overthrow what we've done and try to reestablish the Empire. This war is really far from over, but if we don't realize that and act accordingly, there will be more Alderons, more Halinits. All of us have tried to keep this idea uppermost in our minds, but we saw a diminished Isard as a diminished threat. I know I was doing that, not consciously, but I still was doing it. No more. Wedge's hands folded down into fists and crashed against each other. Isard is killing innocents, extorting money, enslaving the Vratics, and holding prisoners we want freed. Each and every single thing we do from this point forward is going to be part of the plan to bring her down. However, Wedge's voice took on a huskiness. This war isn't going to be over fast. After this strike at a Bacta colony, we'll be moving into a protracted conflict where we'll be more pirate than we are army. It will be exhausting, but as long as she doesn't get her hands on an interdictor cruiser, we'll be able to stay ahead of her and wear her down. We'll frustrate her and make her impatient. Then we'll have her. Corin found himself smiling. Wedge was correct in that without an interdictor cruiser to prevent the X-Wings from running and hiding in hyperspace, Iceheart's navy would be ineffective against them. We're okay, unless someone jumps in on top of a ship the way the Corruptor did. Barring that, we can fly in, shoot off a bunch of proton torpedoes, take out some freighters, and flee before Iceheart can stop us. As long as we don't run out of torpedoes, we should be fine. Wedge's head came up. Tycho and I are working with Broar Jace on compiling a list of viable targets for our punitive strike. When we have a selection made, we'll convene another meeting and begin planning of the operation. Until then, your time is your own, but stay here on the station. We'll go when we have a plan in place and I'm hoping that will be sooner than later. Thanks. You're all dismissed. Corin sat back for a moment, then let Mirax tug him to his feet. Lots to think about. She nodded in agreement and slipped her left arm over his shoulders. I don't know about you, but I want a drink and something to eat. Do you want to hit a tap calf? Sure. How about the hype? Food's better at Flare Star. Actually, the service is better at Flare Star, but I prefer the decor at Hyperspace. Flare Star tended to be rather dark and quiet, while Hyperspace was as brilliantly lit as its namesake. The mood I'm drifting into isn't one I want to aid and abet with dim light. Mirax gave his shoulder a squeeze. Lead the way. They walked to the station's core and took the turbo lift up to the first of the docking ring's decks. Hyperspace's well lit opening beckoned to them from opposite the lift. The decor consisted mostly of pinks, yellows, and white, jumbled together in an odd asymmetrical manner that Corin found somehow comforting. He'd decided it was that the color selection was repulsive, but the strange angles and mixing prevented any of it from being overwhelming. The Trandoshan who ran the place seemed to have a quasi-mystical respect for shape and form, often seating people in the tap calf in a way that accentuated the establishment's visual chaos. They followed the large Soroid to a corner booth big enough for the entire squadron. 
Corin considered it wishful thinking on her part. The booth was far enough away from the other patrons that he felt he could talk with Mirax without surrendering privacy, so the Trandoshan's choice suited him perfectly. A motley silver and gold 3PO droid came over to take their order, then bounced off to fill it. Corin picked at a chipped area of the duraplast table's edge with his thumbnail. Wedge made some good points in there. I think he's right that all of us had really stopped thinking about the seriousness of what we were doing. Face it, since Black Moon, aside from me, the squadron had really lost no one. I showed back up, and that helped reinforce our feeling that we were invincible. Tycho joined us, then Broar reappears, and we're suddenly reinforced by some of the best pilots the Rebellion ever had. The unit has felt more relaxed, Mirax shrugged. I think that's only partly because of the successes you've had. You are good, but I think you've all underestimated your opposition. Sure, Isard had to run, and she's trapped herself on Typhira, but she's still tough. Captain Convarian is very aggressive. Avarice's Captain Sayer Yonka is very smart and calculating. The antithesis of us Corellians, because he does care what the odds are and does everything he can to maximize his chances for survival. He's spent much of his career on ships in the Outer Rim chasing down pirates and protecting convoys, so he understands very well what Isard has him doing. The virulence's Joak Dryso is a stalwart Imperial. I think he's working with Isard as much to strike back at the Rebellion as he is for any other reason. I was talking with my father, and it's his guess that Dryso will move over to take command of the Lusanka. Assuming, of course, Isard was in command of it to this point. Dryso's executive officer is Captain Lakwi Varsha, so she'll be moving up in his place. I had to outrun her when she was commanding a customs corvette. Tactics weren't innovative, standard imp, utterly by the book, but tactics for an Imperial Star Destroyer have never really been subtle anyway. Corin nodded as the serving droid put tumblers of Corellian whiskey in front of them, then accompanied it with a steaming tentacled mass of noodles and thin sliced vegetables drenched in a green sauce. Thanks, I think. He glanced at Mirax as the droid retreated. Is this what we ordered? I think so. She stabbed a fork into it, twirled it and lifted a dripping noodle coil to her mouth. She chewed for a moment, then swallowed. Unrecognizable, but not inedible. Your enthusiasm is underwhelming. Corin poked around the food with his fork, speared something crunchy, and popped it into his mouth. The sauce seemed a bit hot, but it was flavorful and cleared his sinuses, so he decided against complaining. Not bad. I also think you're right on pointing out that we've been underestimating Isard and her people. Part of it is because Arisi joined them. I think we have a vested interest in seeing her in a negative light. That could easily be a fatal mistake. We need our edge back. And I think Wedge is going to beat that idea into our brains from this point forward. Corin looked up as Ural entered the tap calf and waved him over. The Gand hesitated for a moment, looked back out into the concourse, then nodded. As he made his way through the jumble of tables, Corin saw three other Gands trailing in his wake, like Minuk spitlings drafting off their parent. Only one of them equaled Ural's size. The other two probably massed as much as Ural, but wore most of it around their middles. I wonder how that works with an exoskeleton. Ural stopped at the edge of the table. Greetings, Corin and Mirax. It is Quirg's honor to present to you three Gands from Quirg's homeworld of Gand. They are Usar Vli, Siron Alun, and Virwiandi. The larger of the three bowed his head. I speak for all three of us when I say we are most pleased to make your acquaintance. 
Though the Gand's speech had the guttural tones and clicks of Ural's normal voice, Corin found himself having a hard time comprehending what was said. He knew he should have understood it easily, it was only a greeting, but the use of personal pronouns surprised him. Uril explained long ago that Gans considered it the height of presumption to use personal pronouns to refer to themselves, because it arrogantly assumes the listeners know who the speaker is. Only after having done something so memorable that such an assumption can be made can a Gand refer to himself as I. Mirax covered for Corin. We are very pleased to meet you as well. Ural is a good friend, so we are honored to meet his friends. Ural quivered for a second. Quirg is sorry for your misinterpretation, because Quirg knows it is Quirg's fault, Mirax. These Gans are not Quirg's friends. They are Ruet Savi. Ural's mouthparts closed for a moment, then snapped back open. In basic, they would be something like observers or examiners, but more than either. Corin raised an eyebrow. They're your superiors? The taller Gand, Vir Wiamdi, by order of introduction, exaggerated the shaking of his head. We have been sent by the elders of Gand to watch Ural Quig. We are to chronicle Quig's existence and to criticize it. It is a great honor. Ural doesn't seem to think it's that great an honor by the look of him. Corin smiled. If there is any way I may be of assistance to you, please do not hesitate to let me know what I can do. Ural and I have spent much time together, and he saved my life more times than I care to remember. All three Gans nodded their heads sagely, but Corin was uncertain he was reading their body language correctly. I'm not sure I can read them at all, and I doubt I'm going to get a good explanation from Ural. Corin looked over at Mirax, but she didn't seem to be any more confident of her judgment of the Gans than he was. One more thing to learn about, which is why this galaxy will never be dull. Corin pointed to the open area in the booth. Would you care to join us? Ural shook his head. Now it is time for Quirg to interface with Zre, and tend to Quirg's X-Wing. After that, the schedule allows for dining. Veer bowed his head again. I beg your forgiveness for this interruption. We will watch you interact with Quirg at a later date. He turned and led the procession back out of the tap-calf, with Ural drawn along in the trio's wake like an X-wing tractored to a freighter. Mirax raised an eyebrow. What was that all about? Not a clue. And Ural's not going to tell you anything either. She pointed in their direction with her fork. I've never heard of, let alone seen, a group of guns wandering around together. Very odd. Corin shrugged and attacked his food. Twi'leks have joined us, and now we have some Gans with us. I don't understand it, nor do I need to understand it. I just hope Iceheart gets as confused by it as I am. 21. Under other circumstances, Wedge Antilles thought he might have liked Kratu-5. The ring of asteroids surrounding the planet that provided his people with cover against ground-based early warning systems had looked wonderful in the night sky in all the holograms he had studied. The world's moist and warm climate encouraged the growth of lush green foliage, over the tops of which Wedge's X-Wing whisked at dizzying speed. Mountains upthrust by colliding tectonic plates also hid the fighters from their target, providing the personnel at the Q5A7 back to refinement plant no warning about the impending attack. 
Wedge's force was flying in at a strength of 24, two squadrons worth of snub fighters. The three losses to the Corrupter had been replaced by the Gand Ruit Savi and their curious ships. The Gands flew heavily modified Thai bombers. The Quadanium solar panels at the front had been cut on the diagonal bias, like those of Thai interceptors, and had a central cutout to provide the pilot with peripheral vision. The bomb delivery system in the secondary hull had been scrapped in favor of a concussion missile launching system with a six-missile magazine. Then a hyperdrive motivator and shield generators had been added. Two lasers completed their weapons array. While the Gand bombers were still slow, the shields were strong, and Wedge found the ships preferable to Y-Wings for the long-range raid they were making. He had not intended to have the Gands come along on the mission, but Uril had insisted they would anyway, since they were Ruetsavi. And what exactly that meant, Wedge was as yet uncertain. In the preliminary and simulator runs they made on the mission, the Gans had proved very competent and skillful, though Wedge thought Uril could outfly all of them. Wedge checked the chronographic readout on his main screen, then glanced up at the horizon. The mountains are right where they're supposed to be, over the rise, and the valley should take us right in on target. Pulling back on the X-Wing's stick, he brought his fighter up so the sun rising at his back could illuminate his X-Wing. He reached up with his right hand, flicking the switch that brought the S-foils into attack position, then keyed his comm unit. Rogues, we go in. Chirtnaki, stand by. Tugging his stick to the right, he kicked the X-Wing into a barrel roll to starboard, then leveled out and began his run through the valley. The mountains rose up off both S-foils, but were far enough away that Wedge didn't feel as cramped as he did on the Death Star trench run or even the conduit mission on Borlaeus. His onboard computer matched the terrain to the mission map it had in memory, sounded a mild drift alarm, and Wedge corrected the problem almost unconsciously. Wedge thumbed the controls over to proton torpedoes and linked the fire of both launch tubes. He kept his hand easy on the stick, nudging the craft this way and that, then shot out over the edge of a 300-meter-tall cliff. As he rolled, he saw a black valley dotted with lights and brought his fighter around on a heading for a large dark block with flashing red and yellow lights on each of its corners. His targeting crosshairs dropped into the shadowed outline, and he pulled the trigger. Two proton torpedoes shot out on tongues of blue flame and streaked away at the building. They hit barely nanoseconds apart and detonated just after punching through the ferrocrete wall. Their subsequent explosions vomited argent fire out through their entry holes, then through the roof and out the windows on the upper three floors. The roof collapsed in on itself, leaving the fire on the building's interior lighting up the night like magma in a volcano's heart. With a flick of his thumb, Wedge shifted the X-Wing over to laser fire and left it firing single shots in sequence. Triggering a burst of fire, he sent a hail of red laser bolts burning through the night. His shots tracked over the main refinery building and down through the darkness. Something he hit exploded brilliantly, sending a red-gold fireball into the air. It imploded but still bumped him around as he flew through where it had been. Then he was over the bay and starting a long loop over Kratu 5's largest ocean. As he came around, he got a chance to look back at the Q5A7 plant and felt his stomach fold in on itself. The cliff wall and the waters of the bay reflected the light from the burning refinery, magnifying it and spreading it all over the valley. The X-wings that had come in behind him had similarly launched proton torpedoes at ground targets. The missiles, which were powerful enough to put quite a dent in an Imperial Star destroyer, blasted apart unarmored buildings. Lasers filled the night like lightning strikes, melting roads, setting trees on fire, and exploding anything even vaguely incendiary when they hit. 
Though the targets they had specified had been strictly industrial, collateral damage was inescapable. At least one bright fire burned in what should have been a residential complex for plant workers. Clearly one of the proton torpedoes had overshot its mark, and Wedge didn't know if the ground target his lasers had destroyed had been droid-driven or if it contained innocent bystanders. Coming in prior to dawn had been an attempt to minimize the presence of innocence in the target zones, but even minimal involvement of non-combatants meant some of them would die. Part of Wedge didn't want to care because the raid was meant to make Isard pay for Halinit's destruction. That raid had been collateral damage through and through, but murdering Typhirans, Vratics, and assorted resident alien workers would hardly make Isard atone for what she had done. The only pain she would feel would be the loss of Bacta and her ability to produce it. To her, those we kill are reason enough for continuing her predations, whereas those innocents she kills are just punishment for our misdeeds. Another part of Wedge wanted to abort the Twi'leks' run on the valley. The damage done had been rather ample. The death seeds would only be able to strafe the ground, sowing more terror in the populace, but probably not doing much to further cripple the refinery. What has already been done should be enough, but I know it isn't. He keyed his comm unit. Chirdaki, you are good to go. He got a double-click acknowledgement from Taldira, then Corin's voice broke in. Lead, I have multiple eyeball contacts coming up off the deck to the north. I copy, Nine. Seven, you have command of the ground op. Two, Nine, and Ten, on me to deal with the intruders. Wedge hauled back on his stick and brought the X-Wing up in a loop. Rolling out to port, he saw Asser pull up on his starboard S-foil, while Corin and Ural joined him to the left. How many, Nine? Eight, sir. I copy. Engage at will, but save your last two torpedoes. Standing off and shooting the TIE fighters down with proton torpedoes would be the safest means of defeating them, but Wedge wanted to save some torpedoes in case they ran into a heavy ship as they tried to get away. As nearly as I can tell, all of Isard's capital ships are five hours or more distant from here, but if one shows up, I want to give it a barrage that will keep it off us long enough for us to escape. The intervention of Typhiran Home Defense Corps pilots had been anticipated. Their intelligence reports about Kratu-5 had indicated the placement of such troops on the world, though after Gavin had described burning three of them down on Halinit, there was open debate as to whether or not the THDC pilots would dare come up and fight. Eight starfighters were enough to discourage someone from bringing their own freighter into Kratu 5's spaceport and demanding it be filled with Bacta, or to protect freighters going out to or coming back in from a convoy. Isar didn't anticipate our coming into this place in such strength and with the intention of wreaking total havoc. Wedge linked the fire on his lasers, pairing them and evened out his shields fore and aft. A pair of missiles from his port sizzled through the dawning sky and impaled distant specks of black. Twin stars twinkled for a moment before the sound of the explosion collided with his fighter. Then Wedge was on the ties and firing. Two bursts of laser fire bracketed one of the TIE fighters. The first pair of bolts liquefied one of the hexagonal solar panels, immediately pitching the fighter into a decaying flat spin. The second pair lopped off the upper half of the remaining solar panel, adding a loopy, wobbling element to the spin. The wounded tie dropped from the sky like the asymmetrical rock it resembled and exploded on impact with the ground. Pulling back on the stick, Wedge brought the X-Wing's nose up until it pointed away from the planet. He let the climb bleed off just a little of his speed, trading it for altitude. Then he came back over the top and started back down into the fight. He selected one target and began to close, but it died in a quad burst of laser fire, so he ruddered the nose to the right 
and swooped in on a tie angling for a deflection shot at Asser's X-Wing. These pilots know nothing. Coming in from above and in front of the TIE fighter, Wedge knew he should have been easy to spot. The TIE pilots had clearly focused in on getting Asser to the exclusion of everyone else. While that kind of focus and concentration might be useful in all sorts of endeavors, in a fighter pilot without situational awareness, it was suicide. Wedge knew from looking out his canopy and studying his sensors where his other fighters were and where the dwindling supply of ties was. He couldn't feel their presence in the way Luke described being able to fix people and machines in relation to himself through the Force. But he did have a sense of where they were. This situational awareness meant he would know if a tie had begun to close in on him and would be able to take the appropriate response from calling for help to outmaneuvering the other pilot. Without it, I would have died hundreds of times over. Applying a little rudder, Wedge tracked his crosshairs over to cover the tie and tightened up on the trigger. Four red lances of light converged, melding into one, then skewered the fighter's ball cockpit. The ion engines exploded, spinning the solar panels away like sabac cards. Flaming debris sprayed out like sparks in the wake of a passing meteorite, igniting a fire in the foliage below. Minuk trumpeted triumphantly. Wedge glanced at his main sensor screen. That was the last of them, true. He activated the comm unit. Nine, take ten and swing over the spaceport. Suppress ground fire if you get any, and report all clear. As ordered, lead. Shirdaki one to rogue leader. Go ahead, Taldira. Chair Ducky pass complete. We had secondary explosions in the vehicle sheds and machining shops. Good going, Taldira. Stand by for phase two of the operation. Tycho's voice entered the frequency. Wedge, I have someone on the deck complaining. Claims to be the plant manager. I copy, Tycho. Tell him to evacuate the whole area and consider a career change. Resistance means we grid the surrounding town and start melting parts of it. As ordered, Wedge. Looking back at Q5A7 and the surrounding area, Wedge saw a lot of fire and rising columns of dense smoke to greet the dawn. Some small ships had set out from the bay's marina and ground vehicles were beginning to fill the coastal roadway heading north and south. Those who can get away are. Those who can't will just wait in fear. Lead, this is Nine. The spaceport is clear. No hostiles and the traffic control tower is empty but intact. Wedge smiled. You got close enough to determine that, Nine? Whistler has good distance processing equipment from stakeouts, Lead. He's never been wrong before. I copy. Stay covering the spaceport. As ordered, lead. Nine out. Wedge punched up a new frequency on the comm unit. Rogue leader to Task Force Bantha. Bantha here, Wedge. We can spot the city by the fires from up here. I don't doubt that at all, Booster. It could have been nastier, but Iceheart only had eight vape bait pilots here. They're gone, so it's safe to have the freighters come in. Our pleasure. Incoming. Wedge smiled. During the two weeks the squadrons had trained for the raid, Booster had arranged for a convoy of independent freighters and smugglers to meet with him, Mirax, and the Pulsar Skate. He told them he'd get them all the Bacta they could haul, provided they would keep what they earned as a credit against his future demands. Some balked, but most came along, even though Booster demanded they slave their Nava computers to the skates and fly blind with him to their destination. When they arrived in the system and took up positions in the asteroid rings around Kratu 5, Wedge and his people began their run. Wedge brought the fighter's nose up until it eclipsed the burning town and started another turn over the ocean. Regret for the damage done to non-industrial targets began to eat at him. 
My parents died when a pirate took off from the fueling station they ran, igniting the station. Down there could easily be another kid who has just lost his parents in a blast we caused. I know what we're doing is right and even necessary, but that doesn't lessen the pain or dull the horror of the people on the ground. I have to believe that opposing Isard and insulating billions of people from her evil is a great good, a vital good, but I can never let myself think that it justifies inflicting pain on innocence. It may well explain why it had to be done, but it can never justify it. Even as revulsion for the fire and damage began to fill him, sanity provided a means for draining it off. The key difference between us and Isard is that she fully intended to do the most harm to the most people. We did not. We chose our targets well. We set the attack for a time when casualties would be minimized, and we have made no attempt to attack targets of opportunity like the ships or land speeders fleeing the town. We exerted as much control as possible to keep the strike as clean as we could. Wedge smiled. Then again, it was said that the Emperor's throne had been molded of good intentions. We must take responsibility for what we've done on the ground and repair what we can. If not, we do by negligence what Isard does in malice. He keyed the comm unit. Booster, when you're on the ground, establish a contact so reparation claims can be forwarded to us. I want survivors and orphans taken care of. This isn't the Gus Stretta station, Wedge. I know, but the kids on the ground don't have you to see them through the hard times, do they? I copy, Wedge. It will be done. Good. Wedge glanced again at the city, but the dawn had dulled the brightness of the flames and showed him how much of the area had gone unharmed. Booster? Make sure they know we hit Q5A7 to hit Isard, and we'll only be back if it's apparent she's dependent upon them again. Tell them we're death itself for our enemies, but the best of friends to have for allies. I'm sure they can figure out for themselves how to join that latter class. 22. Mirax Tarek gave the rakishly good-looking man a dazzling smile as she stepped into his office. Talon Card, pleased to meet you again. I don't know if you'll remember me. Card returned her smile, his pale blue eyes sparkling. I could hardly forget you, Mirax Tarek. Because of your efforts, those cases of Alderanian wine cost me well more than I had expected to pay. He took her right hand and gently kissed it. His black mustache and goatee tickled her hand and fingers. I didn't realize you were the other person bidding for them. But if you had, you'd not have fought any less tenaciously for them. Card shrugged easily enough that Mirax was almost willing to believe he had dismissed the matter. What you cost me I put down as the fee paid for a lesson in dealing with exotic items. If you weren't in the business of hauling things for the rebellion, I might have had a chance to test what I learned against you again. And my girl would have made you pay even more in your next meeting. Booster Tarek rested his big hands on Mirax's shoulders. I would have expected you to be using something bigger than an old hollowed-out asteroid for your headquarters card. You can afford it. Pleased to see you again, too, Booster. The hint of a smile played across Card's lips. As for this asteroid, Tapper found it, but before he could exploit it, he ran into some Imperial problems. After our groups merged, he brought it to my attention. We're using it until we find something more suitable. Kelev Tapper came around from behind Booster and stood next to the chair to the left of Card's massive desk. While most of the ore has been mined, there's enough metal in the rock to give sensors trouble. Though as slender as Card and almost as handsome, 
Tapper's manner contrasted sharply with Card's polite grace. It will do in the interim. Card opened his hands and indicated the pair of chairs facing the desk. Please be seated. Mirax accepted his invitation and looked around the office as she sat. The chamber's stone walls had been smoothed to an obsidian glassiness, but still had a significant texture in the bumps and recesses the mining process had left behind. The room's furnishings, characterized by Card's desk, were heavy and blocky, more of an industrial grade than they were elegant. Despite that, however, the artifacts and items displayed on shelves and atop tables did provide an air of sophistication to the surroundings. Mirax noted on the sideboard a cut crystal decanter full of a pale green liquid and four goblets, prompting a smile. Card's gaze followed hers, and he gave her a slight nod. Might I offer you some of the wine I paid so dearly for? The best is a dry green from Aldera. Mirax nodded. Please. She glanced at her father. Booster perched in his chair as if it were a slender pole and he was a bird topping it, but he nodded. Thank you. Card poured from the crystalline decanter. It looked to Mirax to be of Quarren manufacture. She knew from the styling it came from Mon Calamari, but the purple tint to the glass told her the Quarren had made it, not the Mon Cal's. Quarren crystal rarely makes it off Mon Calamari. Card definitely fishes for items with a very wide and fine net. She accepted her glass of wine from Card, then raised her glass with the others as Card offered a toast. May the bargaining be as sweet as the profit, and the next deal not long in coming. In tasting the wine, Mirax found it very dry but surprisingly tart, without being truly sour. Perfect with game. Card sat at his desk and nodded. I've heard it said this vintage was originally intended for a banquet featuring crepe dragon. Oh? What happened? Too much wine and not enough crate? No, too much crate and not enough hunter. Card held the glass up and let light sparkle through the wine's receding legs. The wine was ordered prior to the hunt. The dragon got the hunter and the widow used the vintage at the memorial service. The wine won praises, and since has been a very popular vintage. This particular year was considered very good, but the wine laid down the year of Alderaan's demise was supposed to be even better. Booster cleared his voice. It's amazing what you know, Card. I'm very impressed. I was wondering if your encyclopedic knowledge includes where I can get some supplies I need. Card's blue eyes narrowed slightly. You need or things Wedge Antilles needs? They're things that are needed, Card. Booster brought his hands together. Let's trim some parsecs off the course of this conversation, shall we? You know, I think of you like the son I never had. Card snorted. Like the son you never had killed. Mirax suppressed a laugh, and her father smiled. True, I've not forgotten how you managed to pick up pieces of my network while I was harvesting spice on Kessel. That did anger me, but it also convinced me that Mirax was right in wanting me to retire. Yet here you are, bargaining for Antilles and his band of mercenaries. Booster frowned. They're not mercenaries. No? Mirax shook her head. Actually, to be mercenaries, they'd have to be paid. They're doing what they're doing because of obligations they feel to the Vratix and others. Card shot a glance at Tapper. Then the two of them shook their heads. Idealists cause a lot of trouble in this galaxy. Just remember, it was one of those idealists who killed Jabba. Good point, Booster, but I've got no desire to end up like Jabba. Nor will you. Booster sipped more of his wine. 
Wedge and the others may be idealists in some respects, but they're also practical when they need to be, and I am here to put that practicality into terms you can understand and respect. What I'm looking for is missile and torpedo sensor packages, launch tube assemblies, and a supply of proton torpedoes and concussion missiles. Mirax noted no reaction by card, but Tapper's eyes widened quite a bit. Card raised a hand to cover a yawn. I've heard that you made a mess of the Bacta factory on Kratu 5. Care to know how much Bacta we hauled away? I have my estimates. I also know where you sent a great deal of it. Mirax smiled. It doesn't take a genius to know we've shipped a lot to Coruscant. But it will take a genius to get the rest of it, eh? Card set his glass of wine down. What sort of numbers are you looking at with your equipment? Booster leaned back in his seat. Three hundred launchers and sensor packages. Fifty should be snub fighter systems. The rest can be capital ship systems. Right now I want two thousand proton torpedoes and a thousand concussion missiles though I expect those numbers to change. Upward, of course? Of course. Card's expression sharpened. You're going to be arming your freighters, Booster? Try taking one of them off and find out, Card. Talon Card smiled broadly. I'm a smuggler, not a pirate. Thin line between them. Booster thrust his chin forward. Pirate steals from his suppliers. Smuggler just cheats them. You've distilled that difference to its essence, Booster. Card sat back in his chair. You'll be paying with Bacta? Booster nodded. Not a problem, I assume? Not really. The price now is so high that much of what I would be trading for is being sold to buy Bacta from the cartel. Oddly enough, with the New Republic somewhat strapped for liquid capital, military surplus in munitions are actually dropping in price. It's a buyer's market. I shouldn't be telling you that, of course. Mirax laughed. Except you know we already know that, and... Do you want to rub in the fact that you'll be gouging us on the prices? Card's eyes glittered with amusement. She's very sharp, Booster. You should be proud. I am. You can get us what we want? Card nodded. Not all at once, of course. Installments are fine. Booster glanced at a thumbnail, then looked back up. Delivery will be a bit peculiar. We'll arrange for exchanges at various places where your ships will offload material for us. We'll be transporting it to our final destination ourselves. Not that you don't trust me. But we don't trust you. Booster smiled. I know you've already learned more about our operation than I wanted you to. And I also know that Voru is trying to learn as much about us as he can. I don't want you to find we're a commodity you can trade to him for a profit. Card held his hands up. So far I have avoided taking sides in the Civil War, and I see this as a simple extension of it even though Antilles is resigned from the New Republic's military. Since the cartel really isn't interested in selling back to, to me, and since you need my services, it isn't going to do me any good to sacrifice you to them. Provided we still are a profit center for you. Card frowned. Booster, you make it sound like I don't value our history together. Oh, I think you do. And the history of your making a profit off me is what you value. Mirax raised an eyebrow. The fact that either one of you would sell the other for a bucket of warm dewback drool isn't really germane here. Betting against Wedge Antilles' abilities lost Iceheart the Imperial homeworld and sent her packing for Typhira. Talon, you're too smart not to back him, especially since his victory will break the cartel and open up the back to trade. 
A little gratitude toward you from the Ashurn rebels won't hurt when distribution is set up. Point taken. Card picked up the data pad on his desk and punched a few keys. I'm going to have you liaise with Melina Karnas on the delivery details. Booster frowned. Karnas? I don't know her. Never heard of her. She worked for Jabba on Tatooine. She filled a niche that would have been in the middle of his security apparatus, but she was Jabba's own agent. Formally, she was his dance coordinator. Good head on her shoulders. She understands a lot of the business, but is a bit shy on experience. Card stood and waved his left hand toward the doorway. Here she is. Come in, Melina, my dear. This is Booster Tarek and his charming daughter, Mirax. Mirax shook the woman's hand and returned her smile. Several inches shorter than Mirax, Melina wore her dark hair in a rather short cut. It accentuated a white stripe that started with scar tissue near the corner of Melina's right eye and shot straight back beyond her ear. Her green eyes and full mouth made her pretty and the way Tapper looked at her suggested he was smitten. Pleased to meet you both. Card waited until Tapper slid a chair from over by the wall beside his own, and Melina seated herself before he continued. Melina, you'll coordinate shipments of material to Booster. He'll give you the details. The cargo and the delivery points will be hazardous, but we'll not charge him our normal rates for such things. He's part of our family, albeit a rather distantly related one. She nodded. I understand. Mirax smiled. Great, this means what we don't pay for transport, we will pay for the cost of the items. And Card said it was a buyer's market. Card looked up from his data pad. Is there anything else you need, Booster? Tapper laughed. Perhaps he wants another chance, or the Death Star's womb. I mean, as long as your aim is to break the Bacta cartel, you might as well go in for other things you can't get. The brow over Booster's artificial left eye rose. It's important in this business for you to be able to tell fable from fact, and wishing from thinking. From what I've heard, about six months before I got out of Kessel, just after the imps hurt the rebels at Dera Four, but before they ran them off Hoth, some treasure hunters searching the Alderaan graveyard found another chance and turned the ship and its arms over to the rebels. That's fact. The location of the shipyard that built the Death Star is likely a fact as well, but it's one I don't know, and it's my wish that it's a fact that went to the grave with the Emperor. I don't think that's likely. Now, it's Iceheart's wish we won't break the cartel and destroy her power. Booster smiled coldly. I think. No, I know. She's not going to get her wish. Her fall will not be fast, and it won't be bloodless, but it's coming. Count it as fact. Tapper raised his hands. Sorry, I meant no offense. And none was taken. Mirax patted her father on the arm and felt the tension begin to flow out of him. My father just wanted to make sure that you knew betting against Wedge was a mistake. Card pressed his hands flat against his desktop. A lesson we have all learned, I am certain. Now let us attend to the details that make sure we all profit from it. 23. Corrin Horn felt tired enough from the recent raid and run home that he knew he should just turn in, but the idea of hitting the small suite of rooms he shared with Mirax didn't appeal. On his approach back to the Yagdul station, he'd gotten a message she'd recorded saying she was taking her father out on another trip to finalize arrangements for supply shipments. She expected to be gone for three days. Which means I'm alone when I could use a good hug and some sympathy. Corin knew what was happening to him, and he wanted to fight against it, 
But even by trying some of the breathing exercises Luke Skywalker had recommended to him, he had a hard time putting a dent in his downward emotional spiral. It's like flying into a fireball. You have to hang on and hope you come out in one piece on the other side. The fourth anniversary of his father's death had snuck up on Corrin and ambushed him. A lot of hydrogen had been melted into helium in a lot of stars since his father's death, but the memory of holding his father's dead body in his arms had the immediacy of an event that had occurred moments before. Corrin could still feel his father's weight pressing against him. The man's stillness, the stink of blood and blaster-burned flesh, the screams of those in the cantina, including his own, all pounded in on him. The previous year, things had not seemed to be so bad to him, but he'd just started with Rogue Squadron at that time, so he had a legion of distractions to dull the pain. He also realized that his liaison with Mirax and meeting her father made it tougher on him. Though he loved her and wouldn't give her up for anything, Corin couldn't help feeling that his father would have felt betrayed by his love for Mirax. While he knew his father would have accepted her eventually, the fact that he didn't have his father's approval gnawed away at him. Getting to see Booster and Mirax together compounded the problem. Corin was happy for Mirax that her father was around because the love they shared was obvious enough that a blind given frozen in carbonite could have seen it. She was lucky to have her father, and he was equally lucky to have her. As much as Corin wanted Mirax to be happy, what she shared with her father reminded him of what he had lost. I thought the void inside me had been filled, but it had just scabbed over and is now plenty open. On top of that, the next step in the evolution of the Bacta War was pushing him to the limit. Wedge had teams from full squadrons down to single two-ship flights out harassing the Bacta cartel. The whole strategy was to hit and run, which worked exceedingly well. Because the Typhirans scheduled their Bacta shipments, it was possible for the rogues to show up, force the Star Destroyers to scramble their fighters, pop off some proton torpedoes to take out a few ties, then scatter. He knew the strategy had to be frustrating for Iceheart's people, since they were taking losses here and there without killing any of the rogues. But it wasn't much better for Corrin or the rest of Wedge's people. Engaging in a straight-up fight with even a victory-class Star Destroyer like the Corruptor would be suicide for a squadron of X-Wings. It was true that the large Star Destroyers were not particularly good at defending themselves against snub fighters, hence the development of the Lancer-class frigates. But even accidentally shooting down one or two X-Wings would hurt the rogues significantly, Conversely, aside from repeated proton torpedo salvos, there was no way snub fighters could cripple or destroy a star destroyer. If the whole squadron fired a salvo of torpedoes at the same time, they could certainly bring the star destroyer's shields down. But any captain worth his rank cylinders would roll the ship to present undamaged shields and keep shooting. If all his shields were stripped away, he could still go to light speed before another torpedo could hit. Corrin had no wish to commit suicide in an attack on a Star Destroyer, but cutting and running made him feel... criminal. He knew that was stupid, but he figured the judgment was based on the fact that Wedge hadn't given anyone a clear timetable concerning when they would move into the war's final phase the phase where Iceheart left Typhira and the Bacta cartel would be broken. If I knew how long we were going to run, I could see it as a tactical advantage. Right now it seems as if we're doing something so we won't be doing nothing. Realizing he had no desire to be alone, he headed for the tap calf known as Flare Star. He hoped other members of the squadron would be there, though the chances of that were slim. Ural seemed to spend most of his time with the Ruit Savi. Noara Ven and Rizati, as well as Gavin and Asser Salar, 
spent most of their time being couples. Tycho and Wedge were either on missions or planning yet other missions. Broor Jace and Corrin had never been close, while Iniri Forge and the Celestian Captain Errol Nunb had discovered they shared a passion for obscure games of chance like Contract Sabak and Double Draw Fendok. As stunning as they were as pilots, their ability to separate other gamblers from their credits was so remarkable that two of the ships in the rogue's growing collection of freighters had joined the fleet to pay off bad debts. Corrin smiled to himself as he entered the Flare Star's darkened interior. Ineri's sister, Lu Jane, would just tell me I was holding myself back from getting to know the others, but I'm not sure it's that simple. I'm just without my close friends. Mirax, Ayala, Ural, and not really of a mood to make new friends. Corrin! Corrin Horn, come on over here! Corrin's smile grew at the sound of the man's voice. Pash? What are you doing here? He cut between and around tables and gave the taller, slender man a friendly backslapping hug. Normally, you aces fly your A-wings through this system so fast I didn't even think you saw us here. Pash pulled a chair over for Corrin, then pointed at one of the quartet of pilots already seated at the table. Lina caught an unstart in one of her J-77 engines just as we swung through the fringes of Yogdul's atmosphere. We called in an emergency and put into the station here. Zray said he can fix it up. Looks like a micrometeorite chewed up the alluvial compressor. Corrin nodded. That blows the pressure in the reaction chamber, and the engine pops out of sync with its twin. X-Wing's damper system prevents that from happening. Lina, a blonde woman with a mouth just a bit too wide, snorted. Sure, if you want to be piloting something that should be in a museum. Speed is what will keep a pilot safe and the A-wing has plenty of speed to burn. Corrin looked at Pash. You let your pilots talk like that? The red-haired man shrugged. Children, what can I do? You can explain to them that going faster doesn't mean they're flying better. Lina and the other three A-wing pilots regarded Corrin as if he and Pash had just taken public loyalty oaths to the Emperor. If you can't handle the speed, you're not much of a pilot. Corrin shook his head. Pash, you were just hoping I would walk in here, weren't you? Pash laughed lightly. Actually, I was waiting for Wedge or Tycho, but I figured you'd be up to the challenge. I know you know of times when speed wouldn't have helped at all. Corrin nodded. Or hurt. Sure, as if such a time could exist. Lina grabbed a half-full pitcher of Loman ale, filled her mug, and topped it with foam. Speed can't hurt. Oh, the innocence of youth. Corrin took the mug from in front of her and blew off the foam. Let me tell you about this time. We were on a mission, and we got jumped by a Lancer-class frigate. If I'd been in an A-wing, well, Rogue Squadron would have had a lot more dead on its rosters and Isard would still own Coruscant. Though he knew the news he had would make Isan Isard happy, in and of itself a feat worthy of monuments, Flirivoru kept any sign of it from his face as he entered her office. He intended to surprise her so he could gauge her disposition. The weather becoming hotter and the inclusion of daily rainstorms that hid in the early afternoon had combined with the pressure from Ashern strikes to make Isard more than disagreeable. Antilles and his antics had further exacerbated the problem. Their hit-and-run tactics were costing the cartel in both credits and prestige. Each raid cost the cartel one or two TIE fighters, which really amounted to insignificant losses if someone had access to a TIE fighter production facility. CNR fleet systems had numerous starfighter factories scattered throughout the galaxy, but they neglected to put one here on Typhira.
As a result, the cartel had to trade for replacements with the likes of Supreme Warlord Harsk and High Admiral Teradoc. They gratefully accepted Bacta in return for the fighters, but the scorn that came with each delivery could drive Isard into furious tantrums. When Isard turned to look at him and smiled, Flirivoru felt something cold and serpentine slither through his abdomen. Ah, Minister Voru, do come in. I was hoping we would have a chance to speak, and here you arrive before I need send for you. Glad he had saved himself from being summoned, Voru nodded graciously and returned a smile of his own. I have information I think you will find useful and even pleasing. Isard's scarlet diaphanous outfit rustled as she took a seat in a high-backed chair. Good news is most welcome, Minister Voru. Would you be seated? Refreshment? There is something going on here I do not understand. Have the Ashern poisoned her somehow? Perhaps I will give you my report, and you'll have a chance to reconsider your offer, Madam Director. Isard's eyes widened. You can't think me so capricious that I could rescind my offer because you've overestimated what you want to tell me, can you? She waved away any reply before he'd even made an attempt to open his mouth. My news is good enough to make me offer you something to drink. Give me your news. Then you shall have mine, and you can see if you want to drink with me. I knew one of us would be surprised here, but I didn't expect it would be me. He nodded slowly. As you will, Madam Director. Our main problem in dealing with Antilles and his people is that they are striking at us and running quickly because there's nothing to hold them back. They have no attachments to the systems they are hitting. We arrive, they launch proton torpedoes or concussion missiles, then they scatter like shrapnel from a proton mine. Isard nodded, her smile not having shrunk a millimeter. This has been the course of things to this point. I trust you have found a way to change this. Two aspects of it, yes. Voru lifted his chin. My network of spies has begun to produce information. I have yet to find out what the location of Antilles' base is. He and his people are being very cautious, but I have no doubt we will discover it in time. Until then I have uncovered two very important pieces of information. Where they are getting their munitions, and more to the point, where the next shipment will be placed in the hands of the Antilles group. Really? The hint of falsetto in her voice didn't escape Voru, but he did not consider it important at the moment. It is true, Madam Director. A woman working for Talon Card had previously been employed by Joppa the Hutt. Subsequent to his death, she spent a couple of years in abject poverty on Tatooine. Card took her in and has helped her get back on her feet but her taste for fine things has never been satisfied, nor has her ambition. Card appointed her to liaise with the Antilles people, Booster Tarek, in fact, an old friend from Kessel. Fascinating. Card's name is not unknown to me, though I would not have thought his organization of sufficient size to meet Antilles' needs. Carnus indicates Card's operation is larger than anyone suspects. Card prefers to maintain a low profile to escape trouble with authorities. Booster Tarek placed a huge order for munitions and equipment which Card is meeting in installments. Card's people are shipping the supplies to a rendezvous point, then Tarek is taking them back to Antilles' headquarters. Isard sat forward. Does Carnis know where that is? No, but I have been given the location of the rendezvous point. They will be making the transfer in the Alderaan system. They probably draw some sort of ephemeral strength from visiting the site of Alderaan's sacrifice. Undoubtedly so, Madam Director. What is important is that Antilles will have his fighters and his freighters there. 
If we divert our warships to Alderaan, we can ambush the Antilles group and destroy them. Isard's eyes narrowed, but her smile did not die, and this contradiction confused Voru. No, Minister Voru, I'm not going to send all my ships in case this information is false. I don't doubt you or your source, but Antilles might catch wind of our ambush and refuse to show up. He could even hit a Bacta convoy and subject us to yet more ridicule. No, I won't have that. She held up her right index finger. I do know what I will do. I will send Convarian and the Corrupter. He's ambushed them once and can do it again. Voru shook his head. But if you only send the Corrupter, Antilles and his people will scatter as usual. We will accomplish nothing. No, Voru, we will accomplish everything. Isard laughed aloud, her voice full of triumph. While you have woven a net of spies to catch Antilles, I have been searching for the means to kill him. I have found it, and in twelve hours it will be here and ready to join Convarian as he goes for the kill. Voru frowned. I don't understand. It is rather simple, Minister Voru. Isard's smile became cold. At great expense, I have leased from High Admiral Teradoc a ship, the Aggregator. Voru's jaw dropped. An interdictor cruiser? Exactly. She clapped her hands together. When it arrives at Alderaan and powers up its gravity well projectors, Antilles and his ships will be trapped. There will be another sacrifice at Alderaan. Another victory there for the Empire to celebrate. What do you say to that? I say, Madam Director, I will accept that drink you offered. Voru smiled. And raise a toast to victory. 24. Wedge's X-Wing reverted to real space above the plane of the elliptic in the Alderaan system. Spread out in a flat disk, the rubble that had once been Alderaan looked like the crumbs left behind after the cutting of a rishkate. He slowly shook his head. Dying only once isn't nearly enough punishment for the Emperor to atone for this evil. Minuk beeped with each ship entering the system. The rogues in their X-wings had come in first and oriented themselves toward the graveyard. The most likely threat to them would come from there, from pirates or others hidden amid the debris. Some of the chunks are large enough to screen even a Star Destroyer. If there was one there, the plan was clean and simple. The X-wings would target it with a full salvo of proton torpedoes, giving the other ships a chance to run. The dozen freighters Booster had rounded up came in next, with the Pulsar Skate in the lead. Moments after reversion, they made course corrections to get themselves pointed toward their exit vectors. The Cheer Daki came in last and split their squadron up so each freighter had a fighter escort. If trouble erupted, the Twi'lek and Gand squadron could reassemble and screen the escaping freighters from any ties or other snub fighters, then head out themselves. Wedge glanced at his screen and saw the names of the various ships in his fleet scroll up. Green letters indicated that they were all set to fulfill their part in the mission. At least we've gotten here in one piece. Now we need Card to do his job. Booster's grudging respect for Card counted for a lot with Wedge. He'd actually met Card years earlier, back in the days before he joined the Rebellion. Wedge had owned a freighter and was hauling cargo all over the Empire. Card had inquired if Wedge wanted to move some cargo for him, but Wedge had turned down the offer. He'd heard nothing bad about Card, and that had set him back a bit. No negative rumors means too little is known about the man, and I wasn't inclined to trust him as a result. Since joining the Rebellion, Wedge had not run across Card, but he didn't doubt Card's ability to produce the weapons and equipment they needed. 
The fact that Booster went to him first is proof enough that Card is genuine and can be trusted to deal straight with his clients. The munitions, launchers, and sensor systems would give them what they needed to complete Isard's downfall. Lead, this is Seven. Go ahead, Tycho. Wedge, I'm getting anomalous contacts from the graveyard on my IFF frequency. Wedge frowned. The Identify Friend-Foe system involved the identification beacon all ships carried. It sent out a signal that other ships picked up, telling them the name of the ship and its identification designation. Smugglers often had two or three IFF modules that they could swap in and out to run under clean names. Contacts on the IFF frequency were simple rechecks of a ship's identity. And if imps are waiting in the asteroids, it's an unbelievably stupid way to tip us to their presence. Tycho, is it the same signal over and over again? Seems so. You thinking an automated beacon of some sort? You are running an Alderanian code. Perhaps there is an old system traffic satellite in the asteroids wanting to check you for Alderaan control. Probably. I'll punch up the gain on my passive sensors and see if I can find anything in that direction. I copy. Wedge looked at his main screen as Minuk began beeping again. Heads up, people. We have incoming traffic. A string of freighters entered the system, led by a ship tagged Starry Ice by the IFF system. A half dozen ships drifted in behind ice, staggering their positions so strafing runs along any one particular vector would pick up only two targets. Because Card's ships were bigger than most of the freighters Booster had collected, the smuggler only needed half as many to deliver his goods. A man's voice broke in on the comm channel. This is Kolev Tapo for Card. We've gotten the initial payment for this lot, and you've got 50 million credits still in your account. In another month, we should have another 30% of your order ready. Booster responded to him over the comm channel. Fine with us. Begin the transfer. One of the freighters began to move forward, but as it cruised in right below the ice, a huge patch of space went from black and star-strewn to white, angular, and deadly. The interdictor cruiser's bulk eclipsed a massive slice of the graveyard. The sight of its quartet of domed gravity well projectors caused Wedge's stomach to fold in on itself. The cruiser will stop us from running into hyperspace, but it's far too weak to engage us by itself. It's going to be carrying a dozen ties at best, and the freighters can maneuver out of the effective range of its guns. Going after two squadrons of snub fighters, Half of us with proton torpedoes means this cruiser has gotten itself into a fight it really can't win. Before Wedge could begin to issue orders, two things happened. The first, the lighting up of a red warning light on his console was something he expected. It told him that the interdictor cruiser had powered up the gravity well projectors and that none of the ships in the system could jump to hyperspace to escape. Not a wise move to trap us here. The second thing squeezed an icy fist around his heart. One-third larger than the interdictor cruiser, the corruptor appeared to interpose its bulk between the cruiser aggregator and the snub fighters. Its turbo-laser batteries and ion cannons immediately began spraying green and blue energy bolts out toward the waiting freighters. Wedge knew instantly the barrage was untargeted, meant more to inspire panic than do damage. As TIE fighters started pouring from the destroyer's belly, Wedge immediately started snapping orders to his people. Booster, scatter freighters, move! Taldera, give me a flight to Orient on me and another to Orient on Tycho. Use the others to vape those ties, but don't close with Corruptor. Rogues, slave your torpedo targeting to my signal. Transmitting now. Tycho, I go first, then you follow. I copy, Wedge. Wedge's droid, Minek, shrieked furiously as Wedge punched the throttle forward and drove straight at the Victory II class Star Destroyer. Shut up, Minek. Distract me with your screaming and we'll both end up dead. The droid fell silent, and Wedge promised himself that if he survived the run, 
he would get the droid's memory wiped and rename it something suitably heroic. Though the droid lacked courage, his assessment of the current situation was dead on and worth screaming about. The destroyer and cruiser carried between them three squadrons of ties. Wedge's confidence in his people knew no limits, but the rogues were standing off to shoot their proton torpedoes, which left the Twi'leks to fight against the ties. The chances that some ties would get through to harass the freighters were overwhelming. The tie threat was the least of the problem they faced in the system. The only way to counter the corruptor's threat was for the X-Wings to hit it with a spread of proton torpedoes. The squadron, firing double shots, could pump out 22 proton torpedoes. If they hit, and missing a nearly kilometer-long ship was tough, they could blow through the shields and do some damage. Wedge would fly in close to target the ship for the first volley, then have Tycho follow up for a second, hopefully catching the corruptor without shields in place. If the second spread hits the Star Destroyer in an unshielded area, it could rip it apart. We'll get damage on the first spread, but it'll be the second that knocks it out. Wedge pushed all power to his forward shields as he hit a wall of TIE fighters six kilometers out from the corruptor. Once past them, he evened his shields out with a flick of his thumb and then started draining his lasers of energy and pumping it into his shields. At two and a half kilometers, he would get a firing solution for the corruptor. He'd hold it until his squadron had launched, launch himself, then pull up and out. Coming up on targeting. On my mark. Five, four, three, two, one. Get ready. The targeting reticle on his head-up display went red. Mark! Wedge pulled the trigger on his stick, launching two proton torpedoes. Launch report after launch report from his squadron scrolled up on his screen. Hey, even the Gans got off two concussion missiles. Preparing to break off and run, Wedge glanced at his sensors and saw four ties in his rear arc. Realizing that pulling up and away would allow them to pounce on him, Wedge rolled his X-Wing to port, then took the snub fighter down in a long loop that would carry him below the Corruptor's hull. If they want to come after me, they get to brave their own fire, too. Juking right and left, Wedge bounced the fighter back and forth between streams of turbo-laser fire. A brilliant incandescence blossomed above him. The proton torpedoes slammed into the Corruptor's shields all along the ship's length. The shields acted like huge invisible parasols to ward off the fierce energy unleashed by the proton torpedo's detonations. Roiling plasma curved up and around, following the arc of the corruptor's port shields as if some energy creature were trying to take a bite out of the ship. Then several torpedoes arrived late and pierced the shield at its heart, causing it to collapse. The tardy torpedoes and two concussion missiles pounded the destroyer's hull, blasting apart armor plates and crushing turbo-laser batteries. Beginning my run now, Wedge felt a moment's joy at the collapse of the corruptor's shields, but it died as the big ship began to maneuver. It rotated in space above him, executing a roll that swapped up for down and presented the squadron with its undamaged starboard shields as a target. Canvarian knows we have a limited supply of proton torpedoes. If he survived this salvo, we've got one last shot to take him down. If he repairs his shields and rolls again, we're done, because then he can take all the time he wants to come after us. Wedge keyed his comm unit. Car and set up for the third run. I copy, Wedge. Lots of eyeballs out here. Here, too. Wedge pulled back on his stick and brought his X-Wing up between the aggregator and the corruptor. He got a good look at the damage the torpedoes had done to the destroyer and saw fire in the ship's interior. He knew bulkheads had already been sealed and the fires would go out as soon as the atmosphere drained away. So it's time to see if I can add to the problem. He started to angle in at the corruptor, but green laser bolts slashed past him from behind, causing him to break off the run, roll, and dive. Tycho's voice boomed over the comm unit. On my mark! Five, four, three, two, one. Get into firing position. Right. 
The pair of ties on Wedge's tail had no intention of letting him set up on the corrupter. Wedge chopped his throttle back, then reversed his thrust and ran it up to full. The TIE fighters immediately closed and snapped off quick shots, then bypassed him. Hitting the right rudder pedal, Wedge brought the X-Wing's nose around on the track of one of them. Switching over to quad-fire lasers, he hit the trigger. Three of the bolts hit the TIE. Two lanced through the cockpit, while one boiled away a corner of a solar panel. The fighter immediately went into a flat spin and arced out toward the system's outer orbits. More rudder brought the X-Wing around to point back up at the corruptor. Wedge killed his reverse thrust and started it forward as Tycho said, Mark, fire now! Wedge thumbed his fire control over to missiles and got a lock, but never pulled the trigger. Sith spawn, what is that? A ship the size of a Carrick-class light cruiser ranged up from the graveyard, cutting in past the aggregator's stern and in at the corruptor's bridge. The ship's white nose was separated from the blood-red after portion by a big black stripe slashed on the diagonal across it. Wedge realized he'd seen that color scheme on a ship before, but he didn't connect it with Tycho's X-Wing until the cruiser opened up on the corruptor with its weaponry. Five heavy turbo lasers and ten laser cannons poured scarlet energy into the destroyer's unshielded hull. The laser cannon shot skittered across the white surface, stippling it with black marks and exploding turbo laser batteries. The heavy turbo lasers concentrated their fire on the destroyer's tower, burning through the hull on deck after deck. Wedge kicked his thrust in at full and rolled his X-wing so he put the graveyard over his head and the destroyer's hull beneath his fighter. Off his starboard S-foils, a silvery glow built as the first of the proton torpedoes hit. The energy storm they created splashed up and around the edges of the shield. Wedge pushed the X-Wing lower, skimming it along the destroyer's hull. Just like being back in the trenches. Wedge jinked the ship as turbo lasers and the starfighter behind him tried to target him, then hauled back on his stick. The aiming reticle for his proton torpedoes had burned red for the entirety of his flight, but Wedge held back until his true target sank down into the reticle. He saw one Imperial officer standing in the middle of the bridge viewport and watched his mouth open in surprise. Wedge hit the trigger. A pair of proton torpedoes stabbed through the transparasteel viewport, filling the bridge with blue fire, then detonated. The bridge's blocky outline plumped and softened for a second before the aft port corner blew out, vomiting golden fire. Backblast sent smaller golden geysers back out through the forward viewports, but Wedge pulled up between them, then rolled and dove past the destroyer's aft. Tycho, hit the cruiser! I copy. On me, rogues. Beginning my run now. Coming up over the belly of the destroyer, Wedge got a good look at the battle. Sporadic turbo laser and ion cannon fire came from the corruptor, but far more numerous were the escape pods exploding from its hull. The aggregator tried to shoot at the snub fighters, but most were using the dying destroyer as a shield as they approached, and the aggregator's commander seemed reluctant to shoot in that direction. The light cruiser came back around and made a run across the aggregator's stern. The ships exchanged fire, but the interdictor cruiser could only bring a few of its weapons to bear on the other ship. Neither ship did significant damage to the other, though the aggregator's starboard shields did go down. On my mark, launch torpedoes! Mark! On Tycho's command, the X-Wings launched their missiles. Blue pinpoints of fire blossomed from various points around the graveyard and shot in at the interdictor cruiser. The red light on Wedge's console went out as the ship's commander shunted power from the gravity well projectors to his shields. That's the move to make, but did he do it in time? Most of the proton torpedoes, beginning with the two Tycho launched, slammed into the port shield. They exploded into a silvery firestorm that billowed up and out, then pressed in on the shield. Unlike the Corruptor's shield, however, the aggregators did not collapse all at once. Gaps appeared at a couple of points, allowing a handful of torpedoes to skip through and blast into the ship's hull. 
armor plates peeled away like dead, dry skin, and secondary explosions ripped gaping holes in the interdictor's hull. Without waiting to pick up TIE fighters or escape pods, the aggregator suddenly jetted forward. On Wedge's console, the rangefinder scrolled off numbers, then the cruiser vanished into hyperspace. Running was his only choice. Wedge glanced at his sensors and saw no hostile fighters near him. Safe for the moment, he keyed his comm unit. Tapper, don't run very far. Booster, report on your fleet. We're all still here, Wedge. We took some hits from ties, but shields mostly held, so we're all operational. I copy, Booster. Rogues and Chirdaki, protect yourselves, but hold back from killing anyone who isn't being actively hostile for a moment. Wedge glanced back over his shoulder. Minox scan comm frequencies and get me the command frequency the ties are using. I also need the escape pod frequency. The droid's muted beep acknowledged the command, and data began to scroll up on the main screen. Thanks. He punched up the frequency for the TIE fighters. Imperial pilots, this is Wedge Antilles. You have a choice. Get killed here, stranded here, or surrender. If you want to surrender, power down your weapons and engines. If you're moving under power, we will consider you hostile. We've got no more reason to want you dead than I would hope you have to be dead. A lone male voice came back over the comm unit. Captain Ardell from Corruptor here. We're Typhiran Home Defense Corps pilots. Does that make a difference in your offer? Is Arisi Dalarat flying with you? No, sir. I was in her command, but was picked to head up one of the two squadrons coming here with the Corruptor. Mostly trainees. I've got eight left. The Aggregator's squadron only has four left, and they're THDC, too. I copy, Captain Ardle. Follow the instructions I gave you, and you'll not be hurt. What about the escape pods? We'll recover them, too. And the Corruptor? Wedge switched his main screen to a plot of ship positions in the system over time and set his viewpoint from within the graveyard. The Corruptor is currently not under power and is drifting down into the graveyard. Inside two hours, the graveyard's asteroids will chew it up into unrecognizable bits. Oh! Bartle sounded subdued. Alderaan has its revenge on the Empire. And exacts revenge for hell in it. We don't have the tractor beams to pull it back up, and I sincerely doubt it could be made operational again. Running as fast as possible to Coruscant, we couldn't get anything back here in time to save it. Wedge knew the run to Corellia would be shorter, but he expected no help from his homeworld and the diktat. The Corruptor is gone. I copy, Antilles. I'll give the order to my people and we'll wait to be rescued. Wedge switched over to the escape pod frequency and repeated his offer of rescue, then arranged with Kelev Tapper for his ships to pick up as many pods as they could and exact whatever ransom they wanted from the passengers. Tapper sounded more interested in getting the ties and their pilots, but Wedge declared them prisoners of war and refused to let Tapper have them. Okay, Antilles, I'll let it go, but only because I know you'll be buying spare parts for those ties from us before too long. That's probably truer than I'd like to admit, Tapper. Have a safe trip home. Tycho's voice broke through on the comm frequency. Wedge, I have a situation. Yes? Remember that cruiser that took a piece out of the corruptor? Kind of hard to forget, isn't it? Well, it was the source of the IFF queries earlier on. It appears to think I'm the another chance. It has identified itself as the Valiant, and now it wants to know where we're going to go from here. Wedge brought his X-Wing around so he could see the light cruiser again. There it hung in space, 300 meters of lethal starship. Having it as part of our fleet would be very good, but how can we convince it to join us? Tycho, any sign of intelligent life on board? A uh, wedge, it thinks I'm an Alderanian war frigate, so I think we can rule out intelligence. If I had to guess, I'd assume this cruiser was slave to another chance as an escort. 
They got separated, and it returned here to wait for another chance to show up. I arrived with the IFF code, started broadcasting targeting information, and it did its job. Wedge nodded. I copy. I think I need you to take it back to our base. Mtre, if I recall his introductory monologue, is supposed to know the rules, regs, and procedures of over six million military organizations, past and present. Perhaps he can figure out a way to communicate with the Valiant so we can make full use of it. Got it. Do I leave now or wait and escort the rest of you back? We'll go together. Wedge smiled. Victory like this deserves a parade, and I'd be happy to have you and your cruiser in the lead. 25. Corin Horn dropped into the seat beside Mirax at the black round table in the briefing room. He felt bone-weary from the fight at Alderaan, which surprised him because he'd actually not shot down any of the eyeballs. Because he had been waiting for fire orders to send proton torpedoes at the larger ships, all he could do was evade their attacks. While the pilots had been clearly green, a fact that 66% losses on their part made abundantly clear, their lasers still burned hot and could have vaped him had he not outflown them. He took Mirax's left hand in his right beneath the edge of the table. Sorry I couldn't cover the skate out there. Mirax gave him a smile that helped energize him. I'd have felt safer, but that would have spoiled Booster One-Man Army Tarek's fun. He manned the laser cannon and was a general hazard to any eyeball peeking at us. He says he winged a couple of them. Corin gave her hand to squeeze, then looked up and saw Booster glowering at him from the other side of the table. If looks were lasers, he'd be more than winging me right now. I'm glad there weren't more in the way of complications. Your father looks ready to rip something apart with his bare hands, like me. Being ambushed by imps has him in a bad mood. We'll be heading out soon for a meeting with Talon Card concerning security. The leak came from his people? Mirax nodded. My father thinks so. I want you to look over some stuff on it for me. Give me your professional opinion about this spy thing. Uh, sure, Mirax, glad to, but you should remember from the Arisi thing, I'm not that sharp on spotting spies. This one isn't that good. Mirax gave him a wink. Let me know what you think. We'll see if Card concurs. Wedge and Winter entered the room, followed closely by Taldira, Errol Nunb, and Tycho. Winter sat down at the data pad built in at the far end of the table and hit some keys. A holographic image of the Yagdul station hovered over the holopad in the center of the oval table. Wedge took a position at the head of the table. Tycho sat between him and Booster, and Taldira took the seat at Booster's left hand. The Celestian seated herself to Mirax's right, facing Taldira. Wedge covered a yawn, then leaned forward on the end of the table. I apologize for asking you here to this briefing so quickly after your return, but I want to talk about what happened in the graveyard while details are still fresh in our minds. We have two issues to discuss, the arrival of the imps and what to do with the Valiant. Before that, however, I want to thank each of you for your action and the action of your people at Alderaan. There's no question about it, we got very lucky at Alderaan. The Valiant's appearance and action hurt both the Corrupter and the Aggregator. Even so, it was the discipline of our people that provided us the opportunity for such luck to come into play. If it weren't for your cheer docky pilots covering Tycho and me on our runs, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did to either imp ship. The Twi'lek's brain tails twitched strongly. Your praise is most appreciated, Wedge Antilles. The loss of two of my pilots is grave, but nothing in comparison to what all of us would have lost were our leadership not so clear thinking in a time of trouble. Tycho nodded in agreement. It was your torps that vaped the Corrupter, Wedge. Zray's going to waste a lot of paint adding it to your display of kills. Wedge shook his head. 
Look, your shots heard it. I was just in a position to pinpoint a target. Imps have forever dismissed the threat our torps are to their ships. You'd think after losing two Death Stars to X-Wings, they'd learn, but their ignorance is our margin of safety. Corrin smiled. So you will order Zray to pull the kill from your X-Wing? Wedge hesitated, then smiled sheepishly. Let's not go too far. It was a good pair of shots. His eyes narrowed. Convarian got what he deserved, especially in getting the tables turned on him. The fact that he was able to show up and had an interdictor cruiser with him is most disturbing. Winter, any idea where the aggregator came from? Winter tucked a lock of white hair back behind her left ear, then hit several keys on the data pad. The image floating above the table shifted from that of the station to the triangular form of an interdictor cruiser. The aggregator was last noted as part of an anti-rebel task force led by High Admiral Teradoc. Intelligence on him, at least the intel I'm able to access from here, is sketchy. Most of his duty stations were rimward. He was diligent in his duties and virulently anti-rebel, but beyond that unremarkable. He was not at Endor and remained nominally loyal to the Empire until Coruscant fell. As nearly as Corrin knew, Teradoc's history was not unique. A few brave individuals declared themselves warlords as soon as they heard of the Emperor's death, but many of the others, especially those in the military, remained loyal to the Empire. Sate Pestage, an Imperial advisor, held power for six months until a cabal of Imperial advisors ousted him from power. Most of the military backed this group because it seemed disposed to taking action. It was only after Isan Isard supplanted them that members of the military began to grab for power themselves. Even so, a fair number of military leaders and politicians proclaimed their loyalty to the Empire until Coruscant fell. At which point they had to fend for themselves, since they no longer had access to the bureaucracy that made the Empire run. While there were administrative areas and sectors that held themselves together, a tribute to the resourcefulness of their grand moths, Corrin expected that within two years nearly three-quarters of what had once been the Empire would be under the New Republic's control. Winter looked up from the data pad. If I had to guess how Isard got her hands on the aggregator, I would guess she traded back to for it. The fact that the aggregator's ties were being flown by Typhiron Home Defense Corps pilots suggests that Teradoc is running low on trained personnel. With a supply of Bacta, he can keep them alive a bit longer. Without unlimited Imperial resources, he's having to conserve people the way we did. Booster narrowed his eyes, both electronic and natural. I'd also read into the pilot chain's a lack of confidence by Teradoc in Isard. Right now, you'd have to figure that Teradoc is getting gigabytes of stories from the aggregator's crew about how we ambush the ambushers. I think if I have my people start asking around what someone is willing to pay for a slightly used interdictor cruiser, word will get back to Teradoc. He'll assume we're suggesting we're planning on capturing the next one he loans to Isard, so he won't be free with his ship. Wedge nodded. That's worth a try. From this point forward, we're going to have to assume, however, that it is possible another interdictor cruiser could jump us. Actually, we have to assume it is probable that we might be jumped again. We'll continue hit-and-run attacks, and we'll just have to make our exchanges more covert. We can do that by having the incoming freighters guided to a location of our choosing, which means they won't know where they're going until the last minute. Mirax raised her right hand. Perhaps you can't remember back when you were hauling cargo, but I'd never go to a rendezvous without knowing where it was. Good point, but I suspect Kelov Tapper can convince Card that we're trustworthy. Booster laughed. Continue paying in advance, and Card will believe it. That will do. Wedge straightened up. Remember, we've now eliminated one of Isard's four ships. Sure, Corrin sighed. 
but it was the smallest of them all. Agreed, but 8 Convarian was probably the most aggressive of the commanders Isart had working for her. He knew how to fight a Star Destroyer, what chances you could take with it and what chances you couldn't. He expected us to scatter, and we didn't, which is why he died. The commanders of the larger ships are likely to be more conservative. Wedge smiled. The Empire's boldest admirals died at Yavin. Regardless, both Avarice and Virulence are the newer model Imperial-class Star Destroyers, Deuces, so they carry six squadrons of ties. No matter how good or bad their commanders are, they can overwhelm us. Corrin smiled. With targets? Yes, but targets that shoot back. Wedge shook his head. Imp Star Deuces have a crew of nearly 46,000 people, if you count the troops they carry in the mix. They have a lot of firepower. Granted that it's not terribly well suited for use against snub fighter squadrons, but an Imp Star Deuce will take a lot more pounding than a victim like the Corruptor before it goes away. Tycho nodded. The one thing we have going for us in this regard is that a big ship has a lot more things that can go wrong with it than a smaller ship. Maintaining our X-Wings is easy compared to maintaining an Impstar Deuce. Isart is going to have to be using them to run with convoys, and if we keep hitting them, the Impstars are going to have to be on a near-constant state of alert. That will take its toll. But will they wear out before you do? Mirax looked from Wedge to Tycho, Taldira, and finally Corin. Even before this last operation, you were pushing yourselves very hard. Tycho's right. Repairing an X-Wing is easier than repairing a Star Destroyer, and I don't doubt that we can do things to spike the prices on crucial parts for Isard ships by buying them up ourselves. But replacing any of you or your people is going to be impossible. Corin knew she was asking the right question, but she was missing clues to the answer. One advantage we have, Mirax, is that Isard's forces have to react to us. They always have to suppose we're out there, whereas we only have to deal with them when we are out there. It will be rougher on them than it is on us. We can't keep this up forever, but we won't have to. He looked at Wedge. Right, Commander? I hope so, Corrin. Wedge folded his arms across his chest. I like the idea of buying up some critical parts. Turbo laser, focal lenses, power couplers, and the like. Better yet, if we can find junk and get it to the other side, that would help a lot. I'll see what I can do on that count, Wedge. Thanks, Booster. Wedge frowned. I also gather you're going to speak to Card about how the imps found us at Alderaan. A brain tail twitched its way toward the center of the table. How do we know the information was not transmitted from our side to Isard's people? Booster looked over at Taldira. Our freighters were slaved for the jumps to the skate. I didn't tell my people where we were going. Wedge told you fighter jocks where we were going in your mission briefing, but that was only 48 hours before the run. The aggregator was given over to Isard five days before the strike and the pilots on it were run through mission-specific briefings about 12 hours after the ship arrived. Card had the information about our run a good two standard weeks before that, which means the data squirted from his people to the imps. Besides, if one of Booster's people betrayed us, Isard would have showed up here with the Lusankia. Corin tapped a finger against the tabletop. Presumably, that's information Card doesn't have. Nor information he'll get from me or my people. Booster snarled directly at Corin. My people are good people, Horn. Decidedly trustworthy. Errol Numb chittered in Celestian for a second, then translated to basic. Booster, Corin did not mean to suggest your people are untrustworthy. He stated as much by noting we were not attacked here. I know what he was implying, Captain Nunb. Booster's frown deepened. He's Corsic through and through, and a horn on top of that. 
He assumes no one who's ever moved a little contraband can be trusted. Corin wanted to protest that he hadn't meant what Booster thought he did, but he had to admit to himself that deep down he was suspicious of the smugglers Booster had working on hauling supplies for them. In the past it would have been simply because they were smugglers, and anyone who has once crossed the border between lawful and lawless is likely to do it again and again. Because of that they can't be trusted, at least they can't from the point of view of someone who is lawful. Now, because I'm an outlaw, I know that isn't exactly true, but I didn't suspect Arisi until too late, primarily because she was one of us. Because that fact made me blind to her treachery, I want to avoid falling into that same trap again. He looked over at Booster. Of course, he'll never believe that. Wedge rapped a knuckle on the table. Enough, Booster. Harold's right, and no matter what Corrin might or might not think about your people, I know it's nothing you've not already thought a dozen times over about each of them. We're in a tenuous situation here, and caution is vital for all of us. The fact is that a leak probably did come through Card's people. Booster, I want you to sort that out with him. Consider it done. Good. You'll let me know what Card says. Wedge looked up at Winter. Last topic. The Valiant. Any luck in learning anything about it? A lot of luck, actually. Winter smiled heartily. The Valiant is an Alderanian Thronta-class war cruiser. All of them were supposed to have been destroyed when Alderaan disarmed, but it seems as if Valiant and two other war cruisers, Courage and Fidelity, were refitted with robotic controls and slaved to accept commands from another chance. They were its escorts. One of them would fly into the system before it, another would fly with it, and the third would take another course to draw off pursuit. The trio of ships would change off, and some of the damage on the exterior of the ship suggests it ran off more than one pirate raid on another chance. If m can talk it into opening up its logs, we'll be able to confirm that idea. Wedge gave her a big grin. That's a lot of information for so little time to research the ship. Winter's hair spread out in a white veil across her shoulders as she shook her head. Most of it is information I remember from reading histories when I was younger and by correlating little bits of data I picked up in the Organa household or when I worked with Princess Leia, aiding her father. When the Another Chance was recovered, it was clear that a massive power surge had fried circuits, including the controllers for the external communication arrays that allowed ship-to-ship -ship communication. Since Valiant queried Tycho's X-Wing when it broadcast the Another Chance's IFF code and followed his lead in picking targets, the Valiant was clearly assigned to protect the Another Chance. Three war cruisers and a war frigate frequently comprised a patrol in the Alderanian fleet, so I concluded there must have been three war cruisers. The Valiant and the other two were the last three built in that class, were commissioned, and then were immediately decommissioned. Unlike the other ships the Alderanians had used in the Clone Wars, which were scrapped and melted down into peace medals that were presented to the crews and surviving families as mementos, there were no records of scraps being sent out to crews, nor are there records of crews having served on them, so I have concluded that they were immediately refitted with droids to accompany the war frigate another chance. Booster's jaw hung open. You remembered all that and figured it all out? Mirax laughed. Winter has a holographic memory. She remembers everything she sees, hears, or experiences, including that dumb look you're giving her. Booster snapped his mouth shut, then shook his head. Well, then remember this. Never have children. Wedge snorted out a quick laugh. Crumbs don't fall far from the hut's mouth, Booster. Thanks a lot, Wedge. Mirax gave him a hard stare, but softened it with a smile. Sorry, Mirax. Winter, what are the chances that courage and fidelity are still out there? Won't have any way of estimating that until we get a look at Valiant's inner workings. M'Tre thinks he can find a way in, 
and he now has Whistler helping him slice some code. Zre is nearly shredding his carapace over a chance to work on the Valiant, so my guess is that they'll have it open and functioning to our satisfaction within a couple of weeks. Well, that's something, then. Wedge glanced at Booster. You want the Valiant, or is it too small for you? I'm sure you can find someone else who's better suited to commanding it. Booster forced a yawn. Overseeing a crew of droids would be more boring than I care to imagine. You should give the job to that protocol droid of yours. Corin laughed. Trying to visualize Emtray on the bridge of a ship issuing commands produced ridiculous images in his mind. By the time he informed his crew of his qualifications, they'd mutiny. Wedge and the others who had worked with M. Trey joined Corin in laughter. Wedge ended his laugh with a cough, then cleared his throat. I think M. Trey is better suited to be an executive officer, not a commander. I do think, however, we've got someone who has the skills we need and could get more out of a droid crew than anyone else. He reached out with his right hand and touched Errol Nunb on her left shoulder. You've flown more than fighters. Interested in commanding a war cruiser? Her deep red eyes widened in surprise, then she nodded. That's a job I can handle. I may need Imtre to help me. He's all yours. Wedge gave her a nod, then smiled at the others. Okay, I think we've got some directions in which we can head and some operations to plan. We got lucky this time, but from here on out, we manufacture luck. The good we'll keep, and the bad will go to Isard. She missed her best chance to kill us off, and I see no reason to give her another one. 26. The apathetic mask Fleury Voru had fitted onto his face cracked. He'd managed to keep his expression utterly impassive as Isan Isar dressed down Erisi Dalarit. Both women had maintained rigid control at first, wielding civility and titles with razor-kiss efficacy. Polite phrasings bottled up vitriol, but Voru knew if he'd tossed a pair of lightsabers between them, they'd have minced each other in a nanosecond. Then Isan Isar had said, High Admiral Teradoc has withdrawn the aggregator from my service, and that is your fault. Arisi exploded. My fault? What algorithm did you use to calculate that conclusion, sir? The calculations were simple enough that I would have thought any provincial mind could have grasped them. Isard's eyes narrowed as her hands balled into fists. Your pilots were on both the aggregator and the corruptor. It was your pilots who were supposed to deal with the snub fighter threat. They failed, costing me the corruptor and now making me the laughing stock of the galaxy. Teradoc had the gall to say to me that he'd only lend me toys if I would promise they would not return broken. The Emperor would have had his guts for floss over such a remark. Because of you, I am subject to such indignities. Begging your pardon, but the orders placing my pilots on those ships came from you. I asked you to use our elite pilots for the mission, but you picked a green unit. Their evaluations, reports you prepared, were outstanding. Yes, but they'd not seen combat before. Arisi's blue eyes burned intensely. You sent them out after a unit that is arguably the best fighter squadron in the galaxy. Isard raised an eyebrow. Even with your participation no longer needed or welcome? The sniped quip seemed to pass unnoticed by Dularit, but Voru had no doubt she'd cataloged it. My elite squadron is the equal of Rogue Squadron. If you had sent us after them, Teradoc would be prostrate before you, begging you to accept his allegiance. He's laughing because you destroyed three squadrons because you didn't heed the warning he offered by refusing to send his own pilots against Antilles. Voru saw Isard preparing for a counter-argument and knew if Isard were not checked, the Risi might pay with her life for her frank audacity. 
In the space of a heartbeat, he examined his options. If he said nothing, Isard would destroy a Risi Dolaret, throwing the Dolaret family into further disrepute. The fact that the Ashern had humiliated her father clearly fueled her desire for retribution on the forces arrayed against the Bacta cartel. She had wanted to fly on the mission to Alderaan, but Isard had refused that request. To turn around and then blame Irisi for the mission's failure was frustrating enough that Irisi might wish for death. Intervening on her behalf would open him to Isard's wrath, but the price might be worth it. Arisi and her family still had considerable influence within the Bacta cartel. If Isard had to be removed, having Irisi as an ally might make such an operation possible, and certainly would smooth over the consequences of it on Typhira. I could even claim to the New Republic that I joined Isard specifically to work against her from the inside like this. The idea that the New Republic would have to accept him as the leader of the new Bacta cartel, broadened the grin Eurysi's defiance had put on his face. I think, Madam Director, you cannot discount the fact that the rogues clearly had planned ahead against the eventuality of betrayal. Granted, an Alderanian war cruiser is an antiquated ship, but coupled with the X-Wing squadron's strength, it was enough to make Captain Convarian pay for his recklessness. Isard rotated her head around to glance at him over her shoulder. You presume Convarian made a mistake to blind me to the fact that if our operation was betrayed to Antilles, it was doubtless through a spy you have failed to locate. Voru caught Erisi's eye, and in a moment he felt he had earned her gratitude. Part of him began to list the various ways she could make it more manifest. Because of her beauty and strength, the idea of a physical union to consummate their alliance in opposition to Isard came to mind, but he dismissed it. He had no doubt it could happen, and might well happen yet, but their need for each other had higher purposes than sating lust. If we are to be allies, our first conjunction must be full of purpose and confirmed by reason, not dictated and muddled by emotional involvement. Voru knew he could fall victim to Erisi's charms because she realized that it was possible to play to his vanity and desperation. He had always been vain, but he had kept it in check. His age attacked both his vanity and ambition, reminding himself that he had little time to accomplish all the goals he had set out for his life. His time on Kessel had gotten him no closer to the heights he had once seen at his due, and now he knew that unless he acted quickly, his chances of even approaching them would wither and die. That possibility cannot be discounted, of course, Madam Director, nor can it be proven, as you are well aware. The fact is that Antilles has been very cautious throughout his career. That he has lived this long is ample proof of that. The precaution taken against our interference could have been nothing more than a concern over whether or not he could trust his trading partner. Isaid turned so she could watch both him and Arisi. Yes, his trading partner. I want card dealt with. Voru shook his head. Under no circumstances. If we treat Talon Card any differently than we do now, he will realize we have an agent among his people, and we lose a very valuable resource. Moreover, Card's loyalty can be bought. We will have him when, if, and however we want him. He opened his hands. As for your assertion that Commander Dolaret is to blame for the failures of her pilots, this, too, is disingenuous. Her pilots were inappropriately matched against Rogue Squadron. Captain Convarian always believed the appearance of his vessel would strike terror into the hearts of his enemies. He expected them to panic and run, precisely because they ran the first time he ambushed them. Antilles has not lived this long by repeating mistakes. Convarian should have insisted on having the best pilots possible flying with him. He did not because he assumed their contribution to his victory would be incidental. 
Isard brought her head up. Ah, well, then it seems I am wrong about everything. The rising ironic tone in her voice did nothing to hide her anger. Perhaps you would like to tell me how things are going to go from now on, and what we should do about them. Voru smiled and took a half-step toward Isard as he turned to face her. I would guess, despite the possession of the war cruiser, Antilles and his people will continue their— he glanced at Arisi. As the pilot so colorfully put it, hit and hype raids. In actuality, you've seen those raids are minimally effective. I would imagine they will also try to infiltrate some of the tanker crews so they can hijack more shipments. Our losses, and we will have some, should be minimal. Isard's eyes half closed. Minimal losses to us will still be enough to let them finance their war against us. True, but the fact is that time runs in our favor, not theirs. We have a number of ways to deal with them, but their threat will not be ended until we locate their base and destroy it. Isard pressed two fingers against her lips for a moment. The elimination of their base has always been the way to deal with them. What other plans do you have in mind? Voru smiled hesitantly. The prime method of eliminating their ability to fight against us is for us to open up our storage wells and make an abundance of Bacta available. No! Irisi and Isan looked at each other in surprise as their joint denunciation of that suggestion echoed loudly through the room. Isard shook her head. That would kill the price of Bacta and loosen the dependency of others upon us. Agreed, but we can survive the momentary weakness. Rogue Squadron cannot. The strength of the Bacta price is their strength. Take it away, and they are left penniless. Cod won't speak with them. They will be unable to maintain their spacecraft and will no longer appear to be friends worth protecting. Make Bacta abundant. Offer a reward to bring Antilles and his people in, and hint that Bacta will remain abundant if they are captured or betrayed to you, and Antilles is done. Even as he outlined the plan, Voru knew Isard would reject it. It is the easiest and most bloodless of the plans needed for getting rid of Antilles. She will reject it because it does not satisfy her sense of revenge. She wants him to suffer, not wither. I doubt she recognizes she should reject it because of the backlash she will suffer among the Zukfra people when their standard of living crashes. Isard slowly shook her head. Antilles has defied me directly and has killed one of my destroyers. I want him dead. I want Horn dead and the others but I want them to know I was the hand behind it, not market vagaries. Moreover, relinquished power is power that is not easily recovered. Next. The other plan is the current one, a plan that requires vigilance and patience. We keep seeking information and then pounce when we know where he is. Voru shrugged stiffly. The problem with this plan is that it is frustrating, since we cannot act until we know where he is based. That could take three months, six, a year. Unacceptable. Isard shook her head adamantly. I am not going to sit back and allow Antilles free reign while I just wait. This situation cannot be allowed to mature further. We need action. I want to kill something, and I want to use her pilots to do it. Isard pointed an unwavering finger at Arisi. If your pilots are truly elite, killing something should not be beneath them. Voru felt a cold shiver run down his spine. Helen, it was a disaster, yet she would repeat it. Madam Director, a raid right now would be a waste of people, parts, munitions, and goodwill. But it will show High Admiral Teradoc and that fool Harsk that they should not trifle with me and laugh at me. And what need have I of goodwill? 
Do I not own all the Bacta there is? Others should please me with their actions, not seek to be pleased by me. Voru held his hands up. There is no question you have power others would do well to respect, but attacking another place like Halinit will inspire more fear than you want. Isard gave Voru a predatory smile, all sharp tooth and pitiless. But fear is exactly what I want, Minister Voru. However, I take your point. I will still have my attack, and Commander Dlarit's people will do it, but we'll spare off-worlders for the moment. She blithely turned her attention on Arisi, and the Typhiran woman paled. You will plan a mission that punishes the Ashurn for their boldness in resisting me. Their antics have been hardly damaging, but I want them to know that to defy me is to court death. Find something. A munitions dump, a rebel camp, a sympathetic village, anything. Find it and destroy it. No warning. No mercy. She smiled. No question who the true power here is. 27. Mirax Tarek found herself surprised by the delighted smile on Talon Card's face. A crescent lined with white teeth split his mustache from his goatee and gave him the rakish air of a space pirate. What surprised her was not that Card could smile so handsomely, but that he dared to, given the scowl on her father's face. Card can't be ignorant of my father's temper, so he thinks he's anticipated our trouble. Card, alone in his cabin, waved both of the Tareks to chairs. I'll dispense with greetings because I suspect you doubt my sincerity after what happened at Alderaan. Card came around to the front of his desk, then leaned back on its edge, crossing his long legs. Mirax sat in the chair she'd been offered, but her father remained standing. He rested his hands on the back of his chair, then leaned forward to bring his eyes down to Card's level. Mirax knew the posture well. Her father lowered his head like a thirst-mad bantha preparing to sprint to a watering seep. She'd seen other creatures begin to cringe as Booster did that, but Card did not. Card, I've been over the details again and again. I've checked my people. Booster tapped Mirax's shoulder with his thumb. I've even had her corsex suitor look some material over to check this out. Mirax covered her reaction to her father's statement. Booster had asked her for advice about making a final check on his security records, and she had brought Corrin in on it. Booster had not been pleased when he found out that Corrin's sec had gone over things, but he accepted Corrin's conclusions. Now he makes it sound like he solicited Corrin's advice. We're going to talk about this. Card held a hand up. I know what you're going to say. Yeah? I think so. Card's eyes actually twinkled. You'll tell me that the leak to the imps came from my organization. Booster's head came up. You knew? Not before the fact, no. I had no idea. Afterward, though, it was rather obvious. Card shrugged. Melina Carnus sold you out. Booster straightened up to his full height. Have you killed her yet? No, I didn't want to precipitate action that could not be reversed. Booster chuckled deeply. You are studying her to find her connection to Isard. Actually, I wanted to see how far she had spread Isard's influence in my organization, but yes, I have been watching her. Card folded his arms across his chest. Now that you're here, I thought I would allow you to determine how you want to deal with this situation. Shoving her out into space would probably be the most expedient method of killing her. I heard about a renegade band of Twi'leks who used to run electricity through a vat of Bacta, torturing their victims to the point of death, then turning off the electricity and allowing the Bacta to heal them up. 
Mirak swallowed against the bile rising in her throat. Easier just to let the word get out that Melina was a binary agent. She sold the imp ambush to us just the same way she sold us to Isard. Let the Bacta witch deal with her. Card nodded. I also have a Wookiee in my employ who could... Booster shook his head. No, no Wookiees. Armpits are convenient for lifting corpses and moving them to dump sites. I'll loan you any weapon you want to deal with her. I have things from all over, including a recently acquired Sith Lanvarok that promises to be truly elegant, if I've figured out correctly how it's supposed to work. Card frowned. But you're not left-handed, so that will complicate things. Mirax raised an eyebrow. You really have a Lanvarok? Yes, do you have a buyer? A collector. Good. And he's left-handed. Even better. If you will give me details on the Lanvarok and authenticate its Sith origins... Booster cleared his voice. We have current business to discuss before you get going on this deal. Of course, Booster, of course. Card smiled. We can holograph the Lanvarok in use, and that should help spike the price. Booster shook his head. No. You prefer another method for dealing with traitors? I do. Booster smiled broadly. I want you to keep her alive and working. Card frowned. Why? I have my reasons. Not good enough, Booster. You'll have to do better if you want her to stay alive. She betrayed one of my customers to an enemy, causing harm to my customer, my people, and my reputation. She has to die. Booster's protestations confused Mirax. She looked up at her father. Why do you want her to live? Card's eyes narrowed. I believe, for one thing, your father will suggest that with Karnas still in place, Isard won't try to infiltrate a new spy into my organization. Booster nodded. Better the hut you have tagged than one you don't. Agreed, Booster, but I'm still afraid I can't accommodate you in this. What? Oh, please don't act so incredulous. Card shook his head gravely. I can't have her threatening my customers. It's bad for my reputation and bad for morale and puts me at a serious disadvantage in my business dealings. She's going to die. You gave me a choice of how she dies. Old age is not one of the options I had in mind. Card waved away Booster's comment. No, she has to die. There is no retreating from this point. No? Booster arched an eyebrow over his artificial eye. I have more things to buy. I can always take my business elsewhere. If I had a credit for every time I heard that sort of empty threat, I could buy and sell Typhira and Isard a dozen times over. Card snorted. I believe our old business is concluded. Now about that Lanvarok. Don't be so anxious here, Card. Booster slowly smiled. You've got our munitions business already, though that could change. This is something more. It would have to be special if you expect to buy Molina's life with it. I think it is. I was going to give it to Billy, pitch some work his way for old time's sake. Card nodded. Dravis, the new guy working for him, is good. So I've heard, but you're better. Card smiled. So I've heard. Anyway, Booster growled, I want a gravity weld projector. Mirax covered a smile as Card coughed and regarded her father with disbelief. So you can be surprised, Card. Not easily, but possibly. A gravity well projector? Card shook his head. Billy can't get it for you. Booster nodded. It's impossible to get one, I know. 
but I could use it, and so I thought I'd start asking. If you can't do it... Reverse thrust there, Booster. I just said Billy couldn't get it. You can? Card lifted his chin. Easily. Sure, that's the deepest bucket of Sith spit I've ever heard being sloshed about. I can and I will, and it will cost you. Card's eyes narrowed. But giving me that purchase order doesn't get you Molina Carnus's life. Booster smiled. Does it give me six months of her life? Card closed his eyes for a moment. Two months, but she'll be isolated from most of my operations. I see. I also need parts for a squadron of TIE fighters. I want some Y-wing ion cannons and circuitry refit kits that will allow me to put the cannons in the starfighters. That's custom work. It'll be expensive. Card looked at the fingernails on his right hand. And it will get you another month of Molina's life. Booster leaned forward, his fingertips digging into the plush cushioning of the chair's back. Take it out of the money you'll make selling our back to halls. Card laughed as he shook his head. You're selling me bantha hides before you've killed the bantha booster. I'd ask you to trust me on this one, Card, but I know that would take more credits than buying Carnus's continued survival. Booster frowned. We have ops planned that will pull in Bacta. Locate the items and wait for us to deliver before you order them. We'll sell the Bacta to you at 70% of the galactic average price. 50%, and you leave the Coruscant market open to me. The chair's nerf hide covering squeaked as Booster's grip tightened. The Bacta we deliver there is being used to fight the Kratos virus. That's pure charity and a stopgap that's preventing the spread of the virus off Coruscant. It's not a profit center. Card's face hardened. Every place is a profit center, Booster. You know that. He raised a hand to stop Booster's growl from growing into an argument. I'll donate freely 70% of the allocation you'd have delivered to the world, but the other 30% I'll use to feed the black market demand. You have to know that you're already losing nearly 40% to the black market now, after delivery, so I'll get more where you wanted to go. And that gives me a stay of execution on Molina Carnus? Card nodded. Her life is in your hands. Booster glanced down at the deck, then slowly nodded. You're a bastard, Card. Quite possibly, but you know you'd have let me keep 35% of the Bacta to sell on Coruscant if I'd pressed you for it. Booster's head came up. Perceptive, too. Thank you. Mirax, who slowly shook off the shock the frank bargaining had sparked in her, frowned. Why didn't you push for as much as you could get? Card hesitated, and Mirax could see his decision to answer her question was a struggle for him. He plays things so close to his vest that he's reluctant to let someone else see how he works. Some of the amusement drained from Card's face. I'm going to turn the Coruscant black market work over to Billy. I don't think he and Dravis could handle 35% of the supply you'll bring me. No reason I should give them enough of a supply to allow the bottom to drop out of that market. 30% is enough to suit me and them. Booster smiled and gave Card a nod. Keep it up, and I'll take back the bastard remark. What, and make me earn it some other way? Good point. I want to still work with Karnas to set up our rendezvous, but we're going to plan them in a way that will prevent Isard from ambushing us again. I'll give her a circuit of worlds to travel on. When your ships come into a system, they'll be told to proceed with the journey or they'll be met by our people and the exchange will take place. 
Isard can't cover all those locations and her back to convoys. Taloncard smiled. A rendezvous circuit. I like it. You know where you'll meet them, and if the system looks wrong, you know where they will go next, so you let them go. Very good. I think it will work. It will keep Karnas busy and frustrate Isard. So you have a use for Karnas in the future? Perhaps. Booster smiled. How soon can you get me that gravity well projector? A month, maybe two. Good. Booster extended his hand toward Card. I can't say it was a pleasure doing business with you, but I've spent more time doing less with fewer results in the past. Card shook Booster's hand. It's a good thing you're retired, Booster. I wouldn't like having to split the galaxy between us. Uh, please don't leave quite yet. I'd offer you my hospitality. Booster smiled. And you want to talk to Mirax about the Landbarok. Indeed, Card laughed. It's a very good thing you're retired. 28. Ayala drew her knees up to her chest and settled her arms around them, then sighed. Derek would have found this place fascinating. Softly muted moonlight glowed green through the room's skylight. It managed to make the spare room seem warmer and more inviting, despite the lack of amenities. Human amenities, she corrected herself. To the Vratics, this would be next to luxury. The Vratics, who still lived in harvester tribes, were scattered over the face of Typhira, living in villages much akin to the one in which Ayala and the Ashurn rebels had sought refuge. The buildings themselves were created out of an air-dried mud and saliva mixture that the Vratics slathered on a twig and branch lattice. While not as strong or durable as ferrocrete, the towers and tunnel houses, if unmaintained, could still last as long as five years. In the past, before the Vratics became civilized, the elemental dissolution of their dwellings would force a migration to a new area, carefully allowing their previous territory to recover from their habitation. Likewise, in the past, the Vratics themselves had provided the saliva and had done the mixing to prepare the mud. Now they used a domesticated branch of a similar species, the Nitix, to create the mud for Vratix masons. The Nitix, which resembled the Vratix, though smaller, blockier, and less elegant in form, were kept as pets, as work animals, and, Ayala had heard, as food for special occasions. When she had said she could never eat a pet, a Vratix had explained that pets were offered as a gift to those the family wished to honor. It became apparent that the level of their sacrifice showed the depth of their respect for the individual to whom the offer was made. That certainly made the practice more understandable, but she still couldn't imagine eating a creature a young Vratix once called Fluffy or its Vratix equivalent. Though eating Nitix could easily have been seen as a primitive practice by a barbaric society, the Vratix clearly were anything but. The Vratix village consisted of several towers that rose up in the middle reaches of the glone trees. Concentric circular terraces with little walls at the lip gave each tower the look of a stepped pyramid, though the rounded foundation made it more elegant. Huge arching bridges connected one tower to another and were all but hidden by the thick forest foliage. Vratik's artistry was not limited to the architecture. The green skylight had been made by a Vratik's artisan who chewed various rainforest leaves into paste, then fashioned it into a film thin enough to allow light to pass through. It appeared delicate in the extreme, yet was strong enough to ward off rain and survive other climatic conditions. The stems and veins of the leaves formed a complex and chaotic network that looked visually attractive, but Ayala knew that was not its primary purpose. Because both light and sound took time to travel to the eye and ear, respectively, 
The Vratics considered them secondary and deceptive senses. What one saw or heard was always something that had happened in the past, but what one could feel with the sense of touch, that was immediate and present in real time. Reaching out, she let her fingers play across the inside of the circular skylight. Her gentle touch conveyed a legion of different textures, some soft, some smooth, and others rough or sharp. She likened the progression to that of the music in a symphony, except that in choosing which way to stroke the surface, she could determine what she felt and in what order. If I were worried, soft and smooth would soothe me, whereas if I were manic, sharp might caution me. Similarly, a whole variety of textures had been worked by the mason who had created the room she had been given. The walls had gentle ridges that swelled like waves on an ocean. They swirled into spirals and opened on smooth voids that encouraged placid tranquility. The raised platform on which she slept had been cupped like a crater to hold her in, yet the sides and walls nearby were sleek and almost slippery to the touch. Near the door hole, raised bumps warned of potential harm and the need for caution. They've thought of everything. Not quite. A hand reached up and grabbed the sill at the bottom of the door, then the tendons and muscles tensed in the arm attached to it, and Elskull pulled herself into view. The Vratics were nice enough to give us some footholds for climbing up here, but I'd still prefer a rope ladder. Ayala laughed and helped pull the smaller woman into the room. Because the Vratics' hind legs were so powerful, Leaping up to the door holes of rooms set well above the ground was simple. The need for stairs never developed, so Vratic's architecture never included them. Visiting humans were normally housed in public areas, but advertising the presence of Asheran agents was not a good idea, so they were secreted away in rooms that were difficult for humans to move into and out of. Sixtus isn't with you? No, he's out wandering through the rainforest. Elskull shrugged and adjusted the blaster on her right hip. I've known him for years now, and there are just times he has to drift away. I suspect the imps did some nasty stuff to him and his people when they'd trained him to be special ops, and occasionally he has to fight it. Never had anyone exactly like him in Corsac, but I understand the need to get away. What's going on? Change of plans? Elskull shook her head. Nope, we leave here after dark, as planned, and move to the next haven. Just seeing us here seems to be good for Vratic's morale. I don't really have any sense of how good the Vratics will be in combat, but they're fighters at heart. You mean at Pulmonary Arch? It doesn't have the same ring to it, does it? Ayala shook her head. No, not really. Elskull smiled and seated herself on the foot of Ayala's bed. Well, doesn't matter. Armed with fibroblades, force pikes, or blasters, we can get enough radix that we can overwhelm humans in Zutra City. Some of the Ashern indicate their training cadres are swelling in our wake. We come through, they get more volunteers. Sixtus has specified benchmarks for training, and it looks like we'll have our force in a couple of months. I'd feel better about them if we ever got to see their warriors in action. Elskull nodded. Agreed. From what Sixtus has said, though, because Bacta and healing is so much a part of Vratic's society, for a Vratix to become a warrior and cause harm is a very solemn decision. The Ashern, as you know, sharpen their forearm claws and paint themselves black. The former is for fighting, but they paint themselves black so they can remain in the shadows, hidden away to protect the other Vratics from what they can and will do to win freedom. Well, their reluctance to be violent explains why they haven't just risen up and slaughtered all the humans on the planet. Ayala sighed. It's too bad they have to resort to war to win the freedom they never should have lost in the first place. I hope we can remain free long enough for the Ashern to be ready to fight. How long do you figure we have until Isard storms us? 
Good question. Me, I'd have done it in a heartbeat before we embarrassed General Delarit. But she's trying to keep the populace happy. If the Zukra folks see white armor in bulk on their world, they're going to figure she's got no more use for them, and I suspect they can cause a fair amount of trouble for her. Elskal sat back, leaning against the wall. Of course, Isart has more trouble than just us. That's what I came to tell you. News from the front. Yeah? Yeah, and good news, too. Ayala dropped to the circular chamber's floor and sat cross-legged. Twisting her blaster belt around so she was more comfortable, she smiled up at Elskal. What did you hear? The corruptor is no more. Ayala's jaw dropped. What? How? Isar tried to ambush Wedge and the others. Apparently, Wedge had a surprise waiting for them. A steady diet of proton torpedoes put the corruptor down. No word of squadron losses, at least none that are reliable. Data came from a tap on Zukfra Corp News, so it all has an imp spin. Still, if they're saying the corruptor was destroyed, that means its loss was the least of the problems Isard has. Ayala clapped her hands. Maybe this mission isn't going to be suicidal. Elskal's face closed down. We're a long way from getting out, Ayala, but getting shot up isn't going to get you and your husband reunited. What? Ayala tried to cover her surprise at Elskol's comment, because when she heard the words, she knew part of her had been considering the mission in exactly that light. I never... Elskol leaned forward and rested her elbows on her knees. Hey, do I look like some zook for a clerk who's going to believe everything you say? No, I've been where you are. I lost my husband to the imps back on Silpar, and part of me wanted to die with him there. I took off after the imps for revenge, but always in the back of my mind was the feeling that when I died, we'd be together again. Wedge saw that in me, and saw the urge for self-destruction grow in me. When he kicked me out of Rogue Squadron, well, that woke me up, and I began to see a lot of things. Ayala's head came up. Are you saying there's no life after death? I'm saying it doesn't matter. Elskal held her two hands out, palms toward the ceiling. On one hand, if there isn't an afterlife, you'll be remembered for the things you did while you were alive. On the other, if there is an afterlife, You'll be able to share all you did with those who died before you. Either way, living as long as possible and doing the most you can is the only way to go. I decided I didn't want to be known here or in the afterlife for having quit. I don't think you do either. Ayala frowned. You're right, but sometimes the pain... She clutched her hands against her breastbone. Sometimes it hurts too much to live. Nonsense. Elskol's dark eyes sharpened. Pain's the only way we know we're alive. What? If the afterlife is supposed to be special and wonderful and blissful, and there aren't many theologies that suggest otherwise, then it follows that pain's the only way you know you're alive. Not letting the pain get to you. Not surrendering to it. That's the way you continue living. Elskal brought her hands together, then glanced down at the floor. It still hurts me, too, at certain times of the year, but I don't let it overwhelm me. I haven't let it overwhelm me, either. No, you haven't. You're strong, Ayala, real strong. Elskal gave her a half grin. It's just that as things get going tougher... In the moments when stress is off, you'll start to feel the pain. Fight it. Ayala slowly nodded. What Elskal had said made perfect sense to her. While involved in an operation, the stresses of the operation would push everything else into the background. When the stress slackened, she tried to recover a sense of well-being and would invariably hearken back to her time with Dirik. The joy would melt into melancholy, 
then that would congeal into sorrow and pain. I'd come to a point where surrendering to the pain would be more simple than fighting the imps and everything else. She realized that she'd not faced this problem before because when Derek had been taken by the imps, there was always a chance that he would be released and they would be able to continue their lives together. Hope had shielded her against despair and the pain of her loss. Circumstances are different now, but I'm also a different person than I was. I will survive and fight the pain. She looked up and was about to tell Elskull the same thing when a howling shriek filled the air and sent a tremor through her tower room. No mistaking that for anything else. TIE fighters are coming in. She dove for the door hole and, lying there on her belly, stared out at the Vratix village. Other brown-gray towers were all but invisible in the thick foliage of the rainforest until green laser bolts illuminated them and began setting trees on fire. The bolts hissed through the air, igniting a rain of flaming branches and leaves falling on buildings and the forest floor. Elskull hunkered down beside her with blaster in hand as the ties made another pass. Trees split as if they had been struck by lightning. Their bowls exploded, spraying the rainforest with fiery hardwood splinters. Impaled Vratix and Nitix twitched on the ground or limped along, black blood streaming from their wounds. In other spots, heavy bits of trees fell, crushing Vratix and pulverizing the walls of houses. Sith spawn. Elskull bounced a fist off the door. We've got nothing that can stop them. They're just slaughtering Vratix for the fun of it. It's not fun for the Vratix. Ayala watched as the Vratix began to flee. The whole tableau took on an unreal air. Part of it came from the Vratix leaping high into the branches of trees surrounding the village to escape. If Ayala had allowed herself to forget how sophisticated the Vratix could be and just see them as insects, then she was watching a whole swarm of Corellian glutton bugs clear chew a forest. They moved in a mass, leaping away as bolts rained down on them, exploding and pitching body parts in every direction. The most surreal element in the whole scene was the lack of wailing from the victims, the Vratix vocalized no sounds as they fled. They grasped each other and remained close, clearly taking security in the sense they trusted the most. But that's what's getting them killed. Massed together like this makes them terribly vulnerable to the strafing runs. Elskull, we have to do something. What? These blasters aren't going to bring down a starfighter, even if they don't have shields. Elskull coughed as the breeze wafted smoke toward them. The only thing we can do is try to get out of here. Agreed. Ayala looked out again, bracing to duck away from more aerial fire, but as the echoes of the last Ty's shriek died, no new one rose to take its place. Instead, the whine of blaster fire started at the north end of the village, she looked in that direction and saw figures in white moving into the burning village. Stormies! Elskull laughed and checked the power pack on her pistol. Not hardly. Look at the armor and how they wear it. Most of them are too small for it. They're home defense troops all dressed up for this operation. How can you be so sure? Do you think real Stormies would raid a jungle village wearing white? Ayala hesitated. But on Endor, in the forest there, reports I heard, trust me, Ayala, they learned from that mistake. Getting drubbed by a Wookiee and a bunch of Ewoks convinced them to institute some reforms. Elskull pulled herself into the door hole and leaped out. Come on. Ayala followed, making the three-meter drop without injury. Running forward, she caught up with Elskull at the wall that edged the rooftop where they stood. As Elskull swung her legs over the top of the wall, Ayala raised her blaster pistol and sighted in on one of the advancing troopers. Elskull gently slapped her thigh. Save it. You'll never hit from here too far. 
Ayala glanced down and grimly closed one eye. Too far for you, maybe. Her head came up and she sighted in on a group of three troopers. She centered the gun on the middle one, fired, then snapped a shot off at the other two. The first shot hit the target square on the left breast, then glanced up off the armor and burned through his throat. The second shot pierced the left eyepiece on the second trooper, spinning him around like a top before he went down. The last shot missed its intended target, passing over the trooper's head by a couple of centimeters, but only did so because the first trooper's body had knocked him off balance and he was falling. Elskull looked up with wide-eyed amazement at her. A headshot at this range? Ayala shrugged, then tapped the rear sight. Shoots high. She sat on the edge of the wall, then leaped down to the next level and remained crouched at the foot of the wall. Elskull landed beside her. A few red blaster bolts bloodied the smoke in their direction, but none came even close to getting them. They don't know where we are or where those shots came from. And because they aren't Vradix, they'll have a hard time jumping up here to find us. Elskull smiled and crept forward toward the edge of the terrace wall. I can hit from this range. Ayala came forward carefully, ducking as a fleeing Vratix leaped past. At the edge of the terrace, she saw the troopers moving into the village, shooting into the door holes on the ground level. Scarlet backlighting sometimes silhouetted a Vratix form. More often than not, it seemed as if the blaster fire started the tower's lower rooms burning. There is no searching. This is just a mission to destroy this place. Angered beyond the point of caring about anything, Ayala rose from her crouch and began shooting at targets. Elskull rose up beside her, laying down a pattern of fire that sent the troopers scurrying for cover. Ayala looked over at her, and they both knew seasoned troops... Real stormtroopers never would have shied from blaster pistol fire. A few of the troopers were down and still, and yet more thrashed in pain on the ground. Ayala wanted to feel compassion for them, but their cries for help were her greatest ally. If the wounded infect the rest with the desire to avoid death, they'll break and run. At the same time, she acknowledged that the troopers running was her only chance at survival. Ayala ducked down as scattered return fire headed in her direction. She popped a fresh power pack into her blaster pistol and pressed her back against the wall. Though the wall itself was smooth, Ayala felt anything but placid at the moment. Well, we've gotten their attention so the Vratics can flee. Elskull ducked back behind the edge of the wall. You realize it's just a matter of time before they call for one of the starfighters to come back, don't you? Ayala slid further along the wall, then nodded. I guess we finish them quickly, then. Elskull raised an eyebrow. Your suggestion for Dlarit made me think you might not have the stomach for this kind of fight. I'm glad to be wrong. Ayala came up and triggered off two more shots before the troopers shifted their aim to shoot back at her. She dropped back down, uncertain if she'd hit anything, and disturbed by what she saw. Bad news, they've got a squad moving into flank us. The smaller woman shrugged as if Ayala had reported she felt a light drizzle starting to fall. Elskall checked her power pack and smiled in the near silence that reigned in the village. We can give up, or we can fight our way through them. I don't see surrender as an option. Nor me. Elskall tucked a lock of brown hair behind her left ear. On three, we're over the wall to the last terrace. We go forward, take some shots, then over again and at them. Frontal assault? Ayala shook her head. I may be dead and not know it, but I'm not crazy. They're scared. We sprint to their line of cover, then we start vaping them close in. Corsac had to train you for that sort of fight. And I've gotten used to it, too. Ayala thought for a moment. From the base of the wall to the trees and rubble the troopers were using was only twenty-five meters. Shooting like mad to make them keep their heads down, it might just work. I'm game. Let's do it. Elskull rose into a crouch. One, two, three. 
With her left hand on top of the terrace wall, Ayala came up and over, then dropped the eight feet to the next terrace. She hit, rolled, and sprinted to the next edge. She vaulted it in tandem with Elskal and landed solidly. She shoved off the wall with her right hand, then brought the blaster around to spray shots at the troopers crouching 25 meters away. Her hastily snapped shots didn't hit any of them, but they dove for the ground as if she were a star destroyer commencing a planetary bombardment. As she raced forward, cutting right and left, she waited for a target to show himself so she could drop him with a clean shot to the head or belly. Belly would be better. He'll scream. She waited for the screams, waited to hear the troopers she was approaching start to scream in terror. She started to scream herself, hoping to spark her foes into panic. Suddenly, one of the troopers did stand. She brought her pistol around, but he leveled his blaster carbine at her and triggered a burst before she could shoot him. She saw a trio of sizzling scarlet energy darts fly at her and for a second considered it nothing short of miraculous that they had missed. Then she felt the tug on her left thigh. Her world whirled, and her chin dug into the moist loam at the base of a glone tree. She snorted dirt from her nostrils and wondered what had happened. Then the first wave of pain hit her. Ayala rolled onto her back and glanced down at her left thigh, crusted black flesh surrounding a hole oozing blood. Biting back a scream, she unbuckled her blaster belt and pulled it off. She pressed the holster against the wound, then wrapped the belt around her leg and refastened it. Pulling it tight almost made her faint, but she struggled against the darkness nibbling at the edges of her sight. She didn't think she'd blacked out, but as the world lightened again, she found herself looking up at a trooper standing over her. He was saying something, but she couldn't focus on the words. All she could notice was that the armor seemed overlarge on him, with the breastplate covering half his stomach and the helmet resting firmly on the armor's collar. The trooper gestured with his blaster carbine, but Ayala still wasn't able to understand him. She tried, but an odd whirring sound eclipsed his words. An angular shadow dropped down behind him. Ayala heard a horrid snapping and crunching as the trooper began to telescope down toward the ground. He twisted around, his legs going limp, allowing Ayala to see the ragged parallel wounds slashed down through the back of his armor. Standing behind him, with claws dripping blood, a black Vratix warrior drew his arms in toward his thorax. His head bobbed once, then his powerful hind legs straightened, propelling him up and out of her sight. If not for the ravaged corpse of the soldier at her feet, she would have had no proof of his intervention. Her mouth hung open as she looked at the trooper's body. Those claws sliced through that armor with the ease of a wampa filleting a tauntaun. No way all the bacta on this world could close those wounds. She leaned back against the trunk of the glone tree, somehow finding comfort in the roughness of its bark. She heard screams that sounded far distant, more whirring, and other crisper sounds she never wanted to identify. Ayala! She looked up. Sixtus, have you found Elskull? The large man nodded, then bent and scooped her up in his arms. She twisted her ankle and got pinned down. How are you? Hurt, but I should live. Good, I'll get you clear. Ayala tried to point back toward the troopers. But they're out there, another group flanking us. Sixtus shook his head. The Black Claws got them all. It won't make up for the Vratics dead here, but it should start making the Zookfrans scared. His eyes narrowed. When they find their people dead, they'll have a hard time sleeping. Ayala winced against the pain. Wait. No, the Ashern have a base camp with some makeshift Bacta tanks. No, not that. She shook her head to clear it. Look, don't leave the bodies here. Take them away, far away. Just have the troopers disappear. Not knowing will be worse than knowing. Take our bodies, too. Hide them. Don't let Isard know how badly we were hurt. Sixtus smiled. That's odd. 
What? Your lips are moving, but I'm hearing the kind of things El Skull would say. He stepped over a thick, glown branch and continued down a narrow jungle trail. I'd not have thought you capable of thinking that kind of thing. One thing I know, Sixtus, is that a high body count doesn't mean victory. It just means a lot of folks died. Ayala tipped her head back toward the village. A lot of people died there, but not knowing the true story will give our enemies something to think about. If they decide they don't want to fight because of it, we win. 29. Captain Sayer Yonka of the Imperial Star Destroyer Avarice looked back and forth between the two suits of clothes the Silver Protocol droid held up for him. To the right, he had a conservative black suit cut along vaguely military lines. He knew it would make him look powerful and might even inspire fear in some people. That is not always a bad thing, he reflected, but not wholly appropriate in this instance. The other suit was completely civilian, and he would have chosen it in a heartbeat except that it was a bright crimson. Just what Isard wears. Despite the fanciful styling, including the fringes at the hem of the jacket and along the sleeves, the bloody color and memory of Isard robbed the suit of its playfulness. That suit, because it was flashier than the black, would be more noticed, but people might miss him altogether, remembering only the clothes. This is not a bad thing either, and desirable right now. He shook his head. Let me think about it some more, Poe. He waved the droid away, but not before he caught a distorted mirror view of himself on its breast. Tall and slender, his black hair and bright blue eyes combined with strongly chiseled features to win the admiration of many women and the jealousy of their men. The touch of white creeping in at his temples had prompted him to grow a black goatee something that was strictly against imperial regulations, but not being in the imperial service anymore, he had no fear of flouting those regulations. While the warped reflection did not describe his outsides, it certainly did match how he felt inside. Yonka turned and walked out onto the balcony of his 26th floor suite at Margath's. Strains of music drifted down from the 27th Hour Club, but it washed over him without effect. Even the sight of three moons hovering above the placid ocean, two ivory and one blood red, failed to register as anything more than yet another planetary night sky. Leaning on the balcony rail, Ser Yanka slowly shook his head. He had the distinct feeling he was in the wrong place at the wrong time, but that oppressive sensation was one he'd lived with for longer than he could remember. While the Emperor was alive, he was able to hide within the protective shell of the government's legitimacy. I knew what I was doing was right in someone's eyes. Patrolling the Rim, keeping pirates away from raiding worlds like Elishandru Pika here, that was a mission no one could deny was necessary. That rebels were often classified as pirates and dealt with harshly meant nothing. It was fairly common among pirates to call themselves rebels to justify their predation on imperial outposts. Since the Emperor's death, he had clung to his role as a defender of the Empire to justify what he had been called upon to do. He added to that a very real desire to see to it that his people were not ordered into some futile fray at the whim of some self-appointed warlord. Zinj had tried to recruit him, but Yonka had steadfastly refused to take any orders except those coming from Coruscant. He bound himself to Isan Isard because she seemed the best bet for dealing with the rebels. Her focus on destroying them then re-establishing the Empire seemed to make the most sense to me. Then she went and lost Coruscant. Yonka bounced a fist off the railing. He'd followed her orders and helped her establish her presence on Typhira, but that was before he heard about the Kratos virus. 
He appreciated her sense of pragmatism in dealing with the rebels, but the virus targeted all sorts of folks who never so much as raised their voices in support of the rebels. Her use of the virus meant she was capable of anything, and that scared Saryanka. The fear did not surprise him as much as the depth of it did. He knew she had operatives in his crew and had no doubt they'd strike at him were she to give the appropriate orders. Defying her was something that would have to be done, he knew that. But not yet. Escorting convoys is nothing new to me or the avarice. Perhaps if we're given a mission like the destruction of Halinit, I will balk. Until then, the confrontation has no merit. He sighed. He had Isard on one hand, and Antilles' as rogues on the other. An Imperial Star Destroyer Mark II, like the Avarice, had little to fear from a squadron of snub fighters. He acknowledged that their use of proton torpedoes could, in fact, hurt his ship, but his own pilots were very good, and his turbo-laser crews repeatedly drilled in anti-ship and anti-torpedo fire missions. He had no doubt his ship could hurt the rogues, but he suddenly realized he wasn't certain how much he wanted to hurt them. They have no choice but to see me as a threat, as the most significant threat Isard has for them. He'd read the performance reports from the virulence ever since Lakwi Varsha had taken over as captain. They were not impressive in the least. The virulence's fighters scrambled slowly against rogue threats and had never even come close to downing any of the rogues. While his ship had yet to kill any of them either, they did drive them off faster, preventing them from getting off second and even third proton torpedo volleys against the convoys. He shook his head again and forced thoughts of the rogues and Isan Isard from his mind. The avarice orbited through the night sky above, forming a dart-shaped silhouette as it passed before the bloody moon. It's up there, as are all my worries, while I am down here. I came here to relax, so I shall do so, though not so many others would find this situation relaxing. Elishandru Pika's imperial moth, Reet Jandi, had married a woman nearly forty years his junior. Yanka had known Ayelin Jandi years before on Kalmanor. They had grown up together and had slowly begun to realize their attraction to each other when he won an appointment to the Imperial Naval Academy. He lost track of her until, much later, he had come down to pay his respects to the Moth after rooting out a band of pirates that infested the system's asteroid belt. Once he and Ayelin laid eyes on each other, their feelings were rekindled, and for the past five years they'd carried on a secret affair. Kina Margath, owner of the hotel in which Yonka was staying, had befriended Ayelin Jandi and agreed to help her conceal her affair from the moth. Rumors were spread that Yonka came to Margath's to romance Kina. Ayelin used her influence with the moth to get favorable treatment for Kina's casino and hotel operations, and Yanka always managed to haul a goodly supply of exotic liqueurs and beverages from the worlds he patrolled to Alessandro Pika, enabling the 27th Hour Club to meet its boast of being able to supply any drink a patron could name. Yanka turned away from the railing and, looking back through transperisteel viewports, watched the droid brush specks of lint from the two suits he had been shown. A choice based on my mood is not the way to go. I should dress to make an impression. I, Ellen, will like either suit, but I won't be wearing clothes very long in her presence, so her tastes do not matter. He slowly smiled. What others think is important. Her husband, for example. What would he like to see me wearing? Poe? The droid turned to face him. Sir? Please arrange for the repulsor Libo to be ready in an hour. It'll take that long for me to refresh myself and dress. The droid nodded as best he could. You have made a decision on what to wear, sir? 
Yonka laughed and strode back into the suite. Po, oh, I have indeed. This affair is not without danger. The wrath of a moth is not often survivable. He stroked his goatee with his right hand. If one is going to dress for death, can blood red ever be a wrong choice? Because of his position half a kilometer due east of the planetary moth's oceanside cottage, Corin saw the repulsor lift limousine approaching first. The driver had it speeding along, which would have made it a difficult target for a blaster rifle shot, but he wasn't side-slipping or changing height to make such a shot impossible. No fear of ambush, which is good. Corin turned on the comlink clipped to his helmet and tapped it twice with a gloved finger. A single click came back, confirming Wedge's reception of Corin's warning about the limo's approach. Corin watched for any more vehicles following. Their briefing suggested Yonka wouldn't be bringing his own security detail and that the moth's wife regularly eluded hers, but the chance that her husband had others watching her or Yonka had to be covered. He waited for one minute, then slowly started working his way back to the rendezvous point. Like the other rogues on the mission, save Ural and the other gand accompanying them, he wore some of the stormtrooper armor they'd gotten from Huff Darklighter. The dark blue color Darklighter had stained it so it matched his personal security forces' uniforms blended perfectly into the night. He carried a blaster carbine, wore a blaster pistol on his right hip, and had spare power packs for both on his belt. He clipped his lightsaber to the back of his belt so it dangled down like a stubby tail, out of the way but accessible if he needed it. Of course, on this mission, if I need it, we're in deep hut drool. In theory, it was a quick hit and run. Though Yonka didn't know it, Kina Margath had long been a rebel agent on El Chandru Pika. Poe, the droid serving as Yonka's valet, had once been part of Rogue Squadron's staff. Once Wedge put out feelers to learn more about the soldiers and Isard's employ, a complete rundown on Yonka's affairs came back, providing the basic information for the mission. If any more than one or two shots get triggered, we've done something very wrong. So far it had gone completely as expected, and Corin didn't like that. On such missions, the same sort he'd performed dozens of times when with the Corellian security force, nothing ever seemed to go as planned. In going after Yonka, the most likely glitch would arrive in the form of the Moth's own squad of stormtroopers, and that was a serious complication. Exfiltration under fire is not going to be fun. Even though he knew that outcome was a distinct possibility, Corin didn't have a bad feeling about the mission. Prior to his learning he was the grandson of a Jedi Master, he would have put the lack of dread down to his rather foolish and rash belief in good luck. He'd always trusted his feelings about things, but he'd never questioned the mechanism that generated those feelings. To him, they just existed, and he had learned to abide by them or deal with the consequences. Now he knew that his feelings were really based on sensations he was getting of and through the Force. Before they were intangible, and even though he gave them weight, others did not. Now, because of Luke Skywalker, the Force had gained credence. Others would accept what he felt as if it were a true measure of what was happening. That frightened Corin, especially after the disaster on Typhira. I don't know enough about the Force and what it means to rely on it. I certainly can't let others use what I feel as a crutch. If I'm wrong, they'll pay for my mistake. I won't have that happen. He reached the rendezvous point in a little ravine slightly northeast of the cottage. Corin crouched between Ural and Rizzati, across the way from Gavin, Wedge, and the tall gand named Vir Wiamdi. The other two members of the team waited in Picaville's spaceport with two X-wings, 
ready to cover their escape if things got messy. Broar Jace and Ineri Forge will be able to down anything the moth can put in the air, but if we need them, I'm sure the Avarice will scramble fighters, and then we're stuck. Wedge looked up at Corrin and nodded. He tapped Corrin and Rizadi on the knee, then pointed off toward the right. Ural and Veer were directed left, leaving Wedge and Gavin to go straight in at the open garden doors and into the back of the cottage. Wedge tapped his chronometer, then held up two fingers. Two minutes to get into position, then we go. Corin nodded and followed Rizzotti. He still felt good about the mission. Let's hope that holds true. Let's hope the only surprise is that which appears on Yonka's face. Ser Yonka let himself into the cottage and nearly dropped the magnum of Mandalorian Narcoleth he'd brought to share with Ayelin. The door clicked shut behind him, muffling the sound of the repulsor limo's departure. Not that he could have heard it past the thunder of his heartbeat in his ears. He had enough presence of mind to prevent his jaw from dropping open, and instead crafted a smile that flashed white teeth at her. Though neither as tall or slender as he was, Ayelin shared with him black hair. She wore hers long so it descended well past her shoulders and lay gently along the swelling of her breasts. The gown she wore had been woven of a wispy fiber that had been dyed a midnight blue. It covered her from thin shoulder straps down to her ankles and glowed electrically where the light hit it yet proved sheer enough to tantalize him with visions of what it sheathed. Her blue eyes sparkled with mischief, promising much and summoning most pleasurable memories to his consciousness. The slight breeze from the garden brought the scent of flowers to his nose and teased playfully with the skirts of her gown. Her glance darted toward the open doors and the darkness beyond. Yonka fondly recalled having made love with her in the garden, beneath the canopy of stars and the trio of El Shandru Pika's moons. His smile broadening, he set the narcoleth on the side table next to the door and extended his hand toward her. For a half second, primarily because the dark blue of the armor matched perfectly the color of Ayelin's gown, the two blaster-toting figures entering through the garden doorway seemed appropriate. Only when Ayelin opened her mouth to scream and the second figure shot her did he realize they were not part of any surprise Ayelin had cooked up for him. Even so, the blue hue of the stun shot that hit her still seemed somehow in keeping with the theme of the evening. Yonka raised his hands. He heard the comlink clip to the leader's faceplate buzz but he could make out none of the words. The man nodded, then reached up and removed his helmet. Despite the sweat pasting brown locks to the intruder's forehead and the edges of his face, Yonka immediately recognized the man. It can't be. Yonka felt his chest tighten, yet fought to keep his voice even. You needn't have had her shot, Antilles. Wouldn't do to have witnesses, would it? Wedge nodded toward her without letting his blaster waver from Yonka's direction. We could have killed her, but unnecessary bloodshed is not something we revel in. In fact, we don't like it at all. Eliminate me and you assume my ship won't function at all well. Yonka found himself flattered but he was too much of a realist to allow vanity to lift his spirits. One man does not mean much on a starship. Wedge smiled. You underestimate your worth, Captain Yonka. Like it or not, as you go, so goes the avarice. Killing me will only have a minor effect on the avarice. I agree, Captain Yonka. Yet you have come to kill me. Kill you? Wedge shook his head. I've come to offer you a deal. Yonka blinked in amazement. Deal? What kind of deal? Antilles positively beamed. 
a deal that starts with making you a very rich man. 30. Fleary Voru strode slowly down the ramp from the belly of his Lambda-class shuttle, then stopped midway as he saw Arisi Dlarid waiting for him at the edge of the landing pad. She wore a smile that seemed inviting, though her blue eyes seemed focused distantly, well beyond him. He found both her smile and presence pleasing, but his natural wariness prevented him from drawing any true enjoyment from either. He nodded in her direction and began walking again, this time not fighting gravity but allowing it to make his step more brisk and lively. Commander Delara, it's so nice of you to greet me. Erisi easily returned his nod. My pleasure, Minister Voru. Voru matched her smile. Did I detect a hint of wistfulness in your expression as you waited here? The hint of a frown threw a twitch through her brows. Then she shook her head. No, no, I just thought it rather ironic that a man as dangerous as yourself should be content with piloting so docile and meek a ship. Meek? I would have seen you flying an interceptor, certainly, or a gunship, not a Lambda-class shuttle. Voru nodded. Ah, I'm afraid, though, this is anything but a normal shuttle. I've made a number of modifications that make this ship far more lethal than it appears to be. I see. I should have expected such clever deception from someone as intelligent as you. You refer to me as clever and intelligent. He shook his head. I fear you've found my weakness, Arisi. Flattery will win you much. How much to make you willing to act as a shield for me during another tantrum thrown by she who cannot be defied? Voru smiled up at her, then offered her his arm. Even you, most beautiful Arisi, could not flatter me that much. You were summoned, too? Yes. Eurisi's voice sank into a harsh growl. The convoy that the Avarice had been escorting appeared back in system, though three tankers were missing. Voru nodded as they walked through the tall gray corridors. Isard's vehement demand that he return to the capital immediately had not been accompanied by any explanation but more interference by rogue squadrons seemed to be the only thing that could make Isard so angry. What was Captain Yonka's explanation of their loss? I don't believe he offered any. Arisi shook her head. As nearly as I can determine, the Avarice did not return with the convoy. Voru shivered, and the hair at the back of his neck began to rise. Could Antilles have gotten the Avarice? He does have the Alderanian war cruiser. I don't believe he could have, even with the war cruiser. There have been no reports I know of that indicate any battle took place out there. You, Minister, would have better sources in that regard than I. Call me Fleary, Arisi. Compatriots and Icehearts' rage should not use titles between them. Voru punched a turbo lift button and stepped into the box when the doors opened. As nearly as I know, all things have gone perfectly with the avarice. Captain Yonka made his rounds, visited his mistress on El Shandru Pika. He's seeing the moth's wife, though the moth believes he's bedding the owner of a local resort. The avarice left orbit on schedule and continued the circuit as it was supposed to. Clearly something went wrong, Fleury. Arisi gave his arm a little squeeze as the turbo lift stopped its ascent. Now we just have to determine who will catch the blame. Voru reached out and punched the emergency stop button on the lift before the doors could open. I have the turbo lifts regularly swept, so I know we are safe for the moment. I ask you this, realizing I now place us at more risk than ever before. Do you feel as I do? that Madame Director Isard is not viewing the same reality we are. Erisi's eyes narrowed. 
Do I think she is insane? Yes. Quite. Arisi twisted around and faced him fully. And Tilly's consumes her. If he is not dealt with shortly, she could destroy Typhira. This is not to say I doubt her ability to eliminate Antilles. She is most dangerous in that regard. But you would be in favor of having contingency plans that guarantee the survival of the Bacta cartel, no matter what happens to her. Exactly. You've read my mind. Only because our thoughts run in parallel. Voru again hit the emergency button and the door slid open. Let us bravely face our fate and deal with the future it presents us. As they neared Isard's doorway, Voru held a hand up, stopping Arisi. He preceded her into the room and bowed politely in Isard's direction. I came as quickly as I was able, Madam Director. He half expected her to jump all over him, but as she turned, she just nodded. Isard brandished a holo projector remote control, then let a thin grin tug at the corners of her flat line mouth. Good Commander Delarit is here too. I only need do this once. She stabbed the remote at an unseen receptor, and suddenly Captain Sayer Yonka appeared life size, standing before her. This is a wonderful display of treachery. Yonka's figure bowed to the room. Madam Director Isan Isard, I regret not being able to bring you this message personally, but not that much. In the time I have been associated with you, I have found you to be sociopathically self-centered, prone to irrational and impulsive reactions to situations, and prey to a preference for appearance over substance. I have no doubt these affectations were seen as skills by the late Emperor, and indeed may have enhanced your ability to comply with his orders. But by no means are these the traits that make for great or even adequate leadership. Voru killed the impulse to applaud. The fact that Ser Yanka wore a black suit of military styling, yet lacking any military insignia, struck Voru as appropriate. Yanka was not abandoning his military background, just severing his connection to Isard. The first Minoc to flee a ship burning into an atmosphere. Yanka's tone of voice, even but full of conviction, sharply contrasted with the fury clearly building in Isard. I have upon reflection come to the conclusion that further service to you would be to condone and support an evil that perhaps would seem insignificant when grouped with the Emperor, Darth Vader, and Prince Shizor. I sincerely doubt, however, the billions of victims who have suffered because of you would be so sanguine about you. I hereby resign your service and renounce allegiance to you and what you represent. The same goes for my crew, save those loyalists you had aboard the Avarice. When informed of the new order of things, they hijacked a Lambda-class shuttle and forced us to destroy them. Yonka clasped his hands behind his back. I know your intent will be to hunt us down and exterminate us. There is no doubt that with the virulence and Luzankia, you could do just that, but you won't get that chance. Most of my career has been served in the Outer Rim. I know of worlds and systems that you could never find. Seek out the Avarice, and you will leave yourself vulnerable to enemies who can destroy you. The image faded to gray static, then evaporated, leaving Isard staring back toward Voru. You once told me he had a mistress, this Captain Yonka. Voru nodded. On El Shandru Pika. Have her killed. Isard spoke softly, surprising Voru with her ability to keep her anger from coloring her words. And any children she has, any siblings, any family. And not his family? Isard snorted harshly. I got this hologram three hours ago. Extermination of the crew's families began then. 
Do recall, as Director of Imperial Intelligence, I have been through this routine before. I happened to notice the information on Yonka's mistress was not in his file. You were not collecting it for your own purposes, were you, Minister Voru? The small man half-lidded his eyes. Merely awaiting confirmation before I committed anything to bites, Madam Director. He opened his hands innocently. I just wonder at your desire to go after his mistress. You don't imagine she influenced him in this decision, do you? No, of course not. Isard folded her hands together. She dies to cause him pain. Have her death holographed. I will play it for Yonka as I work on him. As you wish, Madam Director. Voru bowed as he replied to her, but inside he felt only contempt for her. Ayel and Jondi will be far away and out of your grasp, because it will frustrate you, Iceheart. The Avarice's departure puts us in a curious position. Our ability to guard our convoys has been halved, unless you plan to take the Luzankia out of orbit and press it into that duty. An eyebrow arched over her red eye. And leave Typhira vulnerable to an attack by Antilles? Or an uprising by the Ashern? You think me more mad than Yonka did. Hardly that, Madam Director. Just a person faced with difficult decisions. This is why I have you to advise me, Voru. Isard glared at him, her gaze burning a blush onto his face. You are correct. We cannot guard our back to convoys and prevent an uprising here. Moreover, if we do nothing, Antilles will get bolder and might convince a number of worlds to throw in with him so they can take by force what we are afraid to ship out. That would destroy us. In the face of this, I see only one clear choice. Voru half closed his eyes. She won't surrender, so there must be some new atrocity she is planning. Isard slowly smiled. I believe it was you, Minister Voru, who noted that we could not destroy Antilles until we determined where his base was. Your reports in regards to the search for that base, I have been told by you, have been fruitless because Antilles and his people are very cautious in how they accept goods from outsiders. Only the people he trusts are allowed to come all the way into his base. Voru nodded. That is the problem, Madam Director. No longer. Antilles could operate without taking chances, because we gave him time to do so. I intend to deprive him of that time. The rebels always worked best when no pressure was placed on them, and they were allowed to operate on their own timescale. You have found a way to make him act faster? Arisi's questioning tone underscored Voru's own thoughts. Threatening an innocent world might do it, but to move sufficient forces there to do such a thing would leave Typhira vulnerable. Isard barked a small, triumphant laugh. You've not seen it, neither of you. I have found a way to pressure Antilles and make Typhira more secure. I put together an analysis of the Bacta production here and determined that the Bacta industry needs only 1.8 million Vratix to operate all the facilities we have at 100% efficiency. This means there are a million surplus Vratix on the world. I have ordered the roundup and internment of a thousand Vratix a day for the next 30 days. At the end of that time, I will have them all killed and begin collecting two thousand a day. I will continue in this manner until we have downsized our worker population or Antilles tries to stop me. Isard's smile marked how proud she was of herself for coming up with the plan, and Voru found himself inclined to agree with her. Its simplicity and elegance made it a plan that could be implemented immediately, and the deadline factor meant Antilles would have to react. 
This could bring him out after us, and, if it does, expose his base to our ships. Arisi raised a hand. Madam Director, I am assuming you will present this policy and plan as something for Typhiran consumption only, making it appear as if it were being used as a means to suppress the Ashern. To challenge Antilles openly would be to raise his suspicion. He is not a stupid man, so he will be careful. But there is no need to make him think things through one more time. Voru immediately chimed in. An excellent suggestion, Madam Director. If news of the program comes from locals, it might appear as if you were trying to keep it a secret. Antilles will certainly feel the pressure to intervene. An added benefit is that we will have increased chances to pick up on Antilles's local covert communication network and disrupt it. Indeed, those are added benefits. While I would hate to have it thought I was cravenly trying to hide information from Antilles, I could affect an air of disdain, as if the whole thing were, like him, beneath my notice. Isard opened her hands, then pressed them together, fingertip to fingertip. I approve of your amendments to my plan. We implement it tomorrow. Voru smiled. I will alert my operatives to be especially attentive to any of Antilles's activities. Erisi mirrored his smile. And my people will be ready to pit themselves against the rogues, either here or at their lair. Excellent. Both of Isard's hands curled down into fists. A month. Antilles has a month yet to live. Then, once he is eliminated, the Empire will rise again, and the natural order of things will again be established. 31. Fatigue made Corrin's eyes feel as if Tatooine's twin sons had settled into his skull. He knocked at the door jamb of Booster's office, but refrained from leaning heavily against it lest he fall asleep on his feet. He and Ural had made a run to Typhira, hitting some interim systems along the way to make it impossible to backtrack them to Yagdul. A direct trip would have taken them twelve standard hours. Their course added another twelve to the total. While he had managed to get a little sleep while in hyperspace, the trip left him feeling like he'd spent the last two days in the belly of a sarlacc. Wedge, seated in front of Booster's desk, looked up. You could have stopped to get a meal before you reported in, Corin. Sure, and have Booster presume I can think only of myself when I've been on an important mission like this? Not hungry, Wedge. The news kind of killed my appetite. Booster arched a white eyebrow above his artificial left eye. You were able to confirm the reports from Typhira, then? Corin nodded. According to communication intercepts, approximately two weeks ago, Iceheart initiated a program in which she's gathering up a thousand Vratics a day and is planning to execute them when she has 30,000 total. At that point, if Ashern resistance to her regime has not ceased, she'll collect more. Wedge's voice dropped into a low growl. She finally thinks she's found a way to draw us out. Corin shrugged slowly. I monitored public announcements and privately coded messages from Ayala and Elskol. Everything seems to indicate this program is a domestic one only. There's been no mention of us or what we've been doing. Booster barked a harsh laugh. You think she would say anything directly to motivate us? That would make us suspicious of a trap. Corin frowned. So since she said nothing about us, it is a trap designed to catch us? You must have a conspiracy theory program working overtime on your data pad, Booster. Wedge sat forward and held a hand up to forestall Booster's reply. Doesn't matter what Iceheart intended, though I do think Booster is more right than you are here, Corin. 
The fact is that we have two weeks to prevent her from slaughtering 30,000 Vraticks. Conspiracy or no, trap or no, we have to act. I wasn't saying we shouldn't act, Wedge. Corin shook his head to clear his mind. I'm just saying it's not an obvious attempt to provoke us. Corsac always did miss the obvious. Booster snorted with disgust, then hit a couple of keys on the data pad centered on his desk. Do we initiate things? Can we? Wedge's brown eyes narrowed. Where do we stand on the refits? The sensor and targeting units are all in place. If we use the crews from the freighters we have hanging around here, I can have the launchers ready to go inside a week. Booster looked up. Card even has our last shipment of concussion missiles and proton torpedoes ready to go. An hour after I send him a message via the holonet, his convoy should be assembled. We can have it here within a day, with missile batteries and torpedo magazines fully loaded twelve hours later, if all goes well. What about the gravity well projector? Got it and it's being installed now. Good. Let's get things going. Call Card and set up a rendezvous for 24 hours from now. Wedge glanced up at Corin. Will you be ready to lead a flight out to escort them in by that time? Corin hesitated, not certain what he heard was really what Wedge said. Escort them in? I'll make it 36 hours. Let him get some sleep. Fine, Booster, that should work. Wait, wait, wait. Corin held his hands up. You really intend for me to lead Card's convoy here? We aren't going to work out some transfer thing? Wedge shook his head. No, time is of the essence. But Wedge, sir, begging your pardon, if we do that, then Isard will know where we are. The Luzankia and the Virulence could be here just 24 hours after we get back with the convoy. Corin frowned and rubbed a hand over his wrinkled brow. I thought Booster determined that someone in Card's organization provided Isard with the data to set up the Alderaan ambush. You're practically inviting Isard here. Booster smiled. No practically about it, Corin. We are inviting her here. But you can't do that. Even if this station were bristling with missile launchers, there's no way we could take down a superstar destroyer and an imp star deuce. Wedge shook his head. I understand your protest, Corin, but you're not privy to the plans Booster, Tycho, and I have put together for dealing with Isard and her fleet. You do know we've been taking her forces apart bit by bit which certainly was part of our overall plan. But we had to make decisions about what to do if Iceheart forced our hand, and she has. Then tell me what the plans are so I don't think you've lost your minds. Can't do that, Corsac. Booster flipped his data pad closed with a click. You're going to go out and get the convoy and bring it here. If Iceheart decides to act early and take our pilots hostage... She can't torture out of you information you don't have. Wedge nodded in agreement. And I need you to lead the escort flight, because Isard and her agent would not believe we were on the level if you or Tycho or I did not bring the flight in. I don't want to cut you out like this, but the less you know, the less you can reveal. Corin felt his flesh tighten around little goosebumps and a wave of weariness wash over him. I hear what you're saying, Wedge, but are you certain this is going to work? Booster roared with laughter. Certain? Certain? Of course he's not certain. The man who would only bet on certainty has no guts. I have plenty of guts, Booster, but I don't like risking them or my life or the lives of my friends if I don't have to. Certainty or as close as I can get to it is what I want. And you call yourself a Corellian? The big man snorted derisively as he sat back in his chair. 
No wonder you joined Corsic. What's that supposed to mean? I thought it was obvious, Corsic. If you had the guts for life, if you were even to imagine yourself worthy of my daughter, you wouldn't have spent your life in service to the Empire's puppet. You played it safe when men with real courage were out there defying the government. Corin's fatigue melted as his anger grew. Oh, you're going to use the smugglers are really patriots story to excuse your greed. Let me tell you something, Booster Tarek. You can think of yourself as a noble scoundrel if you want, but the fact is you were out for money when you were running shipments, nothing more. The fact that you didn't pay taxes on what you imported, the fact that you broke laws, might mark you as some sort of protester against the government in the eyes of some, but I know the truth. You were just a criminal, not as violent or bad as some others, but a criminal just the same. And those taxes you didn't pay were the kind of taxes that build roads, maintain spaceports, and educate kids. What you did was deny them their due and provide the contraband that allowed organizations like Black Sun and Hut Bands to thrive on our world. Corin thrust a finger directly at Booster. And as for being worthy of your daughter, I'm the worthiest man you ever met. Every gram of character you think you have, she does have. And brains, too, and courage. And even you, Booster Tarek, don't want to see her hooking up with a man who has your morals and standards. Booster rose from behind his desk, his hands balled into fists. And if you were the man you think you are, Corin Horn, you'd not have abandoned her on Typhira. Abandoned her? Corin's mind flashed back to his mad dash into the refresher station and his fight with the stormtroopers. I didn't abandon her. You want to talk abandonment? I left for five seconds to save her life. You left her for five years, Booster, or have you forgotten your vacation on Kessel? A vacation your father got for me, Horn. Wedge stood abruptly and posted a hand in the middle of each man's chest. All right, stop it right now. He gave each of them a little shove, and Corin let himself be propelled back toward the doorway. Wedge turned to Booster, shifted both hands to the larger man's shoulders, and forced him down into his chair. Listen to me, Booster. And you'll listen because you don't want to find yourself in the situation of having Mirax say this to you. Corin Horn here is one of the smartest, skilled, and courageous men it's been my privilege to know. He escaped from a prison that makes Kessel look like a resort world with hourly shuttles in and out. He's gone and done things on missions that put him at risk, because those things save the lives of others. If not for him, Coruscant would still be in Imperial hands, and I, as well as your daughter would be dead or Isard slaves. When you arrived on this station, you said you thought I would have protected Mirax from the likes of Corin. Wedge shook his head. The real story is that I was overjoyed when they became friends. Mirax needed someone as stable as Corin, because she's never really sure where you are or what's happened to you. And Corin, he needed someone with Mirax's curiosity and fervor for life, because he'd been cut off from everyone he knew and trusted. Both of them were gyros that needed to be spin-balanced, and they did that for each other. Before Corin could begin to grin triumphantly, Wedge whirled and stabbed a finger into his chest. And you, my friend, need to get some perspective here. You're seeing Booster as your father's old enemy, and your father isn't here to put him in his place. Well, you aren't your father. Their fight isn't your fight, and you can't stand in for your father in it. And you should be smart enough to know Booster doesn't have a problem with you because you were Halhorn's son. He's got the same problem with you that every father ever had with any man romancing his daughter. She's the best thing that ever happened to him. Corin nodded. 
She's the best thing that ever happened to me, too. Right, which means the two of you have more in common than either one of you would admit. Now, the both of you better think on this. Mirax loves both of you. So unless you think she's got no taste or character judgment at all, you better figure you both are worthy of each other's respect. Wedge folded his arms and positioned himself so he could see both of them easily. I don't expect you'll ever get to the point where you actually like each other, but when you're both acting like adults, you'll be above this sort of bickering. Corin looked up and met Booster's stare openly. Waiting to see if I break, aren't you? Waiting to see if I knuckle under. In a nanosecond, Corin resolved never to give in, never to change his opinion of Booster. While all Wedge had said was true, and made damn good sense. Corin had been raised with his father's rivalry with Booster Tarek. If I do give in, I've betrayed my father. Or have I? Corin frowned as he thought about his father and the life his father had led. Hal Horn had lived for years with the knowledge that he was really the son of a Jedi and subject to the extermination policy the Empire had put in place concerning Jedi. His father could have done anything to make himself safe. He could have retreated to the hinterlands of some backwater world and become a hermit. But he chose not to absent himself from the duty his father, fathers really, had acquitted. A Jedi helped maintain the peace and uphold the law. Hal Horn did the same thing as best he could by working with Corsac, no matter that his duties might expose him to the Emperor's Jedi hunters. Corin suddenly realized that his father's rivalry with Booster Tarek had not been personal. Hal Horn had pursued Booster because Booster broke the law. Yes, the fact that Booster evaded him repeatedly did frustrate him, but the basis of his pursuit was always the same. He didn't let it get personal. I have, and in that I have betrayed my father. He glanced down for a moment and thought about some of the exercises Luke Skywalker had urged him to try out. By making things personal, Kurt and Lure and Zekka Thine, I have betrayed the Jedi traditions my father, in his own cautious way, tried to instill in me. Corin's head came up as he stepped forward and extended his hand to Booster. You're not my enemy. Never have been. I'm not yours. For the sake of your daughter, the people we've got to save, and the memory of my father, I don't want to fight with you anymore. Doesn't mean we won't disagree, perhaps even violently at times. But you don't deserve my ill will. Surprise slowly blossomed on Booster Tarek's face. He started to say something, then stopped. His hand came up and engulfed Corin's. Normally I'd be angry that I had misjudged you so badly, but you've reinforced just how good a judge of character my daughter really is. And you're right. We'll disagree, and I can guarantee it'll be violent. But that's okay. We're Corellians. We can do that. Wedge dropped his hand on top of theirs. Good. You know, the imps on Coruscant used to call two Corellians together a conspiracy. Three, they'd call a fight. More fools they, then, Corin smiled. Any Corellian knows three of us together is a victory. It's time we remind Iceheart and the rest of imp holdovers of that very fact. 32. Corin glanced at the chronographic display on the X-Wing's main monitor. Whistler, confirm that we're ten standard minutes past the time for the rendezvous. The R2 unit blatted out an annoyed tone. Fine, so I won't ask you to confirm how late they are anymore, at least not every minute. 
Corin forced himself to exhale deeply and tried to draw in some of the inner peace that Luke indicated such a cleansing breath should bring in its wake. He failed, and that just heightened his frustration. Despite accepting the mission, he had not liked having to be the one to draw Isard's agent into Yagdul. While he knew the deception Booster and Wedge had planned would certainly make the discovery of their base appear to be serendipitous, every second Card's people were late allowed the image of a Typhiran task force appearing to pounce on them grow in his mind. It wouldn't have been so bad, but Corin had not come alone. Gavin, Rizzotti, and Inri flew X-Wings to give him a complete flight, and Mirax had come along in the Pulsar Skate. None of them knew how dangerous their mission might be, and Corin granted that the odds of their ending up dead on this mission probably were no greater than they were on any other, but he still would have felt better if he could have told them what was really going on. Of course, that would mean I'd have to know what was going on. A light flashed on his communications console. He punched the button beneath it. Nine here. Skate here, Nine. Mirax's voice sounded good to him and immediately began to take the edge off his frustration. So, as long as we're waiting, you want to tell me what you said to my father? Corin frowned. How do you know about that? Well, I could say that you talk in your sleep, but you don't. The light tone in her voice conveyed the image of her smiling face to him. When we headed out, my father shot me a private message. Normally, he says I should make sure you take good care of me. This time, he said, I should keep my eye on you and follow your lead. Bit of a difference there. Yeah, just a bit. So? We had a talk. Are you going to tell me what was said, or am I going to convince M. Trey he needs to spend more time around you? Hey, no reason to trot out the turbo lasers here. Corin hesitated for a moment, then sighed. Your father and I had it out. He said I'd abandoned you on Typhira. What? And I accused him of having abandoned you when he went to Kessel. What? You really told him that? Yeah, then I told him that you were everything he wanted to be, and that the last person he should want interested in his daughter was someone who held himself to the same level of morality and responsibility he did. And you still have your arms and legs intact? Your father isn't exactly a Wookiee, Mirax. Corin forced a laugh. Besides, it was about that point when Wedge intervened. Ah, that explains why you're both still alive. Right. Wedge pointed out that since you love the both of us, we've got a lot more in common than we do in conflict. He said in essence that we should grow up and start acting like adults. Mirax laughed lightly. I bet that went over well with my father. He listened, and the two of us were prepared to get back into it, but... I let things bounce around inside my head, and I realized I was disliking your father for the wrong reasons. Somewhere inside, I figured it was my duty to my father to continue his rivalry with your father. Then I realized my father hadn't let it get personal. He might have hunted your father with a bit more gusto because your father didn't make it easy, but he didn't hate Booster. By allowing myself to do so, though, I was really going against everything my father had tried to teach me. I can understand that. Mirax's voice softened. And it kind of bothers you that your father never told you who your grandfather really was, doesn't it? Corin thought for a second, then nodded. I guess it does, but not in the sense that I would have expected. Part of me thinks I should feel betrayed because he kept that secret from me, but I don't really. In keeping it from me, he kept me safe. What I didn't know, I couldn't reveal. I still don't know if Grandpa Horn helped other Corellian Jedi families hide, but if one had been found out, more could have been discovered. And my father really did try to instill in me the code of honor the Jedi espoused. 
He also taught me to trust my instincts and hunches, which are glimmers of whatever talent I have. Where it bothers me is that, knowing my father, he had to have been inordinately proud of our heritage. He must have wanted to share it with me, and would have, I suspect, after the emperor died, but Bosk killed him before that happened. I would have thought he'd have come up with a way to get me the information if anything happened to him. What about your grandfather, Rostek Horn? He's on Corellia, under the diktat. I haven't had a chance to communicate with him. Perhaps when this is all over, that's an option. Still, I would have liked to hear my father talk about his father. Whistler tootled. Corin glanced at his monitor. Whistler, what do you mean by all you have to do is ask? The droid hooted at him. Okay, so the statement is self-explanatory. What will happen if I ask? Whistler piped a triumphant tone. What's Whistler saying, Corin? Just a second, Mirax. Corin reached out and ran a finger beneath the letters glowing on his monitor. I guess I shouldn't be surprised, but I am. My father encrypted a holographic file and loaded it into Whistler. Apparently, he did this back when I joined Corsec, though Whistler says the message was recorded well before that, in case anything happened to him. Whistler says he was instructed to play the file for me at any point where I asked about it and could provide the encryption key. I'm going to assume the key is either Neja Halcyon or my father's true name, Valen Halcyon. Even as Corin explained to Mirax what the droid was telling him, a chill puckered his flesh. He felt as if his father were reaching back out of the grave to touch him and he marveled how his father had anticipated Corrin's eventually learning enough about his heritage to find the file of value. Before he had ever heard of Neja Halcyon, Corrin would have put his father's foresight down to luck or even coincidence, but he knew the Jedi believed in neither. My father knew that someday I would want this information, so he prepared a way for me to get it. That realization opened a whole new den of huts, with every one of them a criminal kingpin. He thought of Luke Skywalker's invitation to join him and train to become a Jedi Knight. Did my father create this file in hopes that I would do just that? Because the file had been created well before the Jedi's reemergence had been confirmed, Korra knew his father couldn't have anticipated the Jedi's invitation to him. Or could he? Regardless of that, had his father intended his message to inspire Corin to learn more about his heritage? The droid chirped out a question. No, Whistler, save the message. Now's not the time to look at it. Why not, Corin? We've got time to kill. Because, Mirax, I don't have time to consider all of the questions it might raise. Such as? such as making me reconsider my answer to Luke Skywalker. Perhaps what my father has to tell me in this message will make me realize I should be learning to become a Jedi Knight. That decision would force other decisions, and some of them I don't want to make. Primary among them, a decision to leave you to go off and study the ways of the Force. My other responsibilities to the squadron and the prisoners we're going to free likewise make such a decision difficult. Right now, I need to be able to focus on what I'm doing. So, you won't play the message? Corin shook his head. Not right now. Certainly not until the Typhirin situation is over. What I hear in your voice, Corin, is that you might not ever play it. You know me very well, love. Corin closed his eyes for a moment and swallowed against the lump in his throat. He reached up with a hand and pressed the gold Jedi credit against the flesh of his breastbone. This hologram is the last thing my father has left me, but he never would have done it if he thought it would completely disrupt my life. Can you be sure of that? Yeah, 
If it was something I had to hear for my own good, Whistler would never have been instructed to wait until I asked to hear it. Corin laughed, and that eased the tightness in his throat. My father trusted me to make my own decisions and deal with the consequences. That trust, Corin, is the last thing your father left you. It's a most precious gift indeed, than one well suited to you. Thanks, Mirax. Whistler shrilled a warning, prompting Corin to look at his monitor. A dozen ships popped in from hyperspace in an arrow formation and headed straight for the rogue escort. Whistler, pull manifest from each of the ships, then see if stated mass and performance profiles match. He hit a switch on his comm unit, bringing him online with the rogue's tactical frequency. Three, five, and six, fan out and pull life scans on the ships. If any of those ships are packed with more crew than we expect, I want to know about it. Corin waited five minutes for the other X-Wings to gather the data and for Whistler to crunch it all down. The various freighters appeared to be massing about as much as they should for their stated cargoes, and none of them was loaded down with troops, so Corin assumed the convoy was legitimate. The convoy is secure from my standpoint, Mirax. I copy, Nine. This is Pulsar Skate to Empress's Diadem. You've been cleared for continuation of the journey. I copy, Skate. Feed us the coordinates and we can get this thing moving. Coordinates for exit vector, jump duration, and speed on their way. Corin watched the data stream flow across the bottom of his monitor and wondered what Melina Karnas was making of it. He imagined she'd be disappointed because the first jump was just a short hop to a dead system. From there, they'd get another exit vector that would put them on a straight line for the Yagdul system, but the speed and duration data would suggest they were going to another system well beyond Yagdul. She'll be anticipating calling in a strike on Folor in the Commonor system. Corin smiled as he thought about the surprise the convoy would be in for during their journey. The speed that was being set for them would allow them to slip past the Yagdul system in hyperspace, but Booster had thought of a way to end their journey prematurely. The gravity well projector he'd gotten from Card and had grafted onto the station would create enough of a gravity shadow to pull the convoy out of hyperspace. The premature end of the flight would deliver the goods where they were most needed and would be a trick clearly meant to conceal the location of the base from outsiders which ought to be enough to make Karnas think secrecy is still important to us. Corin dearly wished he knew the full extent of Wedge's plan to deal with Isard's forces, but he respected the security provided by the compartmentalization of such information. I doubt I'll know everything that goes on, unless or until this is all over and I get debriefed. Corin brought his X-Wing around on the appointed exit vector and chopped his throttle back to 51% of thrust. In hyperspace, the X-Wings were twice as fast as the freighters, save Karnas's diadem and Mirax's skate. By dropping his thrust to just over half, the X-Wing would arrive in system just before the freighters and could head off any ambushes. The other X-Wings pulled up off his S-foils. Nine to skate. Escort is ready to head out. Lead on, Nine, and be careful. As ever, Skate, wouldn't want your father to be disappointed in me. 33. Melina Carnus managed to keep a smile on her face and a light lilt in her voice, despite being anxious to leave the Yagdul station. No, Mirax, no need to apologize. I've enjoyed your company over the last two days. I would have felt quite out of sorts and lonely had you not taken me under your wing. Mirax smiled. I'm glad you feel that way. I am sometimes accused of being somewhat smothering. Somewhat? Lady, you could smother a given and they don't need to breathe. Again, your company was appreciated. And let your father know I'm sure Card won't have a problem with my having been kept here awaiting payment. He's very understanding that way. 
Mirax stepped back away from the turbo lift opening. See you on the next trip. I'm sure. Goodbye. Melina remained smiling even after the door closed. Be just like her father to have security holocams set up here in the turbo lift. I have to maintain the charade until I'm back aboard the diadem. Karnas had hoped to be away from the Yogdul station as quickly as possible, but the delay in payment meant her ship was the last of the convoy to leave. Despite being a huge station, Yogdul's docking bays were mostly in use, requiring a piecemeal unloading of the convoy. That delay meant the shipments couldn't be verified, hence the reason payment was late. Mirax's insistence that she leave Diadem and enjoy the station's facilities meant she had no chance to send a message out to Typhira to report the location of Rogue Base. While it certainly was Mirax's fault that she'd not been able to make her report sooner, the fact was that she didn't really want to make it until her ship was outbound anyway. Her Nava computer had worked out the time it would take for Iceheart's task force to arrive at Yagdul from Typhira. Had she sent out the coordinates when she arrived, she would have been trapped on the station and killed along with all the others. While Iceheart appreciates my information, I don't doubt I'm seen as expendable. Karnas exited the turbo lift and cut between two battered freighters on her way to her ship. The motley collection of freighters and fighters reminded her of the force Card had said had been used to take Coruscant from Isard. Except this force is lacking Star Destroyers and Mon Calamari cruisers. Most of the ships looked as if they had been cobbled together from scrap salvaged from Endor or Alderaan. Isard's virulence could defeat this fleet all by itself. She walked up the ramp on her modified Corellian YT-1210 light freighter, the Empress's Diadem, and closed it behind her. The disc-shaped ship had a pair of blaster cannons in a turret mounted above and below a boxy concussion missile launch tube assembly that fired into the ship's aft arc. What I can't outrun, I can discourage from chasing me. Pete, she shouted at her pilot, Get us off this station and bound for Corellia. We have business on Salonia. Once you compute the route and have the times, let me know. I'll be in my quarters. As ordered, Captain Carnus. Melina headed back to her quarters and sealed the hatch behind her. Because space was at a premium on the freighter, her cabin was small yet not without luxuries. Included among them was a small refresher station, which meant she did not have to use the facilities shared by the rest of the crew. Since she was the only woman on board, the concession had a practical side to it, as well as serving to remind the crew of her superior status. She opened the central drawer on her data pad desk and pulled it all the way out. On the back panel, she slid aside a finger-length wafer of duraplast, revealing a small cavity. From it, she pulled out a slender silver capsule approximately the size of her smallest finger. She put it on the desk, then returned the duraplast wafer and the drawer to their proper places. From her personal gear, she got two small batteries and a transparasteel flask with a chrome bottom and capped with a chrome tumbler. She worked two screws loose on the bottom of the bottle and pulled the base off. Into the hollows in the base, she snapped the batteries and the capsule. She fastened the flask's base back on the transparent steel bottle, then tossed the whole assembly into the refresher station's bowl and evacuated it. The flush of disinfectant washed the flask down into a holding tank. As the diadem came about on its exit vector, the pilot hit a switch that dumped the holding tank's contents out into space. The fluid immediately froze into a mass of blue ice that slowly began to drift in toward the system's sun. It would be months before the debris finally evaporated in the solar engine. The sudden drop in temperature around the flask immediately started the capsule issuing orders. A tiny port opened in the tip of the flask's cap, 
and a spark from the batteries ignited enough of the savarine brandy to burn the flask free of the ice and jet it away. At the same time, a panel on the bottom of the flask opened up to expose electromagnetic sensors that started feeding system data to the capsule. The capsule itself was really the heart of a probe droid. Stripped of the armor and devices necessary to let it enter an atmosphere and operate in a hostile environment, the droid took up a minimum of space and could easily function on batteries for a dozen hours. Its mission was simple. Pinpoint the location of the system in which it was dropped. Locate a hidden holonet transmission station and pulse out a tight beam message conveying that information to the station. The automated station would in turn deliver that information through the holonet to Fleury Voru within seconds of its reception. With the sensors, it mapped the sky and compared the configuration of stars with what would be available at various systems in the galaxy. While a complete catalog of systems would have required far more storage than the probe droid possessed, Voru and his people had ruthlessly eliminated systems that lacked habitable worlds, had settlements that were insufficiently developed to help maintain the rogues and their ships, or that otherwise appeared to be inappropriate. Within an hour of beginning its mission, the probe droid found a match in its star catalog. It knew it was in the Yagdul system. It oriented itself so it could pulse its message out to a clandestine holonet transmission site, but found an obstacle in its way. It did pick up calm frequencies emanating from the obstacle and also saw how many stars it blotted out of the sky, but had no way to identify it as a space station. It did catalog the item's presence. Then it jetted up to a point where it could locate the relay station. Once it found its target, the droid pulsed its message out. It continued to do so for the next three standard hours before a meteorite shattered the transparasteel flask and reduced the droid to so much junk orbiting Yagdul. Wedge looked out over the assembly of pilots in the station's amphitheater. They all looked eager which was good, but that surprised him. When he began the briefing, he expected their hungry expressions to melt into disappointment. So there it is. Within the next 24 to 36 hours, we anticipate the arrival of Isard's Lusankia and Virulence here at Yagdul. We've already begun an evacuation of the station, with our ships taking up a position on the edge of this system. Their position provides a clean exit vector to Typhira, which is where you'll be going along with them. Is that understood? Nawara Ven raised a hand. Forgive me, Commander, but do you think having all of us fighters scramble and then run away will fool the Typhiran commanders? Broar Jace turned in his seat to look at Nawara. If they were Typhiran commanders, it wouldn't, but these are imps. They're used to imagining that rebels run at the sight of them. Wedge smiled at Jace's answer. Just as you've been simming a lot of anti-ship attacks, we've been simming the likely reactions on the Typhiran command level. We're pretty certain they'll believe our retreat, especially when we jump to light speed on a vector bound for Typhira. Captain Dryso will assume in our desperation to save the station we're going to strike at Typhira. Because our snub fighters are twice as fast as the Lusankia, we'll have twelve hours there to batter Typhira unopposed. He knows he can't beat us back there, so he'll finish our station off, then come after us. Corin frowned. What if his people pick up on the fact that we rendezvous with our freighters before we head out? Still no cause of alarm for him. The Luzankia still outguns our entire fleet. More ships just provide his gunners with more practice. Wedge shrugged. I know there are dozens of unanswered questions you have right now because I've been fairly vague about our overall plan and have just concentrated on your roles in what is going to happen. Your squadron leaders have more specific orders on which they will brief you at the appropriate time. 
Right now, I just wanted to let you know that action is imminent, so you should take care to put your affairs in order and prepare any holograms you want sent in case of death. Gavin smiled. But you're not going to leave those things on the station here, are you? Wedge laughed. No, we'll have them sent to Coruscant. Make no mistake about it, people, this won't be easy. A lot of us won't be coming back. There will be a terrible price to pay to liberate Typhira, but an even greater one if we don't liberate it. We'll be taking a lot of risks, but we have no choice, because this will be our best chance to destroy Isard. If we fail now, it could very well be that no one else will ever dare to oppose her. Asser let a little growl rumble from her throat. So failure is not an option, eh, Wedge? Not for us, Asser. Not by a long shot. Fleury Voru looked at the data scrolling up through the air above his holopad. Beyond the glowing green numbers, he watched Arisi Dlarit study the information. Rather ingenious of them, wasn't it, my dear, to choose the Yagdul station as their base? You might have guessed. Arisi nodded once, curtly. I did guess, and did some checking of my own. The station was ordered and reported destroyed. Pash Kraken signed the report indicating the station had been destroyed, so perhaps I should have been suspicious. Voru waved her remark away. Don't berate yourself, Arisi. No, Madam Director will do that for me, won't she? Voru smiled. Ah, uh, you know her so well. She does seem to visit injustice upon you with fair frequency. I think that is a situation that should change. Arisi arched an eyebrow over an ice-blue eye. What did you have in mind? See if your reasoning parallels my own. It strikes me that after the Luzankia is sent off to destroy the Yagdul station, someone in the New Republic is going to have to take notice of how much firepower she possesses. While Zinj has been more of a direct threat, and is why the New Republic fleet is out there hunting him down, and with any luck at all destroying him, Isan Isard has succeeded in raising her profile rather considerably. The New Republic will be forced to deal with her sooner or later, and I'm inclined to think they will opt for sooner. The Typhiran pilot nodded slowly. I follow you so far. It strikes me that my position here is no longer going to be profitable. I have managed in my position to set aside a certain amount of credits that would be sufficient, say, to purchase a planet. I would require a loyal staff and even a wing of pilots to keep my rivals at bay. I see. And would you be requiring my services as a pilot or my company? Voru bowed his head in a salute. Your services as a pilot would be most valuable to me. Your company, on the other hand, would be invaluable to me. I leave the choice of role to you to be modified as you wish. Very well. I shall start as the commander of your pilots. Arisi clasped her hands at the small of her back. How do you see this defection being accomplished? After the Luzankia and the Virulence return from destroying the Yagdul station, we will head out on the Virulence on an inspection tour of facilities. There will be an accident. We will disappear. It can be arranged. Then arrange it. Arisi looked around and toward the viewports displaying the planet's lush greenery. Iceheart will find a way to destroy this world I love. I have no desire to be here when that happens. Nor do I, Arisi, dear. Nor do I. 34. Corin reached across the table at Flare Star and took Mirax's hand in his. Thanks. She gave his hand a squeeze. Buying dinner was no big deal. 
That's not what I'm thanking you for. Corin glanced down at the table, then back up at her. Seeing you sitting there, I remember the first time I saw you, back on Talisia. Mirax smiled. Yeah, the lighting is dim enough in here to resemble that world. He chuckled. I was remembering how beautiful you looked then, and how beautiful you are now. And I remember you cut a rather dashing figure in your flight suit, and then I had to go and spoil it by bringing our father's rivalry into things. But we got over that fast. Then I was remembering our last conversation on Coruscant before we headed out to conquer a world. His smile shrank somewhat. And then I ruined what we were heading for by getting captured by Isard. Yet another crime for which she should pay. Agreed. Corin sat back as a serving droid started clearing platters from their table. A huge chunk of what gnawed at me while I was on the Lusankia was knowing you thought I was dead. I didn't want to presume that my disappearance would have hurt you that much, but I knew how I'd have felt were our situations reversed. Mirax nodded solemnly. And now, in less than a day, we'll be tossed again into a fight where we both might die. Corin shot her a wry grin. You wouldn't be trying to turn this into a sleep with me tonight because tomorrow we may die thing, would you? Me? Mirax demurely pressed a hand against her breastbone. Perish the thought. I'd never think of taking advantage of you like that, despite having bought you a lavish meal. Oh, no? No. Why not? Corin sniffed. Am I not good enough for you? You are that, but as I recall, you're also already sleeping in my bed. Good point. It does sort of make this kind of seduction rather moot. True, but the flirtation is fun. I agree there, too. Corin smiled and tightened his grip on her hand ever so slightly, doing his best to make sure he didn't feed the pressure building in his chest into his hand. And I can't think of anyone I would rather flirt with and be seduced by than you. In fact, I think we should make it permanent. Mirax's brown eyes grew wide. Lieutenant Corin Horn, are you asking me to marry you? Look, I know this might seem abrupt. I mean, I know we've been living together since my return from the grave, but with all our missions and trips and everything, I'd guess we've not had more than three weeks in the last four months where we've actually been able to spend time alone with each other. Despite how hectic and chaotic things have been, what I do know is that I want more time to spend with you. I know that I'm never going to find someone for whom I feel more than I feel for you. That's true, because if you did, I'd see to it that you stopped feeling altogether. Mirak squeezed his fingers. Are you sure about this? Don't you want to talk to Ayella about it? She'd tell me I've been an idiot for not asking you to marry me sooner. She and Derek were as close as any two people I've ever seen. And despite the pain she's been through, I don't think she'd have surrendered one moment of their happiness together to make her feel better. For as long as I've known her, she's had a habit of predicting how many weeks my relationships would last and she was always on target. With us, no prediction. Always did think she was smart. Mirax held her right hand up. One last thing, Corin. You realize that I'm not walking away from my lifestyle or my father. The Mirax Tarek you get is the Mirax Tarek you know. I think your father and I have an understanding, but even if we didn't, you'd be worth it realize I'm not going to change either. Wouldn't have it any other way. Corin arched an eyebrow. So? He could feel his heart pounding in his chest. Will you marry me? 
Mirax lifted his hand from the table and kissed it. Yes, I will, Coronorn. The tension in him exploded in a nervous laugh that freed a single tear to roll down his cheek. He slipped his hand from hers, then pulled off the gold chain and Jedi medallion he wore. This station isn't a good place for finding jewelry, and I didn't want to ask Zray to machine up a quadanium ring, so all I have to offer you is this. He held the medallion out by the chain, but Mirax refused to take it. Corin, I know how much that medallion means to you. It's your good luck piece. I won't take it, especially just before the coming assault. Mirax, you've just agreed to marry me. Any luck left in this thing has clearly been drained. You're the most important person in the galaxy to me. So if this will keep you safe, or even if it will remind you of me, it's better off with you than hanging around my neck. She accepted it from him and stared down at the medallion resting in her palm. She ran a thumb over Neja Halcyon's profile and slowly smiled. Do you think our children will look like him? Better him than your father. They both laughed. At least for the boys, that is. If our daughters look like their mother, I'll be as pleased as possible and as protective of them as your father is of you. Mirax looped the chain over her head and let it slip beneath her clothes. I'm going to find you something that's just as special as this is. Maybe I'll talk to Zray about fabricating something for you, something you'll never forget. Like what? A ring, maybe, made from the Luzankia's hull. It held you captive the way you hold my heart captive. You're good, Mirax, very good. I'm the best, Corin, and you always push me to excel. He smiled. So when do we break the news to your father? Mirax paled slightly. The when comes after the how, I think. Give me some time to figure that out. We can tell Wedge, though, and some of the others, but that can wait until tomorrow. We have other things to do tonight. Such as? You, Corin Horn, have asked me to marry you. I have accepted, and I intend us to do everything right in our marriage. She stood up from the table and dragged him up after her. Toward that end, there are certain things I think we should practice until we perform them perfectly. Fleury Voru found it easy to read the emotions running through the two ship captains. The briefing Isan Isard was giving them clearly frightened Captain Lakwi Varsha. Though the woman stood taller and was more muscled than Isan Isard, she lacked the vitality that gave Isard her commanding presence. That the woman had risen so high in imperial service marked her as competent, but Voru felt her rise had much to do with the fact that she had hitched her career to that of Joak Dryso and his rising star had dragged her along to the limits of her abilities. Joak Dryso, in contrast to Varsha, was small and blocky with prematurely gray hair that was matched by the color of his goatee. Despite his diminutive stature, he had an air of menace about him. Were it not for the perspective supplied by his surroundings, Voru could have imagined him being a stormtrooper standing a hundred meters distant, lethal and not given to surrender. Isard had chosen to wear her Red Admiral's uniform for the briefing, despite the heat and humidity. There it is, then. You will be attacking an Empress-class space station. The armaments and shielding are minimal, though the chance that some upgrades are in place cannot be overlooked. The Yagdul system is twenty-four hours from here. I expect the station to be destroyed and you to return here within sixty hours from now. Are there any questions? Dryso nodded sharply. I have to wonder, Madam Director, at why you are sending both the Lusankia and the Virulence on this mission. 
De Luzonkia, as well you know, has more than enough firepower to obliterate the station. In addition, I have twelve squadrons of TIE fighters at my disposal, which is more than enough to overwhelm Antilles' paltry forces. Even Minister Voru's most generous estimates of the rogue's strength gives us a two-to-one advantage in fighters, and as good as the rogues might be, they cannot hope to prevail against us. Voru cleared his throat. You have forgotten the Alderanian war cruiser? Its firepower is negligible. The Superstar Destroyer can absorb all the damage it can do and still destroy it at leisure. I will designate two squadrons of ties to keep it off me. There is no need for the virulence to come with me on this mission. Moreover, its departure from Typhira puts this world at risk. Isard blinked. At risk? From whom? Antilles and his people. Recall his X-Wings are hyperspace-capable. If they bolt when we arrive, they will be able to come here and have twelve hours to fly missions against positions here before we could possibly return. Voru frowned. Toward what end? Antilles can't take this planet without troops. But he has them, Minister Voru, in the Ashern Rebels. Isard waved their exchange away. No matter. Any gains they made in your absence would vanish when you return. Leaving the virulence here would prevent even minimal gains, Dryso stroked his goatee. While I have the utmost respect for and confidence in Captain Varsha, her ship is not required on this mission. Nor is it required to safeguard Typhira. Isard smiled slowly. I have the Typhiran Home Defense Corps to ward off the rogues, if they do what you say they will. What few of them the THDC allows to survive will be useless to the Ashurn rebels. We can easily hold out for twelve or twenty-four hours, whatever it takes for your return. And the virulence will be going with you to guarantee your return. Eight Convarian made the mistake you were making in underestimating Antilles. Convarian paid for his arrogance with his life. Dryso accepted Isard's warning without a flicker of reaction. I assure you, Madam Director, the Luzankia will return from Yagdul victorious. I trust this will be the case, Captain Dryso. Otherwise, you'll have no reason to return here at all. Isard nodded solemnly. You will find the consequences of failure most disagreeable. Isard shifted her attention to Captain Varsha, and Voru waited for the virulence's commander to collapse. Captain Varsha, you understand the mission as it has been given to you? Yes, ma'am. The virulence is to offer all aid and assistance to the Luzankia to complete its mission. I will execute Captain Dryso's orders instantly. Ah, I see. Isard's eyes narrowed. You have served as Captain Dryso's subordinate officer for years now, yes? Yes, ma'am. Following his orders is admirable, but what would you do if you thought he was making a mistake? I don't understand the question, ma'am. Anger curled its way through Isard's voice. Are you capable of taking the initiative, Captain? If the Luzankia were suddenly faced with a threat, could you act to head that threat off without an order from Captain Dryso? Yes, ma'am. Very good, Captain. Isard strolled over to where the other woman stood, her voice dropping to the level of a growled whisper. Understand this. The Luzankia is more valuable than you or your ship. Its preservation is vital for our continued success here at Typhira. You will do whatever you must to see to it that the ship returns here. Captain Dryso may consider your presence to be that of an observer, but I consider you a shield between the Luzankia and disaster. Isard spun away from her and addressed all three of the individuals in the room. If Antilles knows we are coming, he will have something prepared to oppose us. 
Even if he has not anticipated us, I do not think he will be helpless. He will be desperate, and desperation can inspire people to great feats of heroism. In desperation, there is danger for our forces, so you must be careful. If your victory costs us too much, we could be in jeopardy. Dryso's face became a resolute mask. Victory will be mine, Madam Director. Those are famous last words, Captain Dryso. Isard snorted derisively. Do your best to see you do not join the teeming mass of failures for whom those were the last words. Ayala Wessery snapped the trigger assembly for her blaster carbine back into place and tightened the bolt to secure it. She picked up a power pack to slam it home, but stopped when Elskal Loro crouched and squeezed through the opening to the Vratix den they shared. News? The smaller woman nodded. All leaves have been cancelled for crew from the Luzankia and the Virulence. Within six hours or so, they should be underway. No convoy is forming up? Nope. This is clearly a strike mission. Ayala frowned. You mean the strike mission? Isar does appear to be dancing to the tune Wedge is called. Elskal shrugged. I just hope Wedge can pay the synthesizer jockey when the bill comes due. He took Coruscant. Freeing this rock isn't going to be that much tougher. Yes, but Isard wanted the New Republic to have Coruscant. She's being a bit more possessive about Tyvira. True. Ayala set her carbine down, then hit several buttons on her chronometer. Well, this news puts us on the clock, then, I guess. Forty-eight hours after the Luzankia leaves Typhira, Wedge and the others will be here. You've already told Sixtus we're on? He and his task force are already heading to their staging points and expect to be in position to liberate the detention center when they get our signal. Ayala caught a funny note in Elskull's voice. And you'd still like that signal to be a lift truck bomb being flown into the Zukfra administrative headquarters to blow it up, right? Call me silly, but I don't see why risking injury in an assault so you can capture Isard is preferable to scattering her constituent atoms all over the place with a bomb. And don't give me the justice line again. Ayala shook her head. Look, I know how evil Isard is. She turned my husband into a mockery of himself. I'd like nothing better than to shove a blaster up her nose that melt her brain. I wouldn't consider it murder. Nor would anyone else. But her death isn't the point. Stopping her is. Even more important than that is to let her be tried in a court of law for her crimes. It's vital to let people know that the laws have purpose and that evil people will be held accountable for what they do. Elskall frowned. And a bomb doesn't do that? A bomb is just more anarchy. Killing her that way will allow people to say she had to be kept quiet or important people would have been revealed to be collaborators. Blowing her up allows people to say she really escaped the blast. The lack of a trial, because she won't be held accountable for all of her crimes, means people can begin to think she wasn't so bad. Twenty years from now, thirty or fifty, there could be a neo-imperial movement that holds her up as an example to be emulated. Blowing her up will make her a martyr, but a trial will show her up as a monster, warts and all. Elskal chewed her lower lip for a moment, then shook her head. Well, I hate to admit it, but you're actually making some sense. I must need a vacation. We all need a vacation. Okay, we'll find some resort on a world where the Empire is just a nasty rumor, if we survive this assault of yours. When we survive it, you mean? Elskal smiled. Right, when we survive it. I hope, though, you aren't expecting me to go in there with my selector level on stun. Ain't going to happen. 
Ayala retrieved her carbine and slid a power pack home. If it shoots back, I'm shooting to kill. With Voru, Isard, or Dalarit, I'll go for a stun shot. But only if that's not going to get me or anyone else killed. Your plan calls for more finesse than the bomb, but I guess we can make it work. We will. Ayala nodded solemnly. Two days until Typhira regains its freedom, and Isan Isard loses hers. 35. Captain Joak Dreiso let a low, sinister laugh fill the dark hollow of the ready room on the Luzankia. He recalled with holographic clarity the image of the executor plunging into the heart of the half-completed Death Star at Endor. He'd known at that point that the battle was lost, so he'd taken his virulence and fled from the battle. I always knew I would have another chance to crush rebels. He didn't believe for an instant the fiction that Antilles and his people were outcasts from the New Republic. Theirs was obviously a mission meant to keep Isard bottled up until they could deal with her, and Antilles had done a good job of keeping her attention on him. Had he not preoccupied her, she might have seen the wisdom of creating an imperial combine, bringing together the various warlords out there to put an end to the New Republic. It would have been very successful, he was certain of that, and she could have even led it, because she possessed what everyone else wanted, Bacta. Isard's short-sightedness in this regard didn't surprise Dreiso, primarily because she thought like a politician, not a warrior. Isard took great delight in being subtle and tricky, then when she decided to wield a hammer, she did it in a very clumsy manner. Sending Convarian out to destroy Halinid was a wasted gesture. An assault shuttle and a squadron of ties could have laid waste to that settlement. The attack did nothing but salve her ego and anger Antilles. He would have handled things entirely differently. Dryso had agreed a strike was necessary, but he would have gone after Corellia and brought the Dictat to heel, adding Corellia and its shipyards to the Iceheart Empire. That would supply them the means of building more ships. He would have then badgered Kuat into making a similar deal, giving him access to those shipyards. And then on to Sluis Van. Once I have those three sites under my control, I can strangle the new republic by restricting trade. Without ships and shipyards, nothing moves between stars. Dryso had chosen to stay with Isard because he thought she represented the best chance at re-establishing the Empire, and because she had the most legitimate claim to the throne itself. He had supported her decision to abandon Coruscant. A world that does not provide the means to wage war is worth little in a war. The New Republic's conquest of it did hamper the rebellion, and Isard's possession of the Bacta cartel put her in a very powerful position in the galaxy. Unfortunately, her power is embodied by this ship. Dryso caressed the arms of the command chair in which he sat. Only through this ship can she project her power to other worlds, command their compliance, and punish their defiance. Now this ship is mine, and thus is her power ceded to me. The comlink clipped to his jacket beeped. Dryso here. Captain, five minutes to reversion to real space. On my way to the bridge. Dryso stood and strode from the ready room to a turbo lift for the short ride up to the bridge. As the lift slowed, he composed himself, setting his face with a stern expression. The door opened and he immediately strode out onto the captain's walk. Report, Lieutenant Rosian. The chief navigator looked up from the pit where he worked. We're coming in as scheduled. The station is in orbit around Yagdul, occupying an orbit outside of that of the largest of Yagdul's three moons, with its position always opposite that moon. We are coming in on the only good entry vector that won't run us afoul of the world, its moons, or the system's sun. The station should be clear for an attack once we close into range. Very good. Dryso glanced over at his communications officer. 
Enzignesti, when we revert to real space, please inform the virulence that we expect it to come in below us at a range of 20 kilometers. Inform Captain Varsha she is not to power her weapons up, except under my direct order. As ordered, Captain. Dryso continued to walk forward until he reached the viewing station. The light tunnel through which the ship sped began to break down into long shafts of light. They, in turn, resolved themselves into unwavering gemstones set in a black blanket. Directly ahead of the ship's distant prow, the system's sun burned brightly. Yogdul and its moons appeared as colorful spheres hanging in space. Silhouetted against Yogdul's gray face, the space station appeared to be little more than a cross, insignificant and defenseless. Captain, we're showing signs of snub fighter deployment at this station. Very well. Tell Colonel Arl he is free to deploy his fighters in a defensive screen. Have you spotted the Alderanian war cruiser yet? Negative, reported Dryso's aide. We are clear for a hundred kilometers around us, and Virulence is reporting similar clearance. Push the sensor sphere out to two hundred kilometers, Lieutenant Warowen, and keep scanning the fringes of the system for that war cruiser. Time to engagement? Ten minutes to range. Bring our shields up to full. As ordered, sir. Dryso stroked his goatee as he watched the station grow larger. The scrambling of the station's snub fighters did not surprise him. That was the only reaction they could have, which is why he countered with deploying his fighters in a screen. It would be difficult for the X-Wings to work their way through his screen, and while engaging in dogfights, all but impossible for them to maintain the sort of unit cohesion needed for a crushing volley of proton torpedoes to be launched at his ship. While proton torpedoes and concussion missiles were certainly a danger to his ship, they were only a danger in vast quantities, far more than three dozen snub fighters could possibly deliver. Captain, the snub fighters are going to light speed. Thank you, Warowen. Please confirm they are outbound for Typhira. His aide's surprise rang through his reply. Yes, sir, that's it exactly. Good. They will arrive there after twelve hours in tiny cockpits, short on fuel and sleep. The Typhirans can deal with them. We'll make certain they have no place to return to. Light laughter greeted his comment. Then the communications officer raised his voice above the din. Captain, we have an incoming message from the station. Dryso turned and pointed to a holo projector pad to his left. Please, Ensign Yesti, route it here. As the image began to resolve itself into that of a tall man with one artificial eye, Dryso raised himself to his full height. This is Captain Joak Dryso of the Luzankia. Your fighters have deserted you. I sent the fighters off to play with something more their size. The tall man's hologram posted its fists on its hips. I'm Booster Tarek, and this is my station. Your rate of closure puts you five minutes out from your preferred range for this sort of operation. I'll give you those five minutes before I destroy your ship. You're rather bold, Tarek, for having a station with minimal shields, a half dozen laser cannons, and ten turbo laser batteries. Tarek's image laughed. We've made some modifications to the station. The figure nodded to someone outside the image area. Dryso felt the Luzankia rock a bit. He immediately signaled for Yesti to cut off the transmission. Then he snarled at his aide. What happened? They powered up a gravity well projector. It's projecting a cone of energy in our direction. It can't hurt us. The bump was just our own gravity keeping generators adjusting the gravity on the ship. We have no damage or injury reports coming in. Dryso frowned. The only thing the gravity well projector did was prevent them from turning and going to light speed while still in the cone. Lieutenant Rosian, compute hyperspace solutions for me. That will be difficult, sir. Because of Yagdul's density, the array of the moons and the gravity cone were severely limited in our choices. All we can do is run away from the plane of the elliptic until we escape the current constraints on us, then head out. 
If you want us to return to Typhira, our best bet would be to get free, take a short jump to the edge of the system, and then head back on our entry vector, since that is the fastest route to Typhira. Something else is going on here. Lieutenant Warowin, shift assets to scan the edges of the system along our entry exit vector. Yes, sir. Dryso turned to watch his red-haired aide work. The young man's pale complexion drained further of color. Sir, I have a small task force on the system rim. It is composed of snub fighters and freighters and maybe a larger ship. An ambush? Perhaps. No, wait. Sir, the ships are outbound toward Typhira. Exit speed is consistent with that of the freighters or our own ships. Dryso nodded, then turned back toward the viewport. His assessment of Antilles' tactics had been correct. The man opted to send part of his force to Typhira. The fact that the freighters had been waiting at the edge of the system indicated that Antilles had indeed anticipated their strike. Even with freighters and the war cruiser in support of his operation, he can do little to hurt Typhira. His troops will be tired because of the journey and unable to fight well. Moreover, once I destroy this station, I can return to Typhira. I will arrive shortly after he does and pounce on his forces, destroying them. The gravity well will buy him some time, but not enough. Dryso pointed to the holopad. Yes, D, open a comm channel with the station. Lieutenant Rosian, bring us to range and have us hold there, please. As ordered, Captain. Engines all stop. Tarek's image appeared again on the Luzankia's bridge. I notice you've stopped, Captain Dryso. Do you have surrender on your mind? Dryso smiled. I do. Yours. Tarek's anticipatory smile faded into puzzlement. I guess you think we don't want to fight. Believe me, we do. Again, he gestured to someone outside the image area, and a much heavier tremor shook the Luzankia. As your people will tell you, we've just powered up all of our tractor beams and have them on you. You can try to break free, but if you do, I've got to see a man about a guarantee he gave me. You better hope he works fast. Rosian, engines full back. Break those locks. Can't, sir. Helm is sluggish and those beams are very powerful. Dryso snarled at Tarek. You give me only one choice. Good. The terms of surrender are... No, you fool. My choice is your complete destruction. Weapons all bear on the station. Fire on my command. Emperor's black bones. Dryso whipped around and spitted Lieutenant Warrowin with a harsh stare, but his aide remained engrossed by a monitor and missed it. What is happening, Warrowin? Sir, we have multiple proton torpedo and concussion missile sensors locked onto us. How many? Many, sir, over three hundred. Warrowin looked up. We're dead, sir. Dryso turned back to the viewport and imagined the rippling fire of three hundred proton torpedoes and concussion missiles smashing into his forward shield. Under that onslaught, it would collapse and the missiles would begin nibbling away on his ship. And that's only the first volley. The subsequent volleys would consume the Luzankia utterly and completely. With Dryso's vision of disaster came the crumbling of his plans for the future. The Luzankia was the key to everything, but he'd been tricked. Antilles had anticipated the strike at the station. He had set a trap to destroy the Superstar Destroyer, even if I do shoot and eliminate some of the launchers, some of the tractor beams, all that will get away will be a severely damaged ship. Dryso hesitated, and that hesitation should have lost him his ship and his dreams. Two kilometers off his bow, the virulence lanced upward, eclipsing the station. All of a sudden, the Imperial Star Destroyer began to shrink, but it was only when he saw stars flashing back into sight at the corners of his vision did he realize why it was disappearing. They're not destroying my ship. We're speeding away from the station. Engines are still at full reverse. 
The virulence broke the locks by interposing itself between us and the station. Dryso smiled and tasted sweat in the corners of his mouth. We're free of the trap Antilles laid for us. He thought he had found a way to destroy us, but he did not. Now we get to spring a trap on him. The Luzankia's captain turned to face his bridge crew. Grosian, plot a course back to Typhira as fast as we can get there. Yesti, send virulence our thanks. Tell them their sacrifice will be remembered, a sacrifice that allowed us to destroy Wedge Antilles and hasten the Empire's rebirth. Warwin looked up at him, disbelieving. We're not going to help them, sir? They're just doing their duty, Lieutenant. Dryso's mouth soured with the fear of ever engaging the station. We now go to do ours. 36. By the time the Luzankia reverted to real space, Captain Dryso had constructed a complete rationalization for his actions. He knew it was just that, the thin fabric of facts, circumstances, and lies that would probably crumble under Isard's scrutiny. The fact remained, though, that he needed an explanation, and it was the best he could come up with. It all started with the premise that Antilles' station would kill the Luzankia. This he knew, and had the sensor reports to back it up. Isard herself had made it very clear that preserving the Luzankia was vital, so disengaging, when given the opportunity to do so, was the only choice he had. With the station being as heavily armed as it was, the only prudent course of action would be to cordon it off and let the inhabitants starve until they chose to surrender. Once disengagement had been mandated, the next course of action had also been obvious. He had sensor reports to indicate Antilles, the war cruiser, and dozens of freighters had headed out for Typhira. That was a much larger task force than Isard had anticipated being used against Typhira. Only by returning home at flank speed could the Luzankia be in position to destroy that task force. In fact, it seemed rather obvious that without the Luzankia's help, the Typhiran Home Defense Corps would be overwhelmed. He had no choice but to return to Typhira. He realized that abandoning his TIE fighters at Yagdul could be criticized, but he could even explain that away. The TIEs were meant to supplement the virulence's defenses. The fighters could track and shoot down missiles before they could strike the Imperial Star Destroyer. He also expected them to get in close enough to the station to destroy launchers and then complete the destruction of the station. That his pilots were dead if both the station and the virulence were destroyed meant little to him. They had their duty to do just as he had his. If he remained to pick them up, he would have been destroyed. Standing before the bridge viewport, he anticipated reversion into a battlefield. As the light tunnel melted away into a scattering of stars, he saw the green and white ball of Typhira above him. No X-wings swooped about. No ties filled the void with green laser fire. He saw nothing out of the ordinary, just freighter traffic and a few system patrols. Dryso slammed a fist off the transparasteel viewport. He'd been had by Antilles. The feint at Typhira had drawn him off, causing him to sacrifice the virulence. The rogues probably abandoned the station except for a handful of volunteers who were willing to trade their lives for that of the virulence. The convoy I saw heading away from Yagdul probably moved to another base, a base we'll have to search out, all the while enduring more hit-and-run attacks by the rogues. Lieutenant Warowen's voice cut through the cocoon of mortification closing around Dryso's mind. Captain, we have an Imperial Star Destroyer reverting to real space 25 kilometers to our aft. How did Varsha get the virulence out of there? Dryso looked over at the holer projector pad. Yesti, open a comm channel to that ship. Captain Varsha, how did you get away? It took him a moment to recognize the holographic image facing him, but when he did, he felt a cold hand tighten around his heart. Captain Dryso, I fear you've mistaken my freedom for your virulence. 
Captain Sayer Yonka smiled at him. Don't say you're happy to see me. You won't be. Captain Dryso, the Freedom is deploying snub fighters, X-Wings, and uglies. Dryso stopped before he ordered his own non-existent fighters into battle. Contact the planet and have the THDC squadron scrambled. I want all their fighters up here protecting me. Helm, bring us about to engage the Freedom. He pointed a finger at Yonka's image. I don't think, sir, when all is said and done, you will be happy that I've seen you. The abundant undergrowth around the Zook for a corporate headquarters provided Ayala and her people the means to get within 25 meters of the back entrance. They had expected to walk up to it, set a little lock-popping charge on it, blow it open, and be inside before much of an alarm could be raised. Ten meters along the corridor beyond the transparasteel door, they'd be in the building's security center and would be able to control alarms and access to corridors and turbo lifts. But now there are two stormtroopers standing guard at the door. At first glance, they looked to be the genuine articles, but Ayala noticed they chatted back and forth quite a bit. THDC banthas in rank or clothing. Even so, the strip of open ground she needed to cover was enough that the guards, no matter how poorly trained, should be able to cut her down. Because they had been prepared for a close assault, none of her people carried a blaster rifle, just carbines and pistols, so killing both of them from cover was impossible. We might hit them with carbine shots at this range, but the armor means we don't have a guaranteed kill. She needed a diversion, but the only real option she had was to use an explosive charge to distract them. The problem with that idea was that if it didn't kill them, they'd undoubtedly report the explosion, providing more of an alert to the forces inside than she wanted. She reached for her comm link to ask Elskull to divert some of her people to help out, when a TIE fighter screamed overhead at treetop level. As a second and third TIE screeched past, Ayala saw the door guards look up and point at the starfighters. One even took his helmet off to get a better look, tucking his headgear under his arm. Without a second thought, Ayala stood and strode from the undergrowth in their direction, shielding her carbine from sight with her body and turning her head to likewise watch the starfighters fly past. A full dozen of the fighters roared out of their hangar, letting Ayala know Wedge and his people had finally arrived. Now, if I can just do my part. She looked up at the guards, smiling at them, as she reached the base of the stairs leading to the door. Excuse us, ma'am, but you can't be here. The helmetless guard leaned his blaster carbine against the wall and began to fumble with his helmet again. A restricted area. Oh, sorry. Ayala reinforced her smile, then brought her blaster carbine up. She scythed fire back and forth, burning holes in the white plastoid armor over the guards' chests and bellies. The helmet fell from lifeless hands and bounced down the ferrocrete stairs as she ran up past it. She stepped over the body of one guard, then leveled her carbine at the door's lock and triggered a burst of scarlet fire that vaporized it. Before she could push the door in with her foot, two Ashern Vratics reached the landing. With their powerful legs, they kicked the guards' bodies off the landing. Brandishing blaster pistols fitted with adapters to accommodate their thick-fingered hands, the Asheran warriors bulled their way through the door and stalked down the hallway. The security station's duraplast door crumpled beneath a Vratix kick. The Vratix went in, and lurid blue backlighting accompanied their assault. Ayala arrived at the doorway seconds behind them and went in with her carbine ready, but all three of the Zook for security police were out. Two had never even had a chance to draw their blasters, and all three lay in pools of steaming calf. Definitely picked the wrong time to be taking a break. Secure them so they won't be a problem when they wake up. Two human resistance fighters complied with their orders, while a third dropped into the chair at the center of the building's security console. Can you shut this place down, Jesfa? Can a Vratix jump? The dark-haired commando pointed at the twin banks of four monitors atop the console. These provide views of various sites around the building, one for each of six floors and the two towers. I can see everything, and 
he added as he settled his fingers on the keyboard. From here, I can shut everything down. This is the same system I used to use when I worked security for Zalton. Good. Lock everything down except for one turbo lift. Secure the shuttle hangers in the towers and open up the main entrance. Consider it done. I'll shift my comm link to TAC-2 so I can keep you apprised of anything I see. Ayala smiled. Do that, but don't be surprised if they shoot the holocams out. I would. She patted him on the shoulder, then fished her comm link out of her pocket. Hook to blade. We're in. The way is clear for you. On our way, Hook. Elskall sounded happy for the first time Ayala could remember. Good work. Eurysi Glarit's anger at having her squadron last in the long line of Typhiran Home Defense Corps flyers heading out to engage the rebels made her tighten her grip on the interceptor's controls. Might Squadron, a group of green pilots that shared hangar facilities with her elite squadron, had been scrambled immediately. They take their name to mean strength, but we've always considered it the answer to the question, will they fight? She'd had to place a call to Isard's office to find out why her pilots had not been called up, but no one there answered. Exercising the discretion her position gave her, Arisi immediately scrambled her own squadron. Better were destroyed in space than destroyed on the ground. The instant she became airborne, Arisi pulled tactical data from ground control and didn't like what she saw. An Imperial Star Destroyer and an Alderanian war cruiser were moving to engage the Lusankia. The Imperial Star Destroyer had rolled and was flying along so its hull was perpendicular to that of the Lusankia. This would allow the Imp Star's port gunners to be shooting down the top of the Super Star Destroyer. The Alderanian war cruiser worked back toward the Lusankia's aft, and once it worked its way in past the system's freighter traffic, it would be able to attack the larger ship's engines. The snub fighters deployed by the Imp Star were closing in formation on the Luzankia. The THDC fighter squadrons coming up to oppose them were not flying together, but were strung out so the rogues would engage them piecemeal. That's suicidal. Erisi punched up a tactical frequency on her comm unit. Elite lead to Vera lead. Slack your speed and let Might Squadron join up with you. No can do, Elite Lead. We have our orders. Consider them countermanded. Makes sense. This is Rogue Squadron you're facing. And it's Rogue Squadron we'll be killing. For the glory of Typhira. Arisi popped her comm unit over the tactical frequency the Elites used. Stay tight, Elites. We're going for the Rogues. Let's hope our comrades tire them out. Wedge watched the tactical feed coming from the Valiant and felt a cold chill creep up his spine. What are they doing? Why are they coming in at us like that? His R5 unit whistled curtly. Wedge glanced at his monitor and smiled. That was a rhetorical question, Gate. You wouldn't have sufficient data to be able to calculate an answer. After his last outing, Wedge had let the techs wipe Minuk's memory and upgrade his software. Because of the modifications Ray made on the droid, he also learned the droid's designation had been changed to R5G8, which he just truncated into gate. Give me a check on the transponder. Another quick whistle announced it was in full working order. Wedge keyed his comm unit. Thirty seconds to the first wave of ties. Remember, our goal is to get at the Lizankia, not to spend our time dogfighting up here. Kill what you must, but keep with the mission. Two, stay with me. As ordered, lead, came Asser's reply. Wedge flicked his lasers over to dual fire mode, picked a target among the incoming ties, then waited for his aiming reticle to go red. As it did, he tightened up on the trigger, letting two bursts of fire go, then dove away from the hissing green laser fire splashing against his forward screen. His maneuver prevented him from seeing what happened to his target, but Gate dispassionately flashed the message, Target Eliminated, in blood-red letters at the bottom of the monitor. Maybe Minarch wasn't really that bad. Wedge glanced at his sensor readouts and saw only a pair of ties in his wake. Everyone got one, 
Nice shooting. He decided to leave the other two for the Twi'lek Chirdaki pilots, following them in. Gate hooted at him. Thanks, Gate. I've got 30 seconds to the next tie wave. He opened the tactical comm channel. Tighten it up, rogues. Two more squadrons, then we should be clear to go in. 37. Corrin suppressed a laugh. Only two more flights lead? I count five, including one of the squints. Agreed, Nine, but there is a two-minute gap between three and four, and another two minutes between five and the squints. I thought we could use that time to down the Luzankia. With your permission. Granted, lead. Corrin hauled back on his stick as the second TIE flight came in, then barrel rolled to starboard and came over the top. The X-Wing pointed itself straight at a pair of TIEs that broke to follow his climb, but his inversion brought him in below their flight arc. One of them tried to pull a quick loop to bear down in on him, while the other tried to force his TIE fighter down into a dive to spot Corrin again. Corrin triggered two quad bursts of fire at the diving tie. Two of the four laser bolts in the first shot missed, but the other two seared scars along the bottom of the starboard hexagonal wing. The second burst struck the bottom of the ball cockpit, slicing off the bottom third of it and severely warping the fighter's structural elements. The twin ion engines ripped free of their supports and blew through the cockpit canopy, then exploded. Corrin rolled away to port to escape the blast, then hit the right rudder pedal and brought the X-Wing's nose around to starboard. The looping tie came out of its maneuver and spitted itself on his aiming reticle. It went red and Corrin triggered a shot at it. All four laser bolts converged on its starboard solar panel and punched through to the cockpit. Corrin saw a brief flash of light, then the tie started a corkscrew down toward Typhira. Ten has the next flight, Nine. Corrin tucked his X-Wing back in behind and to port of Ural's fighter. The Gand rolled his X-Wing up on the port stabilizers, presenting the incoming ties with a very narrow profile to shoot at. Corrin aped his maneuver and watched as four ties separated themselves from the rest of the formation to come after Ural. He glanced at his sensors. Whistler, why didn't you say we were getting ahead of the rest? The droid hooted a quick response. I would too have listened to you. Corrin keyed his comm unit. Ten, we're all alone here for a bit. Ural understands, Nine. Corrin caught an edge to Ural's voice he couldn't recall hearing before. Ural has them. Ural has them? That sounds like something Jace or I would say. Ahead of him, Ural triggered a quick burst of quad fire that hit a tie in the cockpit canopy and blew the engines out the back of it. A little etheric rudder shifted his aim point to port, then a second shot disintegrated another tie's port solar panel. Ural rolled out to port, then dove below the remaining ties. Sith spawn, that's great flying. Corrin inverted his X-wing and pulled back on the stick to follow Ural's dive but by then the Gand had started his fighter around in a grand loop. Corrin rolled again to follow, but a sharp bleat from Whistler made him glance at his aft monitor. Ten, your playmates are on my tail. Oral copies, Nine. Continue on your arc. Continue? They're coming up fast. No longer. Up ahead, Corrin saw Oral's X-Wing tighten its arc impossibly quick, swapping nose for tail in the space of 200 meters. The ship remained inverted, so Corrin couldn't see the cockpit, but he could imagine the Gand's mouthparts moving apart in his imitation of a smile. Ready to break on your mark, Ten. Go to port, Nine. Mark. Corrin rolled to port, then, as Ural had done, he reversed his thrust. Instead of looping the ship, Corrin applied rudder until his nose swung back along the path he had just traveled. He came about just in time to see Ural melt the wing off another tie. Its wingman dove abruptly away from the Gand's trap. Great shooting, Ten. You've got a hot hand. Thank you, Nine. Three flight, want to tighten it up here? As ordered, lead. Corrin started his thrust, pushing his fighter forward. 
Come on, Ural. We've got a big target now. Captain Dreisel watched the holopad's display of the battle. Helm Freedom is trying to slash over the top of us. Roll us so we can track her. Captain, if you do that, we'll expose our ventral surface to the snub fires. I know that, Helm. Dreisel looked over at the beefy man heading up his gunnery command. Guns, use our ion cannons on Freedom. I want that ship. Captain, Guns copies your order, but requests you reconsider. Dreiso's eyes narrowed. We have more ion cannons than that ship has guns, Lieutenant Gorev. I want it, and you'll give it to me. I don't want to destroy it unless necessary. Until he's got one of our imp stars, now we'll have one of his. What about the snub fighters and the war cruiser? Use our concussion missiles. Use all our turbo lasers and heavy turbo laser batteries. The snubs are too small for turbo lasers to track them. The war cruiser is in our aft, so my missiles are having difficulty finding firing solutions. By all that's imperial, you'll find solutions, Lieutenant Gorev, or someone else will be in your position. Do you understand? Dreiso's hand rose with his voice. Understand me, people. This is a superstar destroyer. A handful of snub fighters and a ship a tenth of our size cannot hurt us. Do what you are told, and victory will be ours. Fleury Voru had seen the TIE interceptors flash past the viewports of his office and knew the time to make his escape from Typhira had come. My shuttle is hyperspace capable. I run suborbital to the far side of the planet, wend my way clear of obstructions, and vanish. He collected a fistful of data cards and tucked them inside his tunic. He reached the door to his office and found it wouldn't open. He quickly punched a security override code into the locking mechanism and it opened. In his outer office, he found two stormtroopers and his secretary trying to open the door to the hallway. Stand back. Alicia, please do yourself a favor and duck behind your desk. When they come for you, tell them horrible stories about me and they will protect you. As the blonde did as she was told, the stormtroopers came to attention. You two will accompany me to my shuttle hangar in the East Tower. Voru punched a security override code into the lock, and it opened as well. Stepping into the hallway, he pointed out the security holocams at either end of the hallway. Destroy them. With a volley of shots, his guards complied with his order, and Voru realized they were just Home Defense Corps personnel. Of course, the amount of clattering their armor makes could have told me that. He waved them on after him and quickly worked his way toward the east end of the building, shooting holocams as they went. Since the locks only respond to security override codes, we'll have to assume the Asheron are in the building. They will control the turbo lift, so we'll be using stairs. Varu ignored the grumbles from his escort and got them to the East Tower without meeting any resistance. So far, very good. He forced one of them to precede him up the stairs and had the other one follow, but the precaution proved unnecessary as they saw no one and nothing while they climbed up two floors. They emerged from the stairwell on the hangar level. Down around the corner to the right, hurry, I hear the engines powering up. This did not please Voru, since he had intended to pilot the shuttle himself, primarily because he was the only pilot he wanted to know his final destination. The fact that the shuttle had already begun to power up meant someone else had decided to use his means of escape, which created a huge set of complications to be dealt with. Voru's displeasure with the situation bled into his words, causing his guards to sprint on ahead of him and around the corner to the hangar. A volley of scarlet blaster bolts sent the armored guards tumbling back down the hallway. They slammed into the wall and rebounded, but were hit by a half dozen more shots before they landed on the floor. One laser carbine came spinning across the floor to trip Voru up. He crashed down hard, but bit back a curse and thereby saved his own life. From the ground he had a narrow view of the hangar and the cloaked forms of two of Isard's royal guards walking from the doorway over toward his shuttle. Isard, she's using my shuttle to escape. 
How dare she? Voru snatched up the blaster that had tripped him, then sprinted into the hangar. At point-blank range, he shot both of the men in scarlet armor in the back, then dove for cover as the shuttle's laser cannon sprayed the hangar with bolts. He felt the hot backblast of the shuttle's maneuvering jets as it lifted off, then emptied the blaster's power cell by pumping shot after shot into the vanishing shuttle's shields. Voru tossed the useless blaster aside and rose from the floor. She probably thinks I'm stuck here, but I'd have been as stupid as she is if I only had one bolt hole. He towed one of the royal guards, then flipped the body over and pulled the blaster carbine it had been lying on from the floor. I will survive this, Isan Isad, if for no other reason than to make you pay for the trouble you've given me. As Corrin's X-Wing raced in on the Luzankia, the Superstar Destroyer began to roll. Lead, what do we do? Stay on target. We may not be edge on anymore, but we can hit the guns from below. Commence weave, 30 seconds to firing position. Corrin rolled his fighter to starboard, opening up some room between himself and Ural. He pulled back on his stick and nudged it to port, throwing the X-Wing into a spiral the pilots referred to as a weave. The fighter's movements were not wholly regular, making it all but impossible for the Luzankia's gunners to get a good shot at them. Of course, one good shot with those heavy turbo lasers and all the Bacta in the galaxy couldn't help me. The Luzankia's heavy weapons filled the void with countless bolts of green laser energy. The shots spiraled out as crews tried in vain to target the incoming snub fighters. Corrin studied the bases of the cones, mentally recording the location of each battery. Those are what make this mountain of metal dangerous. Destroy them and it's just a big box in space. Despite the spiral, getting a target lock on the Luzankia was not hard at all. Corrin shifted his weapons control over to proton torpedoes and linked them for dual fire. The box at the center of his head-up display went red immediately, and Whistler sounded a constant tone indicating target lock. Good, Whistler, good. He punched a button on his communication console that started green, then quickly shifted to red. Nine has double lock. I'm firing. Launch nine, then get clear. As ordered, lead. Corrin pulled the trigger on his stick and watched two proton torpedoes streak away at their target. Pull the Luzankia's fangs and hope we don't get gummed to death on the way out. 38. Dryso stared down at his aide. How many incoming torpedo tracks, Lieutenant Warrowin? Twenty, sir. Two per X-wing. Survivable. You see, only twenty. Wait, sir, I have twenty-four. No matter. Now I have forty, no, eighty, eight zero. Dryso's jaw dropped as he saw a Nova flare blossom up over the horizon of his starboard bow. The shields held for a second or two, then collapsed. Warning sirens started shrieking on the bridge as multiple torpedo and missile hits exploded six kilometers away on the ship's bow. The brilliant fire gnawed at the clean lines of his ship, shattering armor plates and triggering dozens of secondary and tertiary explosions. Even before the tremors reached the bridge, Dryso started shouting orders. Warwin, kill those sirens! Give me damage control reports! Guns, what have you lost and why haven't you gotten me the freedom yet? Warwin's voice rose above the din. Captain, we have full bow shield collapse! How did they get that many missiles off, Lieutenant? Sir, I don't know, sir. Sith spawn, find out how. Dryso watched as the Freedom fired down at the Superstar Destroyer. Salvos of red turbolaser bolts pulsed out from the smaller ship, savaging the Luzankia's unprotected bow. Vaporized armor immediately condensed into metal clouds that hid the full extent of the damage done. But Dryso had no hopes that his bow would look like anything but a blackened, battered lump. Still, that damage is nothing compared to what we can do. 
Over a hundred starboard ion cannons fired back at the Freedom in a display so massive it appeared as if sheets of blue energy had erupted from the Luzankia side. The Imperial Star Destroyer's shields imploded, leaving azure lightning to skip and arc all over the ship's surface. Dryso saw secondary explosions ripple through the smaller ship's port gun decks, letting him know the Freedom had been badly hurt. Captain, I I've lost 15% of my starboard firepower. Thank you, guns. Lieutenant Warowin, where did those missiles come from? The freighters, sir. They're launching missiles that appear to be using the starfighter telemetry to target us. Warowin glanced at his monitors. Sir, I can reestablish the bow shield, but it will lower our protection elsewhere. Do it, Warowin. Guns forget the freedom. Kill the freighters. Dryso clasped his hands at the small of his back. The freighters are our main threat now. Kill them and this battle is over. Tycho Selchu rolled his X-wing to port, then pulled back on his stick. He cruised in on the trail of a TIE fighter and pulled the trigger. Two bursts of dual-fire lasers shot out, stabbing deep into the engine assembly. He rolled quickly to starboard and dove, clearing the exploding TIE's blast radius. You still with me, Eight? Nawara Ven's voice came back a little less calm than Tycho would have wanted. With you, Seven, just barely. New flight, Eight, then our second run on the Luzonkia. You take lead. As ordered, Seven. Tycho throttled back a bit to let Nawara Ven pass him. Then he sideslipped to the left and took up a position in Nawara's port aft arc. Coming back off the first run on the Superstar Destroyer, the X-Wings had boiled into the fourth TIE flight. Between them and the Twi'lek Chirdaki, the TIEs never had a chance. As they closed on the fifth flight, it lost unit cohesion as four of the pilots pulled away and headed back toward the incoming interceptors. Only eight out here, Noara. Choose your target carefully. Got one in mind, Seven. Noara's X-Wing remained straight and level as it raced in toward the ties. Tycho began to wince. Head to head is usually a winner for us, but it burns some shields. In this environment, I'm not so sure that's wise. Noara's X-Wing snap-rolled up onto the starboard stabilizer foils, then fired four dual bursts of lasers at its target. The first two missed wide, as did the ties return fire but the last two hit the tie dead on. Two of the bolts sheared the starboard solar panel in half, while the other two peeled back the flesh of the cockpit. The tie started a crazy tumble through space, and suddenly Tycho found himself through the line of ties and clear to run on the Luzankia. Lead seven and eight are going in. I copy seven. Tycho rolled left to give Nawara more room, then put his ship into a weave. Coming in at the Luzankia from the front, he dropped his aiming reticle on the blackened portion of the ship's bow. Guttering flames indicated places where the ship was leaking atmosphere. Tycho picked a particularly bright torch as his aim point. He shifted over to missiles and immediately got a keening target lock tone from his astromech. Seconds later, he got a red light from his telemetry transponder. Double lock for seven. Two away. He pulled the trigger, sending two proton torpedoes streaking on jets of blue flame at the Luzankia. From all around the larger ship, other blue lights suddenly ignited and began to cruise in toward the point Tycho had targeted. From the very beginning of their operations, Wedge and Tycho had agreed that the only way they could defeat the Luzankia was to overwhelm it with proton torpedoes and concussion missiles. The problem they had was that to do the job correctly, they would require 12 or more X-Wing squadrons, squadrons they didn't have. Taking a lesson from the conquest of Coruscant, they decided that freighters equipped with launchers and missiles would give them the launching platforms they needed. By slaving the freighters' missiles to the X-Wing telemetry, they eliminated the need for target acquisition sensors on the freighters, the use of which would have immediately designated the freighters as targets for the Luzankia. To prevent anyone from figuring out their strategy, Wedge had Booster buy launchers, munitions, and sensor units from Talon Card. Reluctant to buy something and not use it, 
Booster hooked the sensors up to the station, noting that just lighting them up would be enough to make even the Luzankia think twice about engaging the station. As their plans evolved, Booster agreed to stay behind and make the Luzankia think it had been trapped while the rogues left the system, rendezvoused with Ser Yonka's freedom, and rode the rest of the way in relative comfort to Typhira. The freighters moved on in to set up the ambush, while the Freedom waited at the fringes of the system for the arrival of the Luzankia. Tycho's missiles exploded against the ship's shields, but they buckled quickly enough as the rest of the missiles locked into his telemetry hit the ship. Noara's shots likewise raced in, sowing explosions over the ship's surface. Other rogues continued the assault on the ship's starboard gun decks, destroying turbo lasers, ion cannons, and concussion missile launchers. If we can kill Luzankia's ability to strike from one side, our ships can operate with impunity. Toward the other end of the Superstar Destroyer, Tycho saw the Alderanian war cruiser Valiant pour fire into the ship. The Luzankia's tail guns exchanged shots with the Valiant, but Errol Nunn's droid crew managed to maneuver the smaller ship so shots impacted against shields that were still strong. The Superstar Destroyer's aft shields appeared to be holding but the Valiant's constant battery had to be draining energy that could have been used elsewhere to great effect. Rolling to port and diving, Tycho sailed his fighter beneath some return fire and noticed the Luzankia had begun to strike out at the freighters. They presented a diverse choice of targets and began to scatter as the big ship turned its guns on them. Evasive maneuvers as per orders, but that's going to make missile launching tougher. He glanced at his monitor. Only two missiles left anyway. Enough for one more run. He checked the location of the interceptor squadron, but saw it had not closed as quickly as anticipated. Lead, Seven is set for one more run. Negative, Seven. The squints have picked up a lamb and are running it clear of here. You and Nine, with your wings, are to pursue. Tycho's astromech flashed a quick scan of the shuttle on his monitor. Shuttle is positive for one life form. You think that's ice hard? Like as not. She's not getting away. Go, Tycho, go. I copy, Jesfa. Ayala crouched and quickly ducked her head around the corner. She jerked her head back and rolled away as three blaster bolts gouged a divot out of the ferrocrete wall. That was closer than I have any interest in getting in the future. Ayala keyed her comlink. Your report was dead on, Jesfa. Keep telling me what holocams he's killing, and we'll get to him. Elskol came running up and dropped to one knee at Ayala's side. What have you got? Ayala jerked a thumb at the corridor. Trapped rat, it appears. Your people secured the stairwells? Yeah, he's trapped here on the fifth level. Elskol gave Ayala a half smile. Do you want us to evacuate innocence, or do we just track this guy down? Let's get him. Elskol waved a team of two men and two Vratics forward. We have a live one. Be careful. Two of Elskol's people took up positions at the mouth of the corridor. Their efforts to look down it produced no fire, so they gave the all-clear signal. The two Vratics then rushed forward to flank the only door in that hallway, and then checked it. They indicated it was locked. Elskol and Ayala went running down the hall to its end and crouched there, preparing to glance down either branch after their quarry. Ayala pressed her back against the corridor's left wall. She started to nod to Elskol, inviting her to check her end of the corridor first, but she saw movement back the way she had come. The Duraplast door exploded out into the hallway as blaster fire chewed it in half. Two bolts caught the Vratics on the right side of the door in the abdomen, spinning him further into the corridor. As the fire swung back through the doorway, the second Vratics took a pair of shots to the thorax, dropping him to the floor with his sextet of limbs twitching. The two men at the far end of the corridor came running up and rushed the doorway before Ayala or Elskol could call them off. The second man in straightened up abruptly, then flew back into the corridor, all loose-limbed and burning from a trio of shots to the chest. Of the first man, Ayala only saw booted feet that jerked twice, then lay still. 
Jesfa, get me a six-man team up here now. Ayala looked over at Elskol. We wait, right? For that guy to escape? If he got in that room, he knows override codes. He could have a secret turbo lift in there and be on his way out. I doubt it. Ayala keyed her comm link again. Jesfa, have them bring concussion grenades. Smoke drifted out of the doorway, then a blaster carbine came sailing out of it and clattered to the floor in the midst of the dead commandos. I give up. Ayala and Elskol exchanged glances. Then Ayala snapped a command. Come out with your hands in the air. Do I recognize that voice? Ayala's jaw dropped open. Fleary Voru? She slowly smiled. Voru? I am expecting those hands raised. The small white-haired man appeared in the doorway and gingerly stepped between the legs lying therein. Ah, Ayala Wessery. Someone I can trust to do the right thing. Elskol stood and leveled her blaster carbine at the man. You want the right thing? I have justice in a clip right here for you, murderer. Ayala reached up and laid a hand on Elskol's carbine. You can't. He surrendered. Surrendered? He just burned down four people. More crimes for him to be tried for. Exactly. Voru smiled rather smugly. I'm sure the people of Typhira will want to try me, if the New Republic will let them. Ayala frowned as she stood. Oh, once the New Republic is through with you, the Typhirans will have their chance. I hope you're right, Ayala, because I know the Typhiran people have a strong sense of justice. Voru's hands slipped down to the level of his shoulders. Of course, since I know which of the New Republic officials have been hoarding Bacta, and I know the backdoor deals made by member states to get Bacta, well, I suspect this is information they won't want to have come to light. Ayala laughed. You think you're not going to pay for your crimes because you'll make some political deal? Alas, Ayala, that is the reality of the situation. Ayala sharpened her laugh and her expression. You're assuming, of course, that I don't have my own brand of justice in mind. I wanted Isard because she killed my husband. If I can't have her, you'll do. She raised her carbine and pointed at his head. One shot, and a lot of crime files are closed. Foru brought his hands together and applauded her. Nice bluff, but I've read the Imperial and Corellian files on you, my dear. You could never shoot me. True. Ayala lowered her blaster. But she can. Elskol's single shot caught Voru in the throat. It pitched him against the door jam, from which he rebounded and fell on top of his blaster. Nice shooting. Elskol looked down at her blaster. I don't remember setting this weapon on stun. Ayala smiled. I do when I stopped you from shooting him the first time. Elskol frowned. Why only stun him? Why the charade? Voru always likes being in control. He was expecting you to burn him down. It would have been his victory because you would have killed a man who had surrendered, and that would make you as much of a murderer as he is. Once he realized I was out here, he decided to play another game. He was in control until the last second, when I let you shoot him. The other woman nodded, then snapped her carbine's selector lever off stun. What he said, though, about paying for his crimes is probably true. The New Republic will make a deal with him. Sure, if they get a chance. Elskol smiled. The rogues pulled him off Kessel. We can always dump him back there. No deals, only justice. Elskol laughed aloud. You know, you keep this up, and you might convince me there's more to do with unreconstructed Imperials than kill them. Let's work on it, Elskol, but only after Typhira is free. 
39. Captain Sayer Yonka picked himself up off the Freedom's bridge deck and staggered to his feet. He swiped a hand at his forehead. It came away bloody, so he tore a strip of cloth from the tail of his tunic and jammed it against the wound. Antilles, you paid me a lot, but it wasn't enough. Someone give me a report on what's going on out there. Lieutenant Carsa? Carsa's dead, sir. His monitor blew up in his face. Are we blind then, Ensign? Isn't, sir. No, sir, not blind. The Luzonki has been hit again by torps and missiles, but it's beginning to shoot at the freighters. We're being left alone. Then it's not all bad news. Yonka leaned against a bulkhead. Helm, can we maneuver? A pained voice called to him from the depths of the bridge. We've lost 50% of our maneuverability, Captain. We can roll, but speed and turns are going to be tough. I can muster enough to get us out of here, though, sir. Weapons, what's our status? We've still got most of our port weapons, sir, but starboard weaponry is shot. No realistic judgment about repairs. What's the status of our shields? A bald man punched a button on a console, then clapped his hands. Shields are coming back up. I've got 70% of power. They'll hold while we run away. Sir Yonka shook his head. We're going nowhere. Lieutenant Felly, roll us so we can bring our starboard weapons to bear. Begging your pardon, sir, but we're not being paid enough to die here. Then let's make sure we don't die. Yonka flung his arms wide open. We all knew that staying with Isard would get us killed. We also knew that if we left her service, she'd hunt us down right after she killed Antilles. Now we've got to kill the Luzankia here, or it will kill us someplace else. This isn't about money. It's about our survival, our freedom. He pointed out the main viewport. Out there you have people in freighters and snub fighters pounding on that behemoth. They're gnats compared to the Luzankia. They can sting it, but they can't kill it. That job is up to us, and we're going to do it because if we have to die, it isn't going to be dying while we're running. The Empire's dead. We all know that. So this is our buy-in to whatever follows it. Wedge saw the Freedom begin a roll as turbolaser fire lanced from the Luzankia at the freighters. One salvo caught a disc-shaped Corellian light freighter and snapped it in half. He saw shields glow and shrink as other ships got hit by one or two shots, but none exploded. He knew that was more luck than skill, and that a lot of the freighters weren't going to survive to the end of the battle. Lead to two. Time for our last run. Negative lead. I have a tie on me. Coming to. Wedge pulled back on his stick and brought his fighter up into a loop, then rolled out to starboard as Asser's X-Wing shot past. A tie streaked by, hot on her tail. As Wedge dropped in behind him, the tie fired a volley of shots that pierced Asser's left shield. Something at the back of her fighter exploded, then she rolled down and out of sight. To report. Asser didn't answer his call. Gate assess damage on two. The droid beeped a response, but Wedge ignored the information filling his secondary monitor. Got something to do first. The tie rolled to starboard, then started to climb. Wedge pulled his X-Wing into a steep climb, then snap-rolled starboard and powered the fighter over the top. The tie danced before him for a second, prompting Wedge to snap a shot off. The dual burst of lasers clipped one of the tie's solar panels, but did no serious damage. This guy is good. The tie rolled to port and pulled a tight loop back along its line of flight. Wedge let himself overshoot the tie, then throttled back as the tie swung onto his tail. The tie closed faster than the pilot expected because of Wedge's chopping the throttle back. Wedge tugged back on his stick, nosing the fighter into a climb. He held it for a second, then shoved the stick forward and broke the climb off. Green laser fire hissed off his shields, but he didn't panic. And Gate isn't screaming. 
The tie shot past his position, having started to climb to blast Wedge, then trying to follow him as he started flying straight again. Wedge pulled his X-Wing's nose back up and triggered two more bursts of laser fire. Both hit the tie in the undamaged wing, burning it free of the ship's fuselage. The hexagonal wing went one way, while the tie spun out of control toward Typhira. Wedge didn't watch to see if it exploded. He brought his fighter around and found himself staring at the broad expanse of the Luzonkia's belly. Nearly an eighth of the ship had been nibbled off at the front, but the guns still fired relentlessly. It's hurt, but not enough. Lead here, starting my third run. The fact that no one acknowledged his call sent a chill through him, but he shrugged it off. Now's not the time to mourn the dead. That waits until the mission is done. He tossed his fighter into a weave and pointed it at the giant egress hatch in the bottom of the Superstar Destroyer. We've broken your nose. Now it's a shot to the guts. Switching over to proton torpedoes, he immediately got a red box and a solid tone from Gate. He waited until his transponder button went red, then pulled the trigger. Two jets of blue fire shot away from his ship, and another half dozen joined them. It took four of them to blast a hole in the ventral shields, but that left a quartet of missiles to plow into the Luzonkia's hangar deck. The explosions spat decking and debris back out into space, then secondary explosions told Wedge that at least a couple of the tie fueled storage tanks had ruptured. Out of torpedoes, Wedge shifted over to lasers and started searching for more ties. And if there aren't any more of them, I guess I'll just have to get in close with the Luzonkia and light it up as much as I can. Yes, Madam Director, I understand. Erisi shivered as the echoes of Isard's voice died in her ears. When she'd spotted the shuttle coming up, she had harbored a hope that it was Voru. But Isard's mocking voice dashed that dream to pieces. Arisi switched her comm unit over to her squadron's tactical frequency. Elite leader to squadron, we have a new mission. Protect the Lambda-class shuttle Typhonian. We are to cover it until it gets clear and can go to light speed. Six here, lead. That means we'll be left behind. Negative six. The Lusankia is going to be following Typhonian out and will pick us up. I copy, lead. Twelve here, lead. We have four X-Wings coming up fast. I copy, Twelve. Arisi shook her head. Only four? That's a mistake you rue, Wedge Antilles. Keep your formations tight and help each other out. These pilots will be good, but we can be better. Don't lose your heads, and you won't lose your lives. Captain Dryso laughed victoriously. As nearly as he could determine, his Luzonkia had been hit by over a hundred and fifty proton torpedoes and concussion missiles, but it had lost scarcely thirty-five percent of its combat ability. Maneuvering was hampered and shield power was falling sharply, but the Luzonkia still outgunned its opposition. And the freighters have the survival rate of tom-toms on Tatooine. Lieutenant Warrowin called out to him. Captain, the freedom is coming back into the fight. Guns, let him have everything. As ordered, Captain. The Luzankia fired its starboard weapons at the Imperial Star Destroyer, mauling it mercilessly. Turbo lasers crushed the shields while ion cannon beams skittered over the freedom's hull. Concussion missiles peppered the smaller ship, opening huge holes in the hull. Explosions racked the freedom, spraying debris in all directions. Yet even before the Luzonkia's attack left the freedom adrift in space, the Imperial Star Destroyer blasted back at the Super Star Destroyer. Turbo lasers drilled through the dorsal shields and stabbed fire deep into the Luzonkia's heart. Blue ion lightning capered and danced over the hull, teasing fireballs to life in its wake. The Luzankia shook with the violence of those explosions and others. Dryso shouted at his staff. Damage reports! Warren was first. Ventral shields down, dorsal shields down, bow shields down, starboard and port shields down. 
You mean to tell me I only have aft shields? Another explosion shook the ship. Not anymore, sir. Captain, yelled his communications officer. I have a priority message from Director Isard. She's ordering us out of here. We're to follow the shuttle. What? That was the message, sir. She said you should get out of here before you get killed. Killed? Dryso's laugh quieted the bridge. Killed? We are winning here. The freedom is dead. Freighters are dying. That war cruiser is next, and we've weathered the worst those X-Wings can throw at us. We have won. She can run if she wants, but the Luzonkia stays here. If she wants to abandon Typhira, I will take her place and reap what she has sown. The crew stared at him, gape-mouthed and silent for a moment. Then a cheer spread through the bridge, beginning at Lieutenant Warwin's station and building around through the crew. For a handful of heartbeats, Dryso thought they were cheering him, but those nearest the viewport stared past him, prompting Dryso to turn. Out there, hovering off the Luzonkio's port bow, was the virulence. Dryso clapped his hands. It's the virulence, and they have our TIE squadrons. Order virulence to deploy its fighters. Now nothing stands between us and total victory. 40. Three squadrons of fighters poured from the virulence and entered the fray. Wedge's heart had sunk when Gate reported the launching of the virulence as fighters. He brought his X-Wing around and resigned himself to one last glorious battle. That imp star only carries six TIE squadrons. I all sort of figured Rogue Squadron would go out in a blaze of glory, and this looks like it is it. Gate, target me one of Virulence's fighters. The droid complied with a beep. Wedge glanced down at the image the droid painted on his monitor. Well, that's an A-wing. Gate corrected him with a bleat. Okay, I'll mark two A-wing. Wedge shook his head to clear it. A-wings? Where did I start get A-wings? A familiar voice crackled through Wedge's comm unit. Ace lead to rogue leader. Mind if we crash your party, Wedge? Pash Kraken? Where in the Emperor's dark heart did you come from? Booster's flagship. The gravity well pulled my unit out of hyperspace right on top of virulence during their little standoff. Booster talked the captain into believing it was all part of the trap, so she surrendered the ship to him. So he finally found a ship that was big enough for him. The Luzonkia is all yours, Captain Kraken. Obliged, Wedge. We're going in. Inverting and rolling out, Wedge reoriented his X-Wing toward the Luzonkia as the virulence fired a full broadside into the Superstar Destroyer. The smaller ship's turbo lasers and ion cannons wrought havoc upon the Luzonkia's port gunnery decks. A ribbon of fire raced along the port gunnel, and secondary explosions kept it alive long after the virulence's weapons stopped firing. To the Lazankia's aft, the Valiant closed to point-blank range and blasted away at the big ship's engines. Sparks cascaded away as turbo lasers drilled deep into the Superstar Destroyer. A brilliant flash eclipsed the Valiant for a moment. A violent tremor shook the Luzonkia, snapping free a blackened chunk of the bow. Fast and nimble, Pasha's A-wings slashed in at the Luzonkia. They flitted over the massive ship's surfaces, shooting concussion missiles at gunnery towers and sensor domes. Fiery craters stippled the Luzonkia in their wake. What few weapons did remain on the Luzonkia fired ineffectively at the A-wings. All of their destructive power proved impotent against a target they could not hit. Rogue lead, this is three. We're going in for a strafing run. I copy, Gavin. Wedge glanced at his monitors, but the only ties he saw were the ones escorting the shuttle. Can't catch them now. If you don't mind, three, I think I'll join you.
Closing with the squints, Corrin switched his weapons control over to lasers and linked them for dual fire. While a quad burst would be certain to burn a squint down, dual fire allowed the guns to cycle that much faster. One shot should still be a kill, but if these guys can put the maneuverability of those squints to good use, I'll need all the shots I can get. His X-Wing still had an advantage because of its shields, but that still didn't make him immune to damage. Nine, let's be careful. As ordered, seven. Ten, on me. Oral copies. Whistler, scan comm frequencies and bring up whatever one they're using. Squelch scrambled messages. I don't care what they're saying to each other. I just want to be able to talk to them. Whistler moaned in a low tone. Yes, I do think Arisi is flying with them. I want to let her know who's coming after her. The droid hooted derisively. She can decide to flame me all she wants. Doesn't matter. Corin let himself smile. She already knows I can play hard to get. She's the reason I went down on Coruscant, and I'm bringing her down here. He picked one of the squints in the middle of the formation as a target, but kept his flight path pointed as if he were preparing to attack one of the closer interceptors. As the close interceptors broke, Corrin rolled on his starboard stabilizers as if he were going to follow them, but then applied some rudder and spitted his target on his aiming reticle. He tightened up on his trigger. Two sets of bolts skewered the squint's ball cockpit. The twin ion engines exploded, launching debris into space from amid a silvery fireball. Pieces of the fighter struck sparks from Corrin's shields, but he reinforced them quickly enough. Scratch one squint. Whistler keened at him, so Corrin punched a previously unlit button on his comm unit. Hope that wasn't you, Arisi. I'd hate to think your flying skill had atrophied so much. It's my killing skill that should be concerning you, Corrin. Eight here. I have a pair on my tail. Seven on the way. Eight, hold tight. Corrin rolled and came out in a loop with Ural in his aft port quarter. Two ties were lining up for a run on Nawara's X-Wing. Tycho pulled a tight turn that brought him around quickly, but he only managed to pick off the trailing tie. Nawara broke hard to port, then twisted back again to starboard, but the squint stayed with him throughout his maneuvers. That's got to be a Reese. The interceptor fired four times, the first two pairs of green laser bolts burning through Noara's aft shield. The other two blew out the port engines and hit the fuselage right behind the cockpit. Noara's astromech exploded, then the cockpit canopy flew apart. When fire filled the cockpit, Corrin feared for the worst. Then he saw the X-Wing's command couch jet out from the stricken fighter. Eight is extravehicular! Corrin's green eyes narrowed. Ten, keep them off him. I'm going after a Reese. Whistler, give me your comm frequency again. The droid complied with the order silently. Always did pick off the easy targets, didn't you, Arisi? Couldn't stand to work hard, could you? Is that you on my tail, Corin? All alone? Her laughter filled his cockpit. I thought you'd learned from your father that dying alone wasn't something to do. That should be your concern, Reese, because I'm not dying here. Horn out. He punched the comm unit button that cut frequency off. Come on, Whistler, it's time we collect the debt she owes us. Corin's X-Wing streaked in on Reese's trail, but the squint juked and danced, making it impossible for him to get a good shot at her. As she broke to port, Corin rolled out into a long starboard loop and began a head-to-head -head run with her. The squint broke to starboard before they could close, forcing him to turn to port to pursue. Okay, she knew head-to-head -head would be suicide. As her ship began to pull away from his, Corin realized killing her wasn't going to be as easy as he expected. While she hadn't been a bad pilot in an X-Wing, she wasn't as good as he was. Her interceptor, on the other hand, has more speed and maneuverability than my X-Wing. That might give her the edge she lacked before. And she knows very well all the performance capabilities of my ship. 
Corin smiled. You don't fly against a fighter. You fly against a pilot, and her arrogance is one huge flaw I can exploit. Corin pulled his throttle back to 85% of full power, letting her stretch her lead on him. He rolled up on his port stabilizer and started a long loop that would take him back toward the main dogfight. He started in on an attack vector for one of the interceptors. While flying along it, he watched his main monitor. The rate of change for the range between his ship and Arisi's interceptor slowed as the distance stabilized. Then the distance started to decrease. The rate of change accelerated, and when the range hit three kilometers, Corin hauled back on his stick. He tightened his loop considerably, then punched his throttle forward and headed straight for her. Her hastily snapped shots splashed harmlessly over his forward shields. Corin fired back, catching her squint on the port wing. He inverted and dove, then inverted again and cruised out into a long loop that took him past Typhira's cloudy face. How badly is she hit, Whistler? The droid graphed performance statistics on the main monitor. The interceptor had suffered a 5% reduction in speed, which still left it faster than the X-Wing, but not by that much. There also appeared to be a reduction in maneuverability, but not enough to cripple her performance. This is going to take a while. Nine, are you chasing Arisi? Yes, Seven. Then is her fast. You need help? Ten is handling things, but the shuttle is running. It can clear to light speed if we don't stop it. I copy, Seven. I'm on it. He glanced at his monitor. Whistler, give me range to the freighters who were tied to my torpedo telemetry. The droid whistled mournfully. No, it's okay that they're all out of range. I didn't want them wasting any torps. Just to be on the safe side, he hit the switch that turned the telemetry transponder off then shifted his weapons control over to proton torpedoes. Coming about, he picked Arisi up and started after her again. He nudged his nose up and to port, getting a stuttering beeping from Whistler as the droid tried to get a firing solution for the interceptor. The tone went constant as the reticle went red. Corin hit the trigger and launched both torpedoes at Arisi. His last two proton torpedoes streaked out at her, and she immediately began maneuvering to avoid them. I have thirty seconds to kill her. Corin switched back to lasers, then drained energy from his aft shield and fed it into his engines. That kicked his speed up to better than that of an unhurt interceptor, allowing him to close the gap between their ships fast. As the missiles approached her interceptor, Arisi rolled to port and broke hard toward Typhira's largest moon. The missiles overshot where she had been, then turned and started in pursuit again. She kept her ship pointed straight at the bone-white moon, and as the torpedoes closed with her again, she rolled to port and pulled her fighter into a glide path that followed the rough terrain of the lunar surface. One torpedo, unable to fight inertia and lunar gravity both, slammed into the moon and exploded. The second sailed through the gout of lunar dust and started closing with the interceptor. Arisi bounced her squint up and over a ridge line and back down again, interposing it between her and the torpedo. The ridge shielded her from the torpedo's blast. It also blinded her aft sensors to Corin's presence. As Arisi pulled her squint up to climb away from the moon's surface, Corin came up over the ridge and pounced. Pairs of scarlet bolts burned into the squint, shredding both solar panels. As the stabilizer disintegrated, the interceptor's climb became a loop into a dive that brought it in on a collision course with the moon. Both engines thrusting fully, the interceptor plowed into the lunar surface, gouging out a huge furrow. The interceptor hit the edge of a small impact crater, skipped up, then battered itself again and again against the moon, finally crushed into a shape that was unrecognizable as any part of a fighter. It rolled to a stop as the engine sputtered out. Corin circled the spot once. No explosion, nothing spectacular. Erisi would have hated it. Whistler blatted harshly. 
Right, who cares what she would have wanted? Corin pulled his X-wing away from the moon. Find me that shuttle, Whistler. I don't care who's on it. We're going to stop it. Another salvo from the virulence ripped into the Lysankia as Wedge swooped low over the Superstar Destroyer and peppered its hull with laser bolts. The Luzankia tried to defend itself, but the surface-mounted turbolaser cannons simply made themselves targets for strafing runs by X-Wings, A-Wings, Twi'leki Chirdaki, and the Gand's curious ships. What shots the Superstar Destroyer did get off at the virulence failed to penetrate the smaller ship's shields. The Luzankia is fast becoming defenseless. Much more of this hammering and the ship could begin to break up and that would jeopardize the prisoners we want to rescue from her. Wedge pulled up and flashed past the bridge. Gate, get me an open comm channel to the Luzankia. The droid complied with the order instantly. This is Commander Wedge Antilles to the captain of the Luzankia. We'll accept your surrender at any time. An angry, shrill voice arced through the comm unit. This is Captain Joak Dryso. No, Admiral Dryso, of the Luzankia. We will never give up. Captain? How dare you insult me? Admiral, then, even Grand Admiral, if it will make you see sense. Your shields are down, your engines are hit. You have no fighter cover, you can't hurt your opposition. Wedge let his damage assessment sink in for a moment. It's hopeless. No one else needs to die. Give up. Give up? An Imperial Grand Admiral never gives up. If you think one would, you'll rue the day you engaged one. That could be, sir, but that day isn't today. We'll treat all your people with all due respect. Wedge fought to keep his voice even. Surrender. Never. We are all loyal sons of the Empire. We are not afraid to put death before dishonor. Helm, give me all speed. We're going to ram the planet. There, Antilles. See, a Grand Admiral never... The comm unit popped and abruptly went silent. Dryso. Captain Dryso isn't here anymore, sir. Uh, this is acting Captain Warwin. Are you going to crash your ship into the planet, Warwin? Not if I can help it, sir. If you could get the war cruiser to stop shooting my engines, and if virulence will pull us a bit further out into orbit so we don't crash of our own accord, we'll accept any conditions for surrender you want to offer us. I'm happy to be working with you, Captain Warren. What you're doing is no dishonor. I know that, sir, and I think it beats death all hollow. Corin found the shuttle easily enough and brought his X-wing in on its aft without a problem. He flipped his lasers over to quadfire. Whistler, see if you can open a comm channel to the shuttle. Corin fired his lasers across the Typhonian's flight path when Whistler announced he'd found the two frequencies the shuttle was using. Just pick one. Corin punched the button on his comm unit. This is Corin Horn to shuttle Typhonian. Stop now and turn back to Typhira, or I'll be forced to destroy you. A moment's delay ended with a voice Corin had never expected to hear again coming through the comm channel. I should have known it would be you, Horn. Go away. You can't stop me with your lasers. Maybe this will warm your heart, Isan. Corin dropped his aiming reticle on the shuttle's rear and pulled the trigger. Burst after burst of laser fire splashed against the spacecraft's shields, but did not penetrate them. What? Shuttle shields aren't that good. You can thank Fleury Voru for me if he's still alive. He ordered heavy capacity shield generators for his shuttle. Cuts down on the passenger room, but I don't mind. Quite simply, your X-Wing lacks the power to burn through them. Maybe one will. Corin shifted his comm unit over to the squadron's tactical frequency. Nine could use some help here. It's Isart. I can't get through the shuttle's shields. 
Seven here, nine. Coming as fast as I can. Keep her from jumping to light speed. I'll do my best, but I need your lasers to stop her. I copy, nine. I'll hurry. Whistler, project how long it will be before she's clear to go to light speed. The droid splashed an image of the solar system up on Corrin's secondary monitor. He used overlapping circles of color to indicate the boundaries for gravitational effects of the bodies in the system and showed the shuttle as a pinpoint of light at the edge of Typhira's hyperspace mass shadow. Sith spawn, she's almost there. Corrin triggered another burst of laser fire, but it only washed a bloody hue over the aft shield. What if she's bluffing? and just has all power going to the aft shield. That's just the sort of thing she'd do. He punched power to his throttle and let the X-wing surge forward. He brought it around in a loop that would give him an oblique shot at the shuttle's port side. As he sailed in, the shuttle shifted direction and came about to face him. Corrin hit his trigger and pulsed energy into the shuttle's shields. The shuttle fired back. Green energy darts blew through the X-Wing's forward shield and hit the port stabilizer. Corrin rolled immediately and dove, then came back up in a weave that took him in behind the shuttle. Whistler, what just happened? Isard's voice crackled over the comm channel. Did I mention that Voru also upgraded the lasers on this ship? I'll give you an upgrade, Iceheart. Corrin snarled as he looked at the diagnostics listing, Whistler scrolled up on his main monitor. He winced, then looked to his port S-foil. Where once there had been a pair of laser cannons, he had melted metal. And about a meter less of S-foil. A glance at the secondary monitor showed Isart had a kilometer before she could begin the run to light speed. Once she gets clear, it's just level flying and she's out of here. Corrin slowly smiled. Upgraded that thing, did he, Iceheart? The Corellian pilot flipped his weapons control over to proton torpedoes and dropped it on the shuttle's outline. Whistler began to beep as he tried for a firing solution. Out ahead of the X-Wing, the shuttle began to juke, broadening Corrin's smile. Yes, he supplied the shuttle with a missile targeting lock warning system. Only good thing you've done in your black life, Voru. So your shields won't stop a proton torpedo, eh, Iceheart? You'll find out if you ever get a lock on me, Horn. Corrin glanced at his monitor and saw Tycho's X-Wing eight kilometers back and closing slowly. As long as you keep dancing, Iceheart, you can't run up to light speed. That means we can burn you down. I'll get a lock on you, and then you're done. He painted her with a target lock again, but allowed her to break it. He reacquired it again and shifted his ship around to herd her back toward Typhira's mass shadow. The shuttle rolled in the other direction, breaking the lock, but Corrin came in and got it again fairly easily. You can't escape me, Iceheart. Isarge's reply came almost languidly voiced. I've stopped trying, Horn. You're bluffing. If you had torpedoes, you would have used them already. The shuttle leveled out and prepared for the run to light speed. I was hoping to take you alive, Isard. I'll shoot if I have to. Please, Horn, do your worst. Know that when we meet again, to you I shall do my worst. She can't get away. I can't let her get away. Corrin punched his comm unit with a closed fist. His mind reeled as fury and a fear of failure raged through him. My lasers can't get through her shields and I don't have any missiles to batter them down. There's nothing I can do. Nothing. Wait. Maybe there's something. Quick, transfer all power to the forward shield. Corrin smiled grimly and reached for the throttle. Hang on, Whistler. We're going to ram her. The droid began hooting loudly, but Corrin ignored him and focused on the shuttle. Your logic boards are fried. There's a chance we can survive, but that doesn't matter. If we cripple her ship, we have to cripple her ship. Before Corrin could jam the throttle full forward, 
two blue darts streaked past either side of his cockpit. The first exploded against the shuttle's aft shield and collapsed it. The second drilled through the engine housing, skewing the ship to port. The proton torpedo detonated inside the shuttle's fuselage. Corrin saw the angular ship puff up and out before fire lanced out the cockpit viewports. Then a golden fireball ripped the ship apart from the inside out. Corrin's X-Wing passed straight through the center of the explosion, and by the time he brought his ship around, the sparks from debris hitting his shields were the only indication that the shuttle had been there at all. Consumed by fire. Somehow fitting. Corrin keyed his comm unit. Who did that? Seven here, Nine. Thanks for giving me the target lock. What? Corrin glanced over at the transponder switch and saw it was lit. When I punched the console, I must have hit it by accident. The image of Luke Skywalker came to mind. He'd tell me that wasn't an accident, wasn't luck, just the force. Corrin nodded slowly. I prefer to believe it was justice. It was a great shot, Tycho. If I couldn't get her, well, your claim predated mine. Corrin, we got her. That's all that counts. Tycho's X-Wing came into view as Corrin headed his X-Wing back toward Typhira. I don't see any more squints, Tycho. You got a workout. I got my share, but ten vaped the bulk of them. He accounted for six interceptors all by himself. Tycho chuckled lightly. And it looks like the Luzankia isn't shooting anymore. Corrin smiled. A tyrant dead. A traitor dead. A superstar destroyer dead. And if Elsko, Ayala, and the Ashern have done their jobs, a planet liberated. Not a bad day at all. 41. Looks different, doesn't it, Corin, when you're walking on the ceiling? Yeah, but not any better. Despite having the lights strung throughout the Luzankia's prisoners' quarters, the Warren's rough-hewn walls still pressed in on Corin. He turned toward Tycho Selchu as he climbed over the low wall into what had been Jan Dodonna's cell. It's very strange to have mounted this whole operation to try to get Jan and the other prisoners out, just to get in here and find Isard had them shipped out by shuttle to other places months ago. Deep down, she must have known we'd win, so she did this to frustrate us. You've got it all wrong, my friend. Tycho patted Corin's right shoulder with his left hand. When you escaped from the Luzankia, you ruined it for her. She could no longer view her little prison without thinking about how you beat her. Whereas anyone else would have beefed up security, she decided to scrap the whole facility. And it's just as well, because this section of the ship lost atmosphere. Everyone would have died in here. Had Isard really been on her game, she would have let them die that way and would have us blaming ourselves for killing a bunch of the Rebellion's heroes. Corin nodded slowly. In the week since the battle for Typhira, he'd waited for repair crews to restore atmosphere to the prison area on the ship. To the others that had seen it, the whole area was just part of a ship where the bulkheads had been lined with rock. The fact that the primitive latrines had drained into a zero-gravity vacuum, then the waste settled wherever it had drifted when gravity and atmosphere had been brought back, did not help things. Everyone who visited the facility could see very clearly why he hated it. But the stink and the crudity of its manufacture wasn't why he hated it. Corin frowned. It feels to me as if despair and failure have permeated these walls. The men who were in here didn't dare try to escape, and yet most of them could have, I'm certain. Jan could have come with me, but he didn't because he felt a responsibility to the others. That made him more a prisoner than these walls. But what you saw as a prison for him was not what he saw for himself. Jan knew he was keeping people alive by leading them. He hadn't surrendered, so they couldn't quite do it themselves. Tycho brushed fingers across the rocky surface of the walls. 
what he was doing by staying behind was as much a part of him as your need to escape was a part of you. I don't remember much of my time here, but I felt certain I was going to die here. It's a terrible thing to come back to your senses after having been out of it, to find yourself in a place where you think you're going to die. Jan told me I wasn't, and I didn't. And you escaped from the place where she sent you after you left here. Right, Tycho smiled. We have to hope the others will be able to do that, too. It'll be fine if they do, but I'm still on for finding them myself. Corin smiled. Zray's already got my X-Wing back to normal. Well, as normal as it gets after a verpine messes with it. So I'm ready to hunt. You with me? Tycho nodded thoughtfully. I am, though I think we're going to have some stiff competition. One of the first repair crews in this area was a forensic team from Alliance Intelligence. They're supposed to have swept this place, pulling fingerprints, hair, and tissue samples, even samples of some of the solid waste floating around. You know better than I what that sort of evidence can tell them, but I gather they were able to confirm the identities of some of the prisoners from what they got. Corin smiled slowly. Which is why General Aaron Kraken showed up two days ago. The New Republic is going to hunt for the prisoners then. That would be my guess. They couldn't do it before because they only had your word to go on. My identifications were spotty and old. Since you chose to resign from Rogue Squadron and started all this, they had to disassociate themselves with our effort. Now they have solid evidence, which changes everything. Great, they can race us in finding them. Ah, there you are, Corin. Ural filled the entryway. I thought I could find you here. What? Corin stared at the Gand. Ural? Did Ural say that right? The Gand's mouthpart snapped open and shut excitedly. Ural wanted you to be the first to hear. Corin looked over at Tycho, but the Alderanian just shrugged. Yes, Uril, you said that correctly, but I thought Gans didn't use personal pronouns unless... The Gans' fist clicked off his chest. I am Janwin, the Ruitsavi. They have declared me Janwin. They have returned to Gan to tell Uril's, uh, my story, what we did here. Uril's part in the taking of Coruscant, and the battles against Iceheart. These will become known to all the Gand. If Uril says, I, they will know to whom I refer. That's great, Uril. Tycho extended his hand to the Gand. The Gands have every right to be proud of you. Uril shook Tycho's hand, then Corin's as well. There is more. Each of you have been declared Hinween. This means that when you come to Gan for Ural's Janween Jika, you may speak of yourselves with personal pronouns and will not be thought vulgar or rude. Corin's eyes narrowed. You mean to tell me that the whole time you've been here in the squadron, you felt the way we talked made us vulgar or rude? The Gand shook his head. Ural never assumes vulgarity when ignorance suffices as an explanation. Thanks, I think. Tycho shot him a sly smile. That should be Corin thinks. But not often, Ural added. Corin thinks Ural should practice using personal pronouns more regularly before he tries comedy. Corin opened his arms wide. Not much better than the shack we shared on Talisia, is it, Ural? The mineral deposits do add some color, but Ural, um, I would not like to live here. The Gand held a hand up. I would explore this place with you more later, for the story of your time here 
will be vital to my John Wien Jika. But there are other things we must do right now. Captain Selchu, Commander Antilles, asked Uru to tell you he is waiting for you in the Luzonkia's staff officer's mess. Last minute things before his party? Uru, I mean, I believes this is the case, Captain. And Corin, General Kraken, has asked to speak with you. I wonder what that's about. Where do I find him? Uril will take you there. The trio of pilots carefully picked their way out of the cavern complex and took the turbo lift up. Tycho exited first while the Gand and Corin continued on, climbing higher and higher in the Luzonkia's superstructure. When the turbo lift stopped, Corin found Aaron Kraken waiting for him outside the door to the captain's ready room. He nodded at the Gand as the turbo lift's door closed behind him, then turned to the older man. What can I do for you, sir? Kraken raked fingers back through reddish hair tinged with white. I need you to talk some sense to Booster Tarek. Corin immediately raised his hands. Got a Death Star you want killed instead? Close. Kraken shook his head. Booster wants to keep the virulence. And you want him to give it to the New Republic? Corin laughed aloud. He won't listen to me. Mirax suggested I get you up here. Okay, you have me, but I don't know what I can do. Back me up, or we're going to have Booster Tarek in command of a fully operational Imp Star Deuce. Kraken sighed. Tarek was never as bad as some of the smugglers out there, but now he's hooked up with Talon Card, and... Booster and Card are together? Allied? I mean, I knew Card had come into the system, but I assumed it was to work a deal with Typhira's new government about hauling back to... Are you sure Card and Booster are working together? See for yourself. Kraken opened the door to the ready room and allowed Corin to precede him in. Corin found Booster at the far end of an oval table, with Mirax seated on his right, and a handsome man he took to be Card seated on his left. Corin went over to Mirax's side of the table and gave her a kiss on the cheek. Booster, you're looking fit. Captaining a starship agrees with me. Corin extended a hand across the table to the other man. Talon Card, I presume. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Better now than when you were with Corsac. Card seemed to be watching him very closely. The resemblance to your father is unmistakable. Thanks. Corin sat down, fighting to conceal a shiver. He didn't know why, but he gained the impression that Card knew more about him than perhaps even Aaron Kraken did, and that disturbed him. I think I'm happy I didn't meet him when I was with Corsac as well. He would have been to me what Booster was to my father, but I don't think I would have been sending Card to Kessel. Booster looked up at Kraken, then jerked a thumb at Corin. Did you think he could convince me to give up my ship? Great, this is off to a good start. Corin glanced at Kraken and shrugged. Booster, I just thought Lieutenant Horn here could supply you with some more perspective on why you're not going to be able to keep the virulence. That ship presents a rather major danger. Right, a danger to anyone who tries to take it away from me. Let me see if I can rephrase this. The only people with that sort of firepower at their disposal are warlords and other Imperial renegades. The New Republic has to consider any Star Destroyers that are not under the control of itself or its allies to be an immediate threat to the New Republic's stability. Fine, General, fine. I'll just take the virulence, conquer some planet with it, have the planet become one of the New Republic's allies. Mirax shook her head. That's pretty much what they're afraid of, Father. Booster winked at his daughter. 
Okay, then try this. I'll make the virulence herself a nation. We'll just move from system to system, trading here and there, and we'll be sovereign and even join the new republic. Think of all the guns as ground-based defenses. Kraken's breath hissed in between his teeth. No, I don't think that will work. That would constitute quite a large threat to peace in the galaxy. Such a threat would have to be dealt with. Booster's artificial eyes light seemed to flare for a second. I think there are several different degrees of threat, General. And I'd have to say, right now, you're acting more threatening than I've ever contemplated being. The virulence is mine. She was surrendered to me. But only after three squadrons of New Republic A-Wings appeared in the Yogdul system, giving Captain Barsha the impression she had been trapped by New Republic forces. Kraken pressed his hands flat against the white tabletop. She thought she was surrendering the ship to the New Republic. And you know that's true. Your representations to her did not dissuade her of this fact. Corrin looked over at Booster and shook his head. You let Isard's conviction that we were a covert New Republic operation trick Varsha into believing we actually were part of the New Republic? Not bad, Booster. Mirex's father smiled proudly. She was looking for any excuse to get out of trouble, so I just used the one she gave me. Corrin winced. Unfortunately, that means you've given the New Republic a claim on the virulence. What? Mirax, tell him. It's the same as a partnership for salvaging hulks. Just because one partner is ceded ownership, he doesn't own it. The partnership does. Corrin's right, father. Nonsense. I've never heard of such a thing. Mirax laughed. No? As I recall, that's how you got your share of the Pulsar skate. Booster frowned heavily. That's not the same thing at all. Not at all. But for the sake of argument here, let's say Captain Varsha was mistaken about my connection with the New Republic. I still possess the ship, and if they have a share, so do I. Kraken nodded. You do. We will justly compensate you for it, of course, and you'll earn our undying gratitude. Even a pardon for any indiscretions you might have committed. You can stop there, General. Unless you want to give me back the five years I spent on Kessel. I'm not interested in any judicial rewards, thanks. How much? The New Republic's representative hesitated. The current situation is such that an immediate payment is out of the question, but I think we could compensate you with five million credits. Ha! This is an Imperial Star Destroyer Mark II we're talking about. It doesn't have a scratch on it. It is worth billions and billions of credits. I'll settle for a billion credits, payable in two hours, or I'm flying it out of here. Ah, uh, Booster, you're dreaming if you think that ship is going anywhere. Kraken smiled confidently. As you know, Typhira has voted to join the New Republic. Because of this, all ships in the system are subject to New Republic law. In accord with said laws, your navigation and engineering section crews have been taken planetside for debriefing. Well, that's piracy. No, it's actually a security concern. As Lieutenant Horn can attest, a number of prisoners who were on this ship are missing. We want to question anyone who might have been used to move them to other locations, and your astronav crews could have been employed in that capacity. Right now, your ship is going nowhere. Booster frowned. Okay, I'll come down to 500 million credits. The sum seemed to stagger Kraken for a moment, then Card spoke. Booster, be reasonable. Try twenty percent of that. Booster stared at him. You're being very generous with my money, Card. 
20% of something booster is better than 100% of nothing. True, but if they can't deliver, why not think big? Corin raised a hand. It just struck me that we might be arguing about the wrong thing here. Booster, how serious are you about making the virulence into a hyperspace-capable smuggler's den? Booster scratched at the beard stubble on his throat. Very. I spent my life hauling cargo from one point to another. It would be nice to own a place where the cargo came to me, and I just brokered deals for it. The virulence would do nicely in that regard. Corin smiled. So would the freedom. No! Booster and Kraken dismissed the idea at the same time. They exchanged surprised glances, then shook their heads. I don't want the freedom. Refitting it will take a lifetime. I'd have to get it to Sluis Van, and General Kraken here would guarantee my work was never scheduled. Stick to flying, Horn, because that idea was really dumb. Mirak slapped her father on the arm. Don't speak to my fiancé like that. What? Booster's jaw dropped. No, that's impossible. Corin raised an eyebrow. Mirax, I'm not sure this was the best time to mention that. Booster pointed at Kraken and then Corin. He wants to take away my ship, and he wants to take away my daughter. He turned to Card. I suppose you want something of mine, too. Perhaps, Booster. Card smiled in a very genial manner. I think I want you to reconsider what Lieutenant Horn suggested. It strikes me that General Kraken is primarily concerned with your being in command of a ship with enough firepower to slag an inhabited world. Succinctly put, Card. Thank you, General. Card looked at Booster. Now you're concerned that your ship would fall prey to all sorts of pirates if they take its weaponry away. Even stripped of weapons, a hulk like the Freedom would be quite a prize. Booster nodded slowly. You're talking sense, Card. This scares me. Booster and I agree on something. Corin narrowed his eyes at Card. Where's this going? You know the law, Lieutenant. A ship the size of the virulence in private ownership would be allowed to lawfully carry how much in the way of weaponry. Corin sat back. Nothing that size in private ownership, but it would be something on the order of two tractor beams, ten ion cannons, and ten heavy turbo laser batteries. My calculations exactly, which leaves eight tractor beams, ten ion cannons, forty heavy turbo laser batteries, and fifty heavy turbo lasers to be pulled off the virulence. General Kraken, those weapons would pretty much replace what the Freedom lost here, wouldn't they? Kraken frowned. For having been here less than a week, Talon Guard, you know more than I'm comfortable having you know. Booster shook his head. Those guns aren't leaving my ship. Kraken snarled. The virulence is not your ship. Card held a hand up. Ah, but it can be. According to the Admiralty regulations governing salvage disputes, Booster has named a fair price for his share of the salvage rights to the virulence. Since you can't meet his price, he can assume control of the vessel by depositing 10% of that price, in this case 10 million credits, with a duly recognized judicial authority, such as the government of Typhira. Booster frowned. I don't have ten million credits, Card. No, Booster, you don't. But you do have a lot of surplus military-grade hardware that you're going to have to get rid of. I'll buy it for ten million. Kraken tapped a finger against the table. I'm no more comfortable with you having that hardware, Card, than I was with Tarek having it. I expected that, General. I'll sell you the weapons for twenty-five million credits. Kraken's jaw shot open. You'll what? 
Booster smiled. I want 15 million card. I have operating expenses. I'll make it 18 if you also sell me four squadrons of TIE fighters. Card sat back in his seat. And the price to you, General, is now 35 million. But you'll find I issue credit more easily than my friend. Once the court here on Typhira has reviewed the virulence case, Booster will pay you whatever additional amount they decide he owes you. Corrin laughed aloud. The virulence's appearance here tipped the balance in the Typhiran War of Liberation, so I suspect Booster isn't going to owe much. I suspect the judges here might be swayed by that fact, but the New Republic will be able to argue its case. Card pressed his hands together. Booster, you get your ship, and, General, you get weapons out of his hands and into yours. Kraken remained silent for a moment, then nodded slowly. You bargain very well, Card. Perhaps there is other business we can do. No, General, I don't think so. I did this for the obscene profit you'll pay me, which, since you don't have liquid capital available, will be rendered in trading concessions for Bacta and other things. I don't mind dealing with you, but I'm not of a mind to take sides in this civil war. Isard and Zinge are two examples of countless imperial holdouts. I'd like to avoid becoming a victim of future wars. You'd rather be caught between us than with us. I'd rather not be caught at all. Card's smile carried up into his pale blue eyes. Have we a deal? The Provisional Council will have a piece of my hide for this, but yes. Kraken stood and nodded to Booster. The virulence is yours. Please change the name. Booster stood at his end of the table. I already know what I'll call her. The Errant Venture. Corrin smiled weakly at General Kraken. Sorry I couldn't have been of more help. It wasn't the solution I wanted, but it was a solution. Kraken tossed him a casual salute. Until later. Mirax glanced at her chronometer, then stretched languidly. Two hours until Wedge's party. She smiled at Corrin. Any ideas about how to kill that time? Booster settled his right hand over her left. Yes, my dear. We're going to discuss this engagement of yours. My daughter isn't going to marry anyone from Corsic. They're all of low morals and intellect. Not going to happen. Period. Corin looked over at Card. Do you want to help me out here? Do you think you could afford my help, Lieutenant? No, probably not. Card nodded solemnly. Definitely not. Fortunately for you, however, now Booster has to pay for my help. We need to head over to the Errant Venture and pull specs on your weapons. Booster frowned. Now? Unless you want Kraken to do it first and leave you with the weapons most likely to break down, we better do it now. Booster's eyes narrowed. This discussion is just delayed, not abandoned. Yes, Father. Mirax kissed him on the cheek. See you in two hours at the party. The two smugglers exited the ready room, leaving Corin and Mirax alone. He shook his head. How far away from here can we get in two hours? Not far enough, I'm afraid. I'm not looking forward to this discussion of our engagement. My father may growl like a rancor, but his claws aren't that sharp. Oh, that makes me feel lots better. He'll be insufferable for the period of our engagement, you know. Agreed. She took his hands into hers. However... I think I know a way to deflect him. How? You'll see. Mirax stood and pulled him up out of his chair. Come with me, love, and all shall be made clear to you. 42. 
Wedge waited until everyone had been seated in the Luzankia staff officer's mess before he stepped behind the podium Emtre had found and set up on a table at the far end of the room. He smiled as he faced the motley gathering. Closest sat his pilots. Beyond them, the Twi'lek Chirdaki pilots who had survived, including Taldira, Captain Sayer Yanka of the Freedom, General Kraken and his son Pash, Booster Tarek and Talon Card, Ayala Wessery, Elskol Loro, Sixtus, and a handful of Ashern he didn't know, and several Vratix officials from Typhira. The only things we need now for a full-fledged victory celebration are a bonfire and a legion of Ewoks. Wedge held his hands up to quiet everyone, and aside from the whirring of serving droids passing between the tables, silence reigned. I want to keep my remarks as brief as possible because, one, I respect you all too much to want to bore you, and two, I know you're all quick enough wits that the heckling will be worse than the fight to take this hulk away from Iceheart. I have a couple of pieces of business to transact first, though, with your indulgence. Wedge smiled and nodded over at Asser Sailor. As you all can tell, Asser is doing well after spending some time in a Bacta tank. The injuries she sustained when her X-Wing was hit were fairly minor, but the 1B droids have already certified her as flight capable. A polite round of applause greeted that news. Unfortunately, our other casualty did not get away so cleanly. Perhaps you want to explain, Noara. The Twi'lek nodded. While I was out of my X-Wing, I had the misfortune of having a micrometeorite hit me in the right leg. It severed the limb just above the knee and did so much tissue damage, all the Bacta on Typhira couldn't fix it. My suit shut down around the wound, which is why I survived. Actually, the real reason I survived was because of Uru, vaping all the squints that wanted to finish me off. But the leg was a loss. Corin turned in his seat. They can fit you for a mechanical, right? Yes, which is what the one bees will be doing. Noara wrapped his knuckles against the hollow-sounding lower part of his right leg. Unfortunately, I don't scan as being able to utilize a prosthetic as well as I need to if I want to continue flying. I'll have 95% use of the mechanical, but that's not enough to keep up with the rest of you. Not that I ever could before. Wedge smiled. You were a bit rough on our equipment, Noara. That notwithstanding, Noara will remain with the unit as our new executive officer. Tal Dira has been invited to join us and has accepted, so we'll have a Twi'lek flying with us still. Wedge led the applause, which started Leku twitching among the Twi'lek pilots. Broar Jace has been appointed by his government to head up the formation of the Typhiran Aerospace Defense Force, so we'll lose his services at least temporarily. The government has also asked us to stay on here for the next couple of months to help train the new unit. This is an assignment I've chosen to accept, so we can make sure no one gets too adventurous and tries to repeat what Isar did here. He looked over toward General Kraken. After that, well, General Kraken has communicated to me the contents of a resolution, voted by the Provisional Council, to congratulate us on what we've accomplished here. He also said that, due to a bureaucratic mix-up, our resignations were never formally logged to our files. If we want them, our commissions are available to us and General Kraken has assured me that he's looking for an elite unit to be able to follow up on investigative leads concerning the lost Lysankia prisoners. Once our work is done here, I intend to rejoin the New Republic, and I'd like to bring Rogue Squadron back with me. Wedge smiled. I've already spoken with Tycho and Corin, and they've agreed to rejoin. 
Errol, are you going to keep the Valiant or come back with us? The Celestian smiled. I'm coming back to the Alliance, Wedge. I'll still command the Valiant, but I think we can work out a deal with General Kraken to pull missions together. Good. Asser? The Bothan looked over at Gavin, got a nod from him, then smiled. We're both in. Rizzotti? I'm in. Mawara? Can't be an executive officer if I don't stay with the unit, can I? I'm in. Ural? Rogue Squadron made me Janween. I would never say no to the honor of remaining with it. Taldira? The Twilight Warrior nodded solemnly. I could not let Rogue Squadron be without a Twilight pilot. I am pleased to accept the offer to join the unit. Wedge smiled at Iniri Forge. I know serving with Rogue Squadron was your sister's dream, but you've earned your own place with us. We'd be proud to have you if you want to stay with us. A grin slowly spread across the blue-eyed woman's face. My sister always wanted the best for everyone else. Joining the squadron meant she got to fight the evil plaguing others, making things better for them. Her example is pretty compelling. I'm in. With her acceptance, cheers erupted, hands were shaken, and backs slapped. Wedge swallowed against the lump rising in his throat. Two more things, then my remarks. First, we've been invited to Gand for Ural's Janween Jika. This is an unbelievably huge honor for one of us who has earned many honors. Second, and equally worthy of celebration, is something I did barely a half an hour ago. As you will recall, the Luzankia was surrendered to me, making me its de facto captain. In my capacity as such, with Tycho and Ayala present as witnesses, I had the pleasure of marrying Mirax and Corin. What? Booster's shout accompanied an immediate reddening of his face. Wedge held his hands up. Take it easy, Booster. They plan another more formal ceremony we can all attend back on Coruscant. But they figured that if you were going to be upset with them for getting engaged, they might as well save themselves that aggravation and just have you mad at them for being married. I'm not upset about that, Wedge. I was upset when I thought she was marrying someone from Corsac. Mirax's father smiled. Now he's part of Rogue Squadron again, so I have no complaints. Right. Wedge shook his head. No complaints you want to voice at this time. Booster hesitated for a moment, then nodded to an accompaniment of good-natured laughter. Corin frowned at his father-in-law. Then the red in your face and the anger in your voice wasn't because of us? You Corsac people always think it's about you. Booster shook his head, then jerked a thumb at Card. He bet me a million credits that you'd go and do exactly what you did. And he even conned me into giving him odds. Wedge laughed. Corin, Mirax, I think that's going to be a major bone of contention for the future. One he's going to worry like a hungry neck. Corin brought Mirax's left hand to his mouth and kissed it. Not too steep a price to pay, though. Ha, huh, Mirax snickered. Serves him right for betting against us. Even Booster joined in the resulting laughter. To Wedge, the sound was a tonic. In all the time I've been with Rogue Squadron, there's been too little laughter and too many tears. Again, his throat thickened but he smiled and swallowed to loosen it. Again, I want these remarks to be brief. It was about a year and a half ago that I first met most of you. You were bright-eyed and enthusiastic, ready to launch into one grand adventure after another. I had seen that before with other pilots in Rogue Squadron, 
I remember the days before Yavin, when we were all young, armored with the invincibility of youth, and fired by the belief that the Emperor's evil empire could not win. It didn't, but the cost was more horrible than any of us could have imagined. You've all seen the role of those who died with Rogue Squadron. Had we known at the start of things how few of us would survive, I think many of us would not have answered the call to fight. Wedge caught his lower lip between his teeth for a second, then continued. You all came to Rogue Squadron knowing how few of us had survived. Your decision to join us was an informed decision. Yes, the Emperor was dead, Darth Vader was gone, but the Empire's ability to grind up our warriors was not significantly diminished. On both sides of the battle, the weak and incompetent had been killed, leaving only the most lethal of each force to stalk each other. Nothing we've done, including the conquest of Coruscant, will be compared favorably with the destruction of the Death Stars and Palpatine's death. Yet as I look back on what we've done, I feel a greater sense of accomplishment now than I ever have before. Yavin and Endor were battles we had to fight and had to win, because if we did not, our movement would be exterminated. We fought with the abandon of people who knew either way they were dead, and desperation, while not pretty, can often be very potent and deadly. He glanced down for a second, then looked back up. Our missions have been no less critical in the destruction of the Empire than those that went before, but they were different. We took the war to the Empire. We made plans and successfully improvised when those plans fell apart. We did things that no one, not even the seemingly prescient Talon card, could have expected us to do. And we did things no one could have ordered us to do. We accepted the burden of responsibility thrust upon us and overcame the obstacles in our way. That has always been the Rogue Squadron tradition, but you've added a new layer to it. You survived those missions. For that, I'm most thankful, because I did not join Rogue Squadron to lose friends. He reached down, accepted a tumbler of Corellian whiskey from a serving droid, then raised it on high in his left hand. I would ask all of you to lift your glasses and join me in a toast. To Rogue Squadron, past, present, and future. Those who oppose freedom and liberty oppose us. Let that fact give them pause to think and encouragement to travel the path of peace. End of Star Wars X-Wing Books 4 through 6 by Michael A. Stackpole and Aaron Alston. M-I-C-H-A-E-L-A-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-L-